Chapters forty six through forty eight of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter forty six. Philip did not find living in Paris as cheap as he had been led to believe, and by February had spent most of the money with which he started. He was too proud to appeal to his guardian, nor did he wish Aunt Louisa to know that his circumstances were straitened, since he was certain she would make an effort to send him something from her own pocket, and he knew how little she could afford to. In three months he would attain his majority and come into possession of his small fortune. He tied it over the interval by selling the few trinkets which he had inherited from his father. At about this time Lawson suggested that they should take a small studio which was vacant in one of the streets that led out of the boulevard Raspiel. It was very cheap. It had a room attached, which they could use as a bedroom, and since Philip was at the school every morning Lawson could have the undisturbed use of the studio then. Lawson, after wandering from school to school, had come to the conclusion that he could work best alone, and proposed to get a model in three or four days a week. At first Philip hesitated on account of the expense, but they reckoned it out, and it seemed they were so anxious to have a studio of their own that they calculated pragmatically that the cost would not be much greater than that of living in a hotel. Though the rent and the cleaning by the concierge would come in a little more, they would save on the petit déjeuner which they could make themselves. A year or two earlier Philip would have refused to share a room with anyone, since he was so sensitive about his deformed foot, but his morbid way of looking at it was growing less marked. In Paris it did not seem to matter so much, and though he never by any chance forgot it himself, he ceased to feel that other people were constantly noticing it. They moved in, bought a couple of beds, a washing-stand, a few chairs, and felt for the first time the thrill of possession. They were so excited that the first night they went to bed in what they could call a home they lay awake talking till three in the morning, and next day found lighting the fire and making their own coffee, which they had in pajamas, such a jolly business that Philip did not get to Amatrano's till nearly eleven. He was in excellent spirits. He nodded to Fanny Price. "'How are you getting on?' he asked cheerily. "'What does that matter to you?' she asked in reply. Philip could not help laughing. "'Don't jump down my throat. I was only trying to make myself polite. I don't want your politeness.' "'Do you think it's worth while quarreling with me, too?' asked Philip mildly. "'There are so few people you're on speaking terms with as it is. That's my business, isn't it?' "'Quite.' He began to work vaguely wondering why Fanny Price made herself so disagreeable. He had come to the conclusion that he thoroughly disliked her. Everyone did. People were only civil to her at all from fear of the malice of her tongue, for to their faces and behind their backs she said abominable things. But Philip was feeling so happy that he did not want even Miss Price to bear ill-feeling towards him. He used the artifice which had often before succeeded in banishing her ill-humor. "'I say, I wish you'd come and look at my drawing. I've got in an awful mess. Thank you very much, but I've got something better to do with my time.' Philip stared at her in surprise, for the one thing she could be counted upon to do with alacrity was to give advice. She went on quickly in a low voice, savage with fury. "'Now that Lawson's gone you think you'll put up with me.' thank you very much. Go and find somebody else to help you. I don't want anybody else's leavings. Lawson had the pedagogic instinct. Whenever he found anything out he was eager to impart it, and because he taught with delight he talked with profit. Philip, without thinking anything about it, had got into the habit of sitting by his side. It never occurred to him that Fanny Price was consumed with jealousy and watched his acceptance of someone else's tuition with ever-increasing anger. "'You were very glad to put up with me when you knew nobody here,' she said bitterly, "'and as soon as you made friends with other people you threw me aside like an old glove.' She repeated the stale metaphor with satisfaction. "'Like an old glove. All right, I don't care. 
but I'm not going to be made a fool of another time. There was a suspicion of truth in what she said, and it made Philip angry enough to answer what first came into his head. Hang it all, I only asked your advice because I saw it pleased you. She gave a gasp and threw him a sudden look of anguish. Then two tears rolled down her cheeks. She looked frowsy and grotesque. Philip, not knowing what on earth this new attitude implied, went back to his work. He was uneasy and conscience-stricken, but he would not go to her and say he was sorry if he had caused her pain, because he was afraid she would take the opportunity to snub him. For two or three weeks she did not speak to him, and, after Philip had got over the discomfort of being cut by her, he was somewhat relieved to be free from so difficult a friendship. He had been a little disconcerted by the air of proprietorship she assumed over him. She was an extraordinary woman. She came every day to the studio at eight o'clock and was ready to start working when the model was in position. She worked steadily, talking to no one, struggling hour after hour with difficulties she could not overcome, and remained till the clock struck twelve. Her work was hopeless. There was not in it the smallest approach even to the mediocre achievement at which most of the young persons were able after some months to arrive. She wore every day the same ugly brown dress, with the mud of the last wet day still caked on the hem, and with the raggedness which Philip had noticed the first time he saw her still unmended. But one day she came up to him, and with a scarlet face, asked whether she might speak to him afterwards. "'Of course, as much as you like,' smiled Philip. "'I'll wait behind at twelve. He went to her when the day's work was over. "'Will you walk a little bit with me?' she said, looking away from him with embarrassment. "'Certainly.' They walked for two or three minutes in silence. "'Do you remember what you said to me the other day?' she asked then on a sudden. "'Oh, I say, don't let's quarrel,' said Philip. "'It really isn't worth while.' She gave a quick, painful inspiration. "'I don't want to quarrel with you. You're the only friend I had in Paris. I thought you rather liked me. I felt there was something between us. I was drawn towards you. You know what I mean, your club foot.' Philip reddened and instinctively tried to walk without a limp. He did not like anyone to mention the deformity. He knew what Fanny Price meant. She was ugly and uncouth, and because he was deformed there was between them a certain sympathy. He was very angry with her, but he forced himself not to speak. "'You said you only asked my advice to please me. Don't you think my work's any good?' "'I've only seen your drawing at Amatrano's. It's awfully hard to judge from that.' "'I was wondering if you'd come and look at my other work. I've never asked anyone else to look at it. I should like to show it to you.' "'It's awfully kind of you. I'd like to see it very much.' "'I live quite near here.' she said apologetically. It'll only take you ten minutes. Oh, that's all right, he said. They were walking along the boulevard, and she turned down a side street, then led him into another, poorer still, with cheap shops on the ground floor, and at last stopped. They climbed flight after flight of stairs. She unlocked a door, and they went into a tiny attic with a sloping roof and a small window. This was closed, and the room had a musty smell. Though it was very cold there was no fire and no sign that there had been one. The bed was unmade. A chair, a chest of drawers, which served also as a washstand, and a cheap easel were all the furniture. The place had been squalid enough in any case, but the litter, the untidiness, made the impression revolting. On the chimney-piece scattered over with paints and brushes were a cup, a dirty plate, and a teapot. If you'll stand over there I'll put them on the chair so that you can see them better. She showed him twenty small canvases, about eighteen by twelve. She placed them on the chair, one after the other, watching his face. He nodded as he looked at each one. You do like them, don't you? she said anxiously after a bit. I just want to look at them all first, he answered. I'll talk afterwards. He was collecting himself. He was panic-stricken. He did not know what to say. It was not only that they were ill-drawn, or that the color was put on amateurishly by someone who had no eye for it, but there was no attempt at getting the values, and the perspective was grotesque. It looked like the work of a child of five, but a child would have had some naivete 
and might at least have made an attempt to put down what he saw. But here was the work of a vulgar mind chock full of recollections of vulgar pictures. Philip remembered that she had talked enthusiastically about Monet and the Impressionist, but here were only the worst traditions of the Royal Academy. There, she said at last, that's the lot. Philip was no more truthful than anybody else, but he had a great difficulty in telling a thundering, deliberate lie, and he blushed furiously when he answered, I think they're most awfully good. A faint color came into her unhealthy cheeks, and she smiled a little. You needn't say so if you don't think so, you know. I want the truth. But I do think so. Haven't you got any criticism to offer? There must be some you don't like as well as others. Philip looked round helplessly. He saw a landscape, the typical picturesque bit of the amateur, an old bridge, a creeper-clad cottage, and a leafy bank. Of course I don't pretend to know anything about it, he said, but I wasn't quite sure about the values of that. She flushed darkly, and taking up the picture quickly turned its back to him. I don't know why you should have chosen that one to sneer at. It's the best thing I've ever done. I'm sure my values are all right. It's a thing you can't teach anyone. You either understand values or you don't. I think they're all most awfully good, repeated Philip. She looked at them with an air of self-satisfaction. I don't think they're anything to be ashamed of. Philip looked at his watch. I say it's getting late. Won't you let me give you a little lunch? I've got my lunch waiting for me here. Philip saw no sign of it, but supposed perhaps the concierge would bring it up when he was gone. He was in a hurry to get away. The mustiness of the room made his head ache. End of chapter 46 Chapter 47 In March there was all the excitement of sending in to the salon. Clutton characteristically had nothing ready, and he was very scornful of the two heads that Lawson sent. They were obviously the work of a student, straightforward portraits of models, but they had a certain force. Clutton, aiming at perfection, had no patience with efforts which betrayed hesitancy, and with a shrug of the shoulders told Lawson it was an impertinence to exhibit stuff which should never have been allowed out of his studio. He was not less contemptuous when the two heads were accepted. Flanagan tried his luck too, but his picture was refused. Mrs. Otter sent a blameless portrait de Mamere, accomplished and second-rate, and was hung in a very good place. Hayward, whom Philip had not seen since he left Heidelberg, arrived in Paris to spend a few days in time to come to the party which Lawson and Philip were giving in their studio to celebrate the hanging of Lawson's pictures. Philip had been eager to see Hayward again, but when at last they met he experienced some disappointment. Hayward had altered a little in appearance. His fine hair was thinner, and with the rapid wilting of the very fair he was becoming wizened and colorless. His blue eyes were paler than they had been, and there was a muzziness about his features. On the other hand, in mind he did not seem to have changed at all, and the culture which had impressed Philip at eighteen aroused somewhat the contempt of Philip at twenty-one. He had altered a good deal himself and regarding with scorn all his old opinions of art, life, and letters, had no patience with anyone who still held them. He was scarcely conscious of the fact that he wanted to show off before Hayward, but when he took him round the galleries he poured out to him all the revolutionary opinions which himself had so recently adopted. He took to Manet's Olympia and said dramatically, I would give all the old masters except Velasquez, Rembrandt, and Vermeer for that one picture. Who was Vermeer? asked Hayward. Oh, my dear fellow, don't you know Vermeer? You're not civilized. You mustn't live a moment longer without making his acquaintance. He's the one old master who painted like a modern. He dragged Hayward out of the Luxembourg and hurried him off to the Louvre. But aren't there any more pictures here? asked Hayward, with the tourist passion for thoroughness. Nothing of the least consequence. You can come and look at them by yourself, with your Baedeker. When they arrived at the Louvre, Philip led his friend down the long gallery. "'I should like to see the Joconda,' said Hayward. "'Oh, my dear fellow, it's only literature,' answered Philip. At last, in a small room, Philip stopped before the lace-maker of Vermeer van Delft. "'There, that's the best picture in the Louvre. 
It's exactly like a Manet. With an expressive, eloquent thumb, Philip expatiated on the charming work. He used the jargon of the studios with overpowering effect. I don't know that I see anything so wonderful as all that in it, said Hayward. Of course, it's a painter's picture, said Philip. I can quite believe the layman would see nothing much in it. The what? said Hayward. The layman. Like most people who cultivate an interest in the arts, Hayward was extremely anxious to be right. He was dogmatic with those who did not venture to assert themselves, but with the self-assertive he was very modest. He was impressed by Philip's assurance and accepted meekly Philip's implied suggestion that the painter's arrogant claim to be the sole possible judge of painting has anything but its impertinence to recommend it. A day or two later Philip and Lawson gave their party. Cronshaw, making an exception in their favor, agreed to eat their food, and Miss Chalice offered to come and cook for them. She took no interest in her own sex and declined the suggestion that other girls should be asked for her sake. Clutton, Flanagan, and Potter and two others made up the party. Furniture was scarce, so the model stand was used as a table, and the guests were to sit on Corman too if they liked, and if they didn't, on the floor. The feast consisted of a pot de fay which Miss Chalice had made, of a leg of mutton roasted round the corner and brought round hot and savory. Miss Chalice had cooked the potatoes, and the studio was redolent of the carrots she had fried. Fried carrots were her specialty. And this was to be followed by pois flambe, pears with burning brandy which Cronshaw had volunteered to make. The meal was to finish with an enormous fromage de brie which stood near the window and added fragrant odors to all the others which filled the studio. Cronshaw sat in the place of honor on a gladstone bag with his legs curled under him like a Turkish bouchard, beaming good-naturedly on the young people who surrounded him. From force of habit, though the small studio with the stove lit was very hot, he kept on his great coat, the collar turned up, and his bowler hat. He looked with satisfaction on the four large fiashi of Chiandi which stood in front of him in a row, two on each side of a bottle of whiskey. He said it reminded him of a slim fair Circassian guarded by four corpulent Enochs. Hayward, in order to put the rest of them at their ease, had clothed himself in a tweed suit and a Trinity Hall hat. He looked grotesquely British. The others were elaborately polite to him, and during the soup they talked of the weather and the political situation. There was a pause while they waited for the leg of mutton, and Miss Chalice lit a cigarette. "'Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair,' she said suddenly. With an elegant gesture she untied a ribbon so that her tresses fell over her shoulders. She shook her head. "'I always feel more comfortable with my hair down.' With her large brown eyes, thin ascetic face, her pale skin and broad forehead, she might have stepped out of a picture by Burne Jones. She had long, beautiful hands with fingers deeply stained by nicotine. She wore sweeping draperies, mauve and green. There was about her the romantic air of High Street, Kensington. She was wantonly ascetic, but she was an excellent creature, kind and good-natured, and her affectations were but skin-deep. There was a knock at the door and they all gave a shout of exultation. Miss Chalice rose and opened. She took the leg of mutton and held it high above her as though it were the head of John the Baptist on a platter, and, the cigarette still in her mouth, advanced with solemn, erratic steps. "'Hail, daughter of Herodias!' cried Cronshaw. The mutton was eaten with gusto, and it did one good to see what a hearty appetite the pale-faced lady had. Clutton and Potter sat on each side of her, and everyone knew that neither had found her unduly coy. She grew tired of most people in six weeks, but she knew exactly how to treat afterwards the gentlemen who had laid their young hearts at her feet. She bore them no ill will, though having loved them she had ceased to do so, and treated them with friendliness but without familiarity. Now and then she looked at Lawson with melancholy eyes. The pois flambe were a great success, partly because of the brandy, and partly because Miss Chalice insisted that they should be eaten with the cheese. "'I don't know whether it's perfectly delicious or whether I'm just going to vomit,' she said, after she had thoroughly tried the mixture. Coffee and cognac followed with sufficient speed to prevent any untoward consequence, 
and they settled down to smoke in comfort. Ruth Chalice, who could do nothing that was not deliberately artistic, arranged herself in a graceful attitude by Cronshaw and just rested her exquisite head on his shoulder. She looked into the dark abyss of time with brooding eyes, and now and then with a long meditative glance at Lawson she sighed deeply. Then came the summer, and restlessness seized these young people. The blue skies lured them to the sea, and the pleasant breeze sighing through the leaves of the plane trees on the boulevard drew them towards the country. Everyone made plans for leaving Paris. They discussed what was the most suitable size for the canvases they meant to take. They laid in stores of panels for sketching. They argued about the merits of various places in Brittany. Flanagan and Potter went to Cocanu. Mrs. Otter and her mother, with a natural instinct for the obvious, went to Pont-Avon. Philip and Lawson made up their minds to go to the forest of Fontainebleau, and Miss Chalice knew of a very good hotel at Moray where there was lots of stuff to paint. It was near Paris, and neither Philip nor Lawson was indifferent to the railway fare. Ruth Chalice would be there, and Lawson had an idea for a portrait of her in the open air. Just then the salon was full of portraits of people in gardens, in sunlight, with blinking eyes, and green reflections on sunlit leaves on their faces. They asked Clutton to go with them, but he preferred spending the summer by himself. He had just discovered Suzanne, and was eager to go to Provence. He wanted heavy skies from which the hot blues seemed to drip like beads of sweat, and broad white dusty roads, and pale roofs out of which the sun had burnt the color, and olive trees gray with heat. The day before they were to start, after the morning class, Philip, putting his things together, spoke to Fanny Price. "'I'm off tomorrow, he said cheerfully. "'Off where?' she said quickly. "'You're not going away?' Her face fell. "'I'm going away for the summer, aren't you?' "'No, I'm staying in Paris. I thought you were going to stay, too. I was looking forward—' She stopped and shrugged her shoulders. "'But won't it be frightfully hot here? It's awfully bad for you. Much you care if it's bad for me. Where are you going?' Marae. Chalice is going there. You're not going with her. Lawson and I are going, and she's going there too. I don't know that we're actually going together. She gave a low guttural sound, and her large face grew dark and red. How filthy! I thought you were a decent fellow. You were about the only one here. She's been with Clutton and Potter and Flanagan, even with old Poinet. That's why he takes so much trouble about her and now two of you, you and Lawson, it makes me sick. Oh, what nonsense! She's a very decent sort. One treats her just as if she were a man. Oh, don't speak to me, don't speak to me. But what can it matter to you? asked Philip. It's really no business of yours where I spend my summer. I was looking forward to it so much, she gasped, speaking it seemed almost to herself. I didn't think you had the money to go away, and there wouldn't have been anyone else here and we could have worked together and we'd have gone to see things. Then her thoughts flung back to Ruth Chalice. The filthy beast, she cried. She isn't fit to speak to. Philip looked at her with a sinking heart. He was not a man to think girls were in love with him. He was too conscious of his deformity, and he felt awkward and clumsy with women. But he did not know what else this outburst could mean. Fanny Price, in the dirty brown dress, with her hair falling over her face, sloppy, untidy, stood before him, and tears of anger rolled down her cheeks. She was repellent. Philip glanced at the door, instinctively hoping that someone would come in and put an end to the scene. "'I'm awfully sorry,' he said. "'You're just the same as all of them. You take all you can get, and you don't even say thank you. I've taught you everything you know. No one else would take any trouble with you. Has Foinet ever bothered about you?' and I can tell you this, you can work here for a thousand years, and you'll never do any good. You haven't got any talent. You haven't got any originality. And it's not only me, they all say it. You'll never be a painter as long as you live. That is no business of yours either, is it? said Philip, flushing. Oh, you think it's only my temper. Ask Clutton, ask Lawson, ask Chalice. Never, never, never. You haven't got it in you. Philip, shrugged his shoulders and walked out. She shouted after him, "'Never, never, never!' 
Marais was in those days an old-fashioned town of one street at the edge of the forest of Fontainebleau, and the Ecuador was a hotel which still had about it the decrepit air of the Ancien Rochain. It faced the winding river, the Lua, and Miss Chalice had a room with a little terrace overlooking it with a charming view of the old bridge and its fortified gateway. They sat here in the evenings after dinner, drinking coffee, smoking, and discussing art. There ran into the river a little way off a narrow canal bordered by poplars, and along the banks of this, after their day's work, they often wandered. They spent all day painting. Like most of their generation, they were obsessed by the fear of the picturesque, and they turned their backs on the obvious beauty of the town to seek subjects which were devoid of a prettiness they despised. Sicily and Monet had painted the canal with his poplars, and they felt a desire to try their hands at what was so typical of France. But they were frightened of its formal beauty, and set themselves deliberately to avoid it. Miss Chalice, who had a clever dexterity which impressed Lawson notwithstanding his contempt for feminine art, started a picture in which she tried to circumvent the commonplace by leaving out the tops of the trees. And Lawson had the brilliant idea of putting in his foreground a large blue advertisement of Chocolat Meunier, in order to emphasize his abhorrence of the chocolate box. Philip began now to paint in oils. He experienced a thrill of delight when first he used that grateful medium. He went out with Lawson in the morning with his little box and sat by him painting a panel. It gave him so much satisfaction that he did not realize he was doing no more than copy. He was so much under his friend's influence that he saw only with his eyes. Lawson painted very low in tone, and they both saw the emerald of the grass like dark velvet, while the brilliance of the sky turned in their hands to a brooding ultramarine. Through July they had one fine day after another. It was very hot, and the heat, searing Philip's heart, filled him with languor. He could not work. His mind was eager with a thousand thoughts. Often he spent the mornings by the side of the canal in the shade of the poplars, reading a few lines, and then dreaming for half an hour. Sometimes he hired a rickety bicycle and rode along the dusty road that led to the forest, and then lay down in a clearing. His head was full of romantic fantasies. The ladies of Watu, gay and insouciant, seemed to wander with their cavaliers among the great trees, whispering to one another careless, charming things, and yet somehow oppressed by a nameless fear. They were alone in the hotel but for a fat Frenchwoman of middle age, a Rabelaisian figure with a broad obscene laugh. She spent the day by the river patiently fishing for fish she never caught, and Phillips sometimes went down and talked to her. He found out that she had belonged to a profession whose most notorious member for her generation was Mrs. Warren, and having made a competence she now lived the quiet life of the bourgeois. She told Philip lewd stories. You must go to Seville, she said. She spoke a little broken English. The most beautiful women in the world. She leered and nodded her head. Her triple chin, her large belly, shook with inward laughter. It grew so hot that it was almost impossible to sleep at night. The heat seemed to linger under the trees as though it were a material thing. They did not wish to leave the starlit night, and the three of them would sit on the terrace of Ruchelise's room silent, hour after hour, too tired to talk any more, but in voluptuous enjoyment of the stillness. They listened to the murmur of the river. The church clock struck one and two and sometimes three before they could drag themselves to bed. Suddenly Philip became aware that Ruth Chalice and Lawson were lovers. He divined it in the way the girl looked at the young painter and in his air of possession and as Philip sat with them he felt a kind of effluence surrounding them, as though the air were heavy with something strange. The revelation was a shock. He had looked upon Miss Chalice as a very good fellow, and he liked to talk to her, but it had never seemed to him possible to enter into a closer relationship. One Sunday they had all gone with a tea-basket into the forest, and when they came to a glade which was suitably sylvan, Miss Chalice, because it was idyllic, insisted on taking off her shoes and stockings. It would have been very charming, only her feet were rather large, and she had on both a large corn on the third toe. 
Philip felt it made her proceeding a little ridiculous. But now he looked upon her quite differently. There was something softly feminine in her large eyes and her olive skin. He felt himself a fool not to have seen that she was attractive. He thought he detected in her a touch of contempt for him, because he had not the sense to see that she was there, in his way, and in Lawson a suspicion of superiority. He was envious of Lawson, and he was jealous, not of the individual concern, but of his love. He wished that he was standing in his shoes and feeling with his heart. He was troubled, and the fear seized him that love would pass him by. He wanted a passion to seize him. He wanted to be swept off his feet and borne powerless in a mighty rush he cared not whither. Miss Chalice and Lawson seemed to him now somewhat different, and the constant companionship with them made him restless. He was dissatisfied with himself. Life was not giving him what he wanted, and he had an uneasy feeling that he was losing his time. The stout Frenchwoman soon guessed what the relations were between the couple, and talked of the matter to Philip with the utmost frankness. "'And you,' she said, with the tolerant smile of one who had fattened on the lust of her fellows, "'have you got a petite amie?' "'No,' said Philip, blushing. "'And why not? She de vitrage.' He shrugged his shoulders. He had a volume of Berlin in his hands, and he wandered off. He tried to read, but his passion was too strong. He thought of the stray amours to which he had been introduced by Flanagan, the sly visits to houses in a cul-de-sac, with the drawing-room in the Utrecht velvet, and the mercenary graces of painted women. He shuddered. He threw himself on the grass, stretching his limbs like a young animal freshly awakened from sleep, and the rippling water the poplars gently tremulous in the faint breeze, the blue sky were almost more than he could bear. He was in love with love. In his fancy he felt the kiss of warm lips on his, and around his neck the touch of soft hands. He imagined himself in the arms of Ruth Chalice. He thought of her dark eyes and the wonderful texture of her skin. He was mad to have let such a wonderful adventure slip through his fingers. And if Lawson had done it, why should not he? But this was only when he did not see her, when he lay awake at night or dreamed idly by the side of the canal. When he saw her he felt suddenly quite different. He had no desire to take her in his arms, and he could not imagine himself kissing her. It was very curious. Away from her he thought her beautiful, remembering only her magnificent eyes and the creamy pallor of her face. But when he was with her he saw only that she was flat-chested and that her teeth were slightly decayed. He could not forget the corns on her toes. He could not understand himself. Would he always love only in absence and be prevented from enjoying anything when he had the chance by that deformity of vision which seemed to exaggerate the revolting? He was not sorry when a change in the weather announcing the definite end of the long summer drove them all back to Paris. End of chapter 47 Chapter 48 When Philip returned to Amitrano's he found that Fanny Price was no longer working there. She had given up the key of her locker. He asked Mrs. Otter whether she knew what had become of her, and Mrs. Otter, with a shrug of the shoulders, answered that she had probably gone back to England. Philip was relieved. He was profoundly bored by her ill temper. Moreover, she insisted on advising him about his work, and looked upon it as a slight when he did not follow her precepts, and would not understand that he felt himself no longer the duffer he had been at first. Soon he forgot all about her. He was working in oils now, and he was full of enthusiasm. He hoped to have something done of sufficient importance to send to the following year's salon. Lawson was painting a portrait of Miss Chalice. She was very paintable and all the young men who had fallen victims to her charm had made portraits of her. A natural indolence, joined with a passion for picturesque attitude, made her an excellent sitter, and she had enough technical knowledge to offer useful criticisms. Since her passion for art was chiefly a passion to live the life of artists, she was quite content to neglect her own work. She liked the warmth of the studio and the opportunity to smoke innumerable cigarettes 
and she spoke in a low pleasant voice of the love of art and the art of love. She made no clear distinction between the two. Lawson was painting with infinite labor, working till he could hardly stand for days, and then scraping out all he had done. He would have exhausted the patience of any one but Ruth Chalice. At last he got into a hopeless muddle. "'The only thing is to take a new canvas and start fresh,' he said. "'I know exactly what I want now, and it won't take me long.' Philip was present at the time, and Miss Chalice said to him, "'Why don't you paint me too? You'll be able to learn a lot by watching Mr. Lawson.' It was one of Miss Chalice's delicacies that she always addressed her lovers by their surnames. "'I should like it awfully, if Lawson wouldn't mind. I don't care a damn,' said Lawson." It was the first time that Philip set about a portrait, and he began with trepidation but also with pride. He sat by Lawson and painted as he saw him paint. He profited by the example and by the advice which both Lawson and Miss Chalice freely gave him. At last Lawson finished and invited Clutton in to criticize. Clutton had only just come back to Paris. From Provence he had drifted down to Spain, eager to see Velasquez at Madrid, and thence he had gone to Toledo. He stayed there for three months, and he was returned with a new name to the young men. He had wonderful things to say of a painter called El Greco, who it appeared could only be studied in Toledo. "'Oh, yes, I know about him,' said Lawson. "'He's the old master whose distinction it is that he painted as badly as the moderns.' Clutton, more taciturn than ever, did not answer, but he looked at Lawson with a sardonic air. "'Are you going to show us the stuff you brought back from Spain?' asked Philip. "'I didn't paint in Spain. I was too busy.' "'What did you do, then?' "'I thought things out. I believe I'm through with the Impressionist. I've got an idea they'll seem very thin and superficial in a few years. I want to make a clean sweep of everything I've learnt and start fresh. When I came back I destroyed everything I'd painted. I've got nothing in my studio now but an easel, my paints.' and some clean canvases. What are you going to do? I don't know yet. I've only got an inkling of what I want. He spoke slowly in a curious manner, as though he were straining to hear something which was only just audible. There seemed to be a mysterious force in him which he himself did not understand, but which was struggling obscurely to find an outlet. His strength impressed you. Lawson dreaded the criticism he asked for, and had discounted the blame he thought he might get by affecting a contempt for any opinion of Clutton's. But Philip knew there was nothing which would give him more pleasure than Clutton's praise. Clutton looked at the portrait for some time in silence, then glanced at Philip's picture which was standing on an easel. "'What's that?' he asked. "'Oh, I had a shot at a portrait, too.' "'The sedulous ape,' he murmured. He turned away again to Lawson's canvas. Philip reddened but did not speak. "'Well, what do you think of it?' asked Lawson at length. "'The modeling's jolly good,' said Clutton, "'and I think it's very well drawn. "'Do you think the values are all right?' "'Quite.' Lawson smiled with delight. He shook himself in his clothes like a wet dog. "'I say I'm jolly glad you like it.' "'I don't. "'I don't think it's of the smallest importance.' Lawson's face fell, and he stared at Clutton with astonishment. He had no notion what he meant. Clutton had no gift of expression in words, and he spoke as though it were an effort. What he had to say was confused, halting, and verbose, but Philip knew the words which served as the text of his rambling discourse. Clutton, who never read, had heard them first from Cronshaw, and though they had made small impression they had remained in his memory, and lately emerging on a sudden had acquired the character of a revelation. A good painter had two chief objects to paint namely, man and the intention of his soul. The Impressionists had been occupied with other problems. They had painted man admirably, but they had troubled themselves as little as the English portrait painters of the eighteenth century with the intention of his soul. "'But when you try to get that you become literary,' said Lawson, interrupting. "'Let me paint the man like Manet, and the intention of his soul can go to the devil.' "'That would all be very well if you could beat Manet at his own game,' but you can't get anywhere near him. You can't feed yourself on the day before yesterday. It's ground which has been swept dry. You must go back. It's when I saw the Grecos that I felt one could get something more out of portraits than we knew before. 
"'It's just going back to Ruskin,' cried Lawson. "'No, you see, he went for morality. I don't care a damn for morality. Teaching doesn't come in, ethics and all that, but passion and emotion. The greatest portrait painters have painted both, man and the intention of his soul. Rembrandt and El Greco. It's only the second raters who've only painted man. A lily of the valley would be lovely, even if it didn't smell, but it's more lovely because it has perfume. That picture,' he pointed to Lawson's portrait, "'well, the drawing's all right and so's the modeling all right, but just conventional. It ought to be drawn and modeled so that you know the girl's a lousy slut. Correctness is all very well. El Greco made his people eight feet high because he wanted to express something he couldn't get any other way. "'Damn El Greco,' said Lawson. "'What's the good of jawing about a man when we haven't a chance of seeing any of his work?' Clutton shrugged his shoulders, smoked a cigarette in silence, and went away. Philip and Lawson looked at one another. "'There's something in what he says,' said Philip. Lawson stared ill-temperately at his picture. "'How the devil is one to get the intention of the soul except by painting exactly what one sees?' About this time Philip made a new friend. On Monday morning models assembled at the school in order that one might be chosen for the week, and one day a young man was taken who was plainly not a model by profession. Philip's attention was attracted by the manner in which he held himself. When he got on to the stand he stood firmly on both feet, square, with clenched hands, and with his head defiantly thrown forward. The attitude emphasized his fine figure. There was no fat on him and his muscles stood out as though they were of iron. His head, close-cropped, was well-shaped, and he wore a short beard. He had large, dark eyes and heavy eyebrows. He held the pose hour after hour without appearance of fatigue. There was in his mien a mixture of shame and of determination. His air of passionate energy excited Philip's romantic imagination, and when the sitting ended he saw him in his clothes, it seemed to him that he wore them as though he were a king in rags. He was uncommunicative, but in a day or two Mrs. Otter told Philip that the model was a Spaniard and that he had never sat before. "'I suppose he was starving,' said Philip. "'Have you noticed his clothes? They're quite neat and decent, aren't they?' It chanced that Potter, one of the Americans who worked at Amitrano's, was going to Italy for a couple of months and offered his studio to Philip. Philip was pleased. He was growing a little impatient of Lawson's peremptory advice and wanted to be by himself. At the end of the week he went up to the model and, on the pretense that his drawing was not finished, asked whether he would come and sit to him one day. "'I'm not a model,' the Spaniard answered. "'I have other things to do next week.' "'Come and have luncheon with me now, and we'll talk about it,' said Philip. And, as the other hesitated, he added with a smile, "'It won't hurt you to have lunch with me.' With a shrug of the shoulders the model consented, and they went off to a cremerie. The Spaniard spoke broken French, fluent but difficult to follow, and Philip managed to get on well enough with him. He found out that he was a writer. He had come to Paris to write novels, and kept himself meanwhile by all the expedients possible to a penniless man. He gave lessons. He did any translations he could get hold of, chiefly business documents, and at last had been driven to make money by his fine figure. Sitting was well paid, and what he had earned during the last week was enough to keep him for two more. He told Philip, amazed, that he could live easily on two francs a day, but it filled him with shame that he was obliged to show his body for money, and he looked upon sitting as a degradation which only hunger could excuse. Philip explained that he did not want him to sit for the figure, but only for the head, he wished to do a portrait of him which he might send to the next salon. "'But why should you want to paint me?' asked the Spaniard. Philip answered that the head interested him. He thought he could do a good portrait. "'I can't afford the time. I grudge every minute that I have to rob for my writing. But it would only be in the afternoon. I work at the school in the morning. And after all it's better to sit to me than to do translations of legal documents.' There were legends in the Latin quarter of a time when students of different countries lived together intimately, but this was long since past, and now the various nations were almost as much separated as in the Oriental city. At Julien's and the Beaux Arts a French student was looked upon with disfavor by his fellow countrymen 
when he consorted with foreigners, and it was difficult for an Englishman to know more than quite superficially any native inhabitants of the city in which he dwelt. Indeed, many of the students, after living in Paris for five years, knew no more French than served them in shops, and lived as English a life as though they were working in South Kensington. Philip, with his passion for the romantic, welcomed the opportunity to get in touch with a Spaniard. He used all his persuasiveness to overcome the man's reluctance. "'I tell you what I'll do,' said the Spaniard at last. "'I'll sit to you, but not for money, for my own pleasure.' Philip expostulated, but the other was firm, and at length they arranged that he should come on the following Monday at one o'clock. He gave Philip a card on which was printed his name, Miguel Ahuria. Miguel sat regularly, and though he refused to accept payment he borrowed fifty francs from Philip every now and then. It was a little more expensive than if Philip had paid for the sittings in the usual way, but gave the Spaniard a satisfactory feeling that he was not earning his living in a degrading manner. His nationality made Philip regard him as a representative of romance, and he asked him about Seville and Granada, Velasquez and Calderon but Miguel had no patience with the grandeur of his country. For him, as for so many of his compatriots, France was the only country for a man of intelligence, and Paris the center of the world. Spain is dead, he cried. It has no writers, it has no art, it has nothing. Little by little, with the exuberant rhetoric of his race, he revealed his ambitions. He was writing a novel which he hoped would make his name. He was under the influence of Zola and he had set his scene in Paris. He told Philip the story at length. To Philip it seemed crude and stupid, the naive obscenity. C'est la vie, mon cher, c'est la vie, he cried. The naive obscenity served only to emphasize the conventionality of the antidote. He had written for two years, amid incredible hardships, denying himself all the pleasures of life which had attracted him to Paris, fighting with starvation for art's sake, determined that nothing should hinder his great achievement. The effort was heroic. "'But why don't you write about Spain?' cried Philip. "'It would be so much more interesting. You know the life. But Paris is the only place worth writing about. Paris is life.' One day he brought part of the manuscript and in his bad French, translating excitedly as he went along so that Philip could scarcely understand, he read passages. It was lamentable. Philip puzzled, looked at the picture he was painting. The mind behind that broad brow was trivial, and the flashing passionate eyes saw nothing in life but the obvious. Philip was not satisfied with his portrait, and at the end of the sitting he nearly always scraped out what he had done. It was all very well to aim at the intention of the soul. Who could tell what that was when people seemed a mass of contradictions? He liked Miguel, and it distressed him to realize that his magnificent struggle was futile. He had everything to make a good writer but talent. Philip looked at his own work. How could you tell whether there was anything in it, or whether you were wasting your time? It was clear that the will to achieve could not help you, and confidence in yourself meant nothing. Philip thought of Fanny Price. She had a vehement belief in her talent. Her strength of will was extraordinary. If I thought I wasn't going to be really good, I'd rather give up painting, said Philip. I don't see any use in being a second-rate painter. Then one morning when he was going out, the concierge called out to him that there was a letter. Nobody wrote to him but his Aunt Louisa, and sometimes Hayward, and this was a handwriting he did not know. The letter was as follows. Please come at once when you get this. I couldn't put up with it any more. Please come yourself. I can't bear the thought that anyone else should touch me. I want you to have everything. F. Price. I have not had anything to eat for three days. Philip felt on a sudden sick with fear. He hurried to the house in which she lived. He was astonished that she was in Paris at all. He had not seen her for months, and imagined she had long since returned to England. When he arrived he asked the concierge whether she was in. Yes, but I've not seen her go out for two days. Philip ran upstairs and knocked at the door. There was no reply. He called her name. The door was locked, and on bending down he found the key was in the lock. Oh, my God, I hope she hasn't done something awful, he cried aloud. 
he ran down and told the porter that she was certainly in the room. He had had a letter from her and feared a terrible accident. He suggested breaking open the door. The porter, who had been sullen and disinclined to listen, became alarmed. He could not take the responsibility of breaking into the room. They must go for the commissaire de police. They walked together to the bureau, and then they fetched a locksmith. Philip found that Miss Price had not paid the last quarter's rent. On New Year's Day she had not given the concierge the present which old established custom led him to regard as a right. The four of them went upstairs, and they knocked again at the door. There was no reply. The locksmith set to work, and at last they entered the room. Philip gave a cry and instinctively covered his eyes with his hands. The wretched woman was hanging with a rope round her neck which she had tied to a hook in the ceiling fixed by some previous tenant to hold up the curtains of the bed. She had moved her own little bed out of the way and had stood on a chair which had been kicked away. It was lying on its side on the floor. They cut her down. The body was quite cold. End of chapter 48. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapters 49 through 52 of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 49 The story which Philip made out in one way and another was terrible. One of the grievances of the women students was that Fanny Price would never share their gay meals in restaurants, and the reason was obvious. She had been oppressed by dire poverty. He remembered the luncheon they had eaten together when first he came to Paris and the ghoulish appetite which had disgusted him. He realized now that she ate in that manner because she was ravenous. The concierge told him what her food had consisted of. A bottle of milk was left for her every day, and she brought in her own loaf of bread. She ate half the loaf and drank half the milk at midday when she came back from the school and consumed the rest in the evening. It was the same day after day. Philip thought with anguish of what she must have endured. She had never given anyone to understand that she was poorer than the rest, but it was clear that her money had been coming to an end, and at last she could not afford to come any more to the studio. The little room was almost bare of furniture, and there were no other clothes than the shabby brown dress she had always worn. Philip searched among her things for the address of some friend with whom he could communicate. He found a piece of paper on which his own name was written a score of times. It gave him a peculiar shock. He supposed it was true that she had loved him. He thought of the emaciated body in the brown dress hanging from the nail in the ceiling, and he shuddered. But if she had cared for him, why did she not let him help her? He would so gladly have done all he could. He felt remorseful because he had refused to see that she looked upon him with any particular feeling, and now these words in her letter were infinitely pathetic. I can't bear the thought that anyone else should touch me. She had died of starvation. Philip found at length a letter signed, Your Loving Brother, Albert. It was two or three weeks old, dated from some road in Sir Byton, and refused a loan of five pounds. The writer had his wife and family to think of, he didn't feel justified in lending money, and his advice was that Fanny should come back to London and try to get a situation. Philip telegraphed to Albert Price, and in a little while an answer came. Deeply distressed. Very awkward to leave my business. Is presence essential? Price. Philip wired a succinct affirmative, and next morning a stranger presented himself at the studio. My name's Price, he said, when Philip opened the door. He was a commonish man in black with a band round his bowler hat. He had something of Fanny's clumsy look. He wore a stubbly mustache and had a cockney accent. Philip asked him to come in. 
He cast sidelong glances round the studio while Philip gave him details of the accident and told him what he had done. "'I needn't see her, need I?' said Albert Price. "'My nerves aren't very good, and it takes very little to upset me.' He began to talk freely. He was a rubber merchant, and he had a wife and three children. Fanny was a governess, and he couldn't make out why she hadn't stuck to that instead of coming to Paris. Me and Mrs. Price told her Paris was no place for a girl, and there's no money in art, never has been. It was plain enough that he had not been on friendly terms with his sister, and he resented her suicide as a last injury that she had done him. He did not like the idea that she had been forced to it by poverty. That seemed to reflect on the family. The idea struck him that possibly there was a more respectable reason for her act. I suppose she hadn't any trouble with the man, had she? You know what I mean, Paris and all that. She might have done it so as not to disgrace herself. Philip felt himself reddening and cursed his weakness. Price's keen little eyes seemed to suspect him of an intrigue. I believe your sister to have been perfectly virtuous, he answered acidly. She killed herself because she was starving. Well, it's very hard on her family, Mr. Carey, she only had the right to me. I wouldn't have let my sister want. Philip had found the brother's address only by reading the letter in which he had refused a loan, but he shrugged his shoulders. There was no use in recrimination. He hated the little man and wanted to have done with him as soon as possible. Albert Price also wished to get through the necessary business quickly so that he could get back to London. They went to the tiny room in which poor Fanny had lived. Albert Price looked at the pictures and the furniture. "'I don't pretend to know much about art,' he said. "'I suppose these pictures would fetch something, wouldn't they?' "'Nothing,' said Philip. "'The furniture's not worth ten shillings.' Albert Price knew no French, and Philip had to do everything. It seemed that it was an interminable process to get the poor body safely hidden away underground. Papers had to be obtained in one place and signed in another officials had to be seen. For three days Philip was occupied from morning till night. At last he and Albert Price followed the hearse to the cemetery at Montpersan. "'I want to do the thing decent,' said Albert Price, "'but there's no use wasting money.' The short ceremony was infinitely dreadful in the cold gray morning. Half a dozen people who had worked with Fanny Price at the studio came to the funeral Mrs. Otter because she was monsieur and thought it her duty, Ruth Chalice because she had a kind heart, Lawson, Clutton, and Flanagan. They had all disliked her during her life. Philip, looking across the cemetery crowded on all sides with monuments, some poor and simple, others vulgar, pretentious, and ugly, shuddered. It was horribly sordid. When they came out Albert Price asked Philip to lunch with him. Philip loathed him now, and he was tired. He had not been sleeping well, for he dreamed constantly of Fanny Price in the torn brown dress hanging from the nail in the ceiling. But he could not think of an excuse. "'You take me somewhere where we can get a regular slap-up lunch. All this is the very worst thing for my nerves.' "'La Venuse is about the best place round here,' answered Philip. Albert Price settled himself on a velvet seat with a sigh of relief. He ordered a substantial luncheon and a bottle of wine. "'Well, I'm glad that's over,' he said. He threw out a few artful questions, and Philip discovered that he was eager to hear about the painter's life in Paris. He represented it to himself as deplorable, but he was anxious for details of the orgies which his fancy suggested to him. With sly winks and discreet snickering he conveyed that he knew very well that there was a great deal more than Philip confessed. He was a man of the world, and he knew a thing or two. He asked Philip whether he had ever been to any of those places in Montmartre which are celebrated from Temple Bar to the Royal Exchange. He would like to say he had been to the Moulin Rouge. The luncheon was very good, and the wine excellent. Albert Price expanded as the processes of digestion went satisfactorily forwards. "'Let's have a little brandy,' he said when the coffee was brought, and blow the expense. He rubbed his hands. "'You know, I've got half a mind to stay over tonight and go back tomorrow. What do you say to spending the evening together?' 
if you mean you want me to take you round Montmartre tonight, I'll see you damned, said Philip. I suppose it wouldn't be quite the thing. The answer was made so seriously that Philip was tickled. Besides, it would be rotten for your nerves, he said gravely. Albert Price concluded that he had better go back to London by the four o'clock train, and presently he took leave of Philip. Well, good-bye, old man, he said. I'll tell you what. I'll try and come over to Paris again one of these days, and I'll look you up, and then we won't have to go on the razzle. Philip was too restless to work that afternoon, so he jumped on a bus and crossed the river to see whether there were any pictures on view at the Rand Ruelles. After that he strolled along the boulevard. It was cold and windswept. People hurried by, wrapped up in their coats, shrunk together in an effort to keep out of the cold and their faces were pinched and careworn. It was icy underground in the cemetery at Montpersan among all those white tombstones. Philip felt lonely in the world and strangely homesick. He wanted company. At that hour Cronshaw would be working, and Clutton never welcomed visitors. Lawson was painting another portrait of Ruth Chalice and would not care to be disturbed he made up his mind to go and see Flanagan. He found him painting, but delighted to throw up his work and talk. The studio was comfortable, for the American had more money than most of them, and warm. Flanagan set about making tea. Philip looked at the two heads that he was sending to the salon. "'It's awful cheek, my sending anything,' said Flanagan, "'but I don't care. I'm going to send. Do you think they're rotten?' Not so rotten as I should have expected, said Philip. They showed, in fact, an astounding cleverness. The difficulties had been avoided with skill, and there was a dash about the way in which the paint was put on which was surprising and even attractive. Flanagan, without knowledge or technique, painted with the loose brush of a man who has spent a lifetime in the practice of the art. If one were forbidden to look at any picture for more than thirty seconds, you'd be a great master, Flanagan, smiled Philip. These young people were not in the habit of spoiling one another with excessive flattery. We haven't got time in America to spend more than thirty seconds in looking at any picture, laughed the other. Flanagan, though he was the most scatterbrained person in the world, had a tenderness of heart which was unexpected and charming. Whenever anyone was ill he installed himself as sick nurse. His gaiety was better than any medicine. Like many of his countrymen he had not the English dread of sentimentality which keeps so tight a hold on emotion, and, finding nothing absurd in the show of feeling, could offer an exuberant sympathy which was often grateful to his friends in distress. He saw that Philip was depressed by what he had gone through and with unaffected kindliness set himself boisterously to cheer him up. He exaggerated the Americanisms which he knew always made the Englishman laugh and poured out a breathless stream of conversation, whimsical, high-spirited, and jolly. In due course they went out to dinner, and afterwards to the Gate Maupassant, which was Flanagan's favorite place of amusement. By the end of the evening he was in his most extravagant humor. He had drunk a good deal, but any inebriety from which he suffered was due much more to his own vivacity than to alcohol. He proposed that they should go to the Bal Bouillet, and Philip, feeling too tired to go to bed, willingly enough consented. They sat down at a table on the platform at the side, raised a little from the level of the floor, so that they could watch the dancing and drank a box. Presently Flanagan saw a friend and with a wild shout leaped over the barrier onto the space where they were dancing. Philip watched the people. Boulier was not the resort of fashion. It was Thursday night and the place was crowded. There were a number of students of the various faculties, but most of the men were clerks or assistants in shops. They wore their everyday clothes, ready-made tweeds or queer tail coats, and their hats, for they had brought them in with them and when they danced there was no place to put them but their heads. Some of the women looked like servant girls, and some were painted hussies, but for the most part they were shop girls. They were poorly dressed in cheap imitation of the fashions on the other side of the river. The hussies were got up to resemble the music-hall artiste or the dancer who enjoyed notoriety at the moment. 
Their eyes were heavy with black and their cheeks impotently scarlet. The hall was lit by great white lights, low down, which emphasized the shadows on the faces. All the lines seemed to harden under it, and the colors were most crude. It was a sordid scene. Philip leaned over the rail, staring down, and he ceased to hear the music. They danced furiously. They danced round the room, slowly, talking very little, with all their attention given to the dance. The room was hot, and their faces shone with sweat. It seemed to Philip that they had thrown off the guard which people wear on their expression, the homage to convention, and he saw them now as they really were. In that moment of abandon they were strangely animal. Some were foxy and some were wolf-like, and others had the long, foolish face of sheep. Their skins were sallow from the unhealthy life they led and the poor food they ate. Their features were blunted by mean interests, and their little eyes were shifty and cunning. There was nothing of nobility in their bearing, and you felt that for all of them life was a long succession of petty concerns and sordid thoughts. The air was heavy with the musty smell of humanity. But they danced furiously as though impelled by some strange power within them, and it seemed to Philip that they were driven forward by a rage for enjoyment they were seeking desperately to escape from a world of horror. The desire for pleasure which Cronshaw said was the only motive of human action urged them blindly on, and the very vehemence of the desire seemed to rob it of all pleasure. They were hurried on by a great wind, helplessly, they knew not why, and they knew not whither. Fate seemed to tower above them, and they danced as though everlasting darkness were beneath their feet. Their silence was vaguely alarming. It was as if life terrified them and robbed them of power of speech so that the shriek which was in their hearts died at their throats. Their eyes were haggard and grim, and notwithstanding the beastly lust that disfigured them and the meanness of their faces and the cruelty notwithstanding the stupidness which was worst of all, the anguish of those fixed eyes made all that crowd terrible and pathetic. Philip loathed them, and yet his heart ached with the infinite pity which filled him. He took his coat from the cloakroom and went out into the bitter coldness of the night. End of chapter 49 Chapter 50 Philip could not get the unhappy event out of his head. What troubled him most was the uselessness of Fanny's effort. No one could have worked harder than she, nor with more sincerity. She believed in herself with all her heart, but it was plain that self-confidence meant very little. All his friends had it, Miguel Ohura among the rest, and Philip was shocked by the contrast between the Spaniard's heroic endeavor and the triviality of the thing he attempted. The unhappiness of Philip's life at school had called up in him the power of self-analysis, and this vice, as subtle as drug-taking, had taken possession of him so that he had now a peculiar keenness in the dissection of his feelings. He could not help seeing that art affected him differently from others. A fine picture gave Lawson an immediate thrill. His appreciation was instinctive. Even Flanagan felt certain things which Philip was obliged to think out. His own appreciation was intellectual. He could not help thinking that if he had in him the artistic temperament, he hated the phrase but could discover no other, he would feel beauty in the emotional, unreasoning way in which they did. He began to wonder whether he had anything more than a superficial cleverness of the hand which enabled him to copy objects with accuracy. That was nothing. He had learned to despise technical dexterity. The important thing was to feel in terms of paint. Lawson painted in a certain way because it was his nature to, and through the imitativeness of a student sensitive to every influence there pierced individuality. Philip looked at his own portrait of Ruth Chalice, and now that three months had passed he realized that it was no more than a servile copy of Lawson. He felt himself barren. He painted with the brain and he could not help knowing that the only painting worth anything was done with the heart. He had very little money, 
barely sixteen hundred pounds, and it would be necessary for him to practice the severest economy. He could not count on earning anything for ten years. The history of painting was full of artists who had earned nothing at all. He must resign himself to penury, and it was worth while if he produced work which was immortal, but he had a terrible fear that he would never be more than second-rate. Was it worth while for that to give up one's youth and the gaiety of life and the manifold chances of being? He knew the existence of foreign painters in Paris enough to see that the lives they led were narrowly provincial. He knew some who had dragged along for twenty years in the pursuit of a fame which always escaped them till they sunk into sordidness and alcoholism. Fanny's suicide had aroused memories and Philip heard ghastly stories of the way in which one person or another had escaped from despair. He remembered the scornful advice which the master had given poor Fanny. It would have been well for her if she had taken it and given up an attempt which was hopeless. Philip finished his portrait of Miguel Ahura and made up his mind to send it to the Salon. Flanagan was sending two pictures, and he thought he could paint as well as Flanagan. He had worked so hard on the portrait that he could not help feeling it must have merit. It was true that when he looked at it he felt that there was something wrong, though he could not tell what. But when he was away from it his spirits went up and he was not dissatisfied. He sent it to the salon and it was refused. He did not mind much, since he had done all he could to persuade himself that there was little chance that it would be taken till Flanagan a few days later rushed in to tell Lawson and Philip that one of his pictures was accepted. With a blank face Philip offered his congratulations, and Flanagan was so busy congratulating himself that he did not catch the note of irony which Philip could not prevent from coming into his voice. Lawson, quicker witted, observed it and looked at Philip curiously. His own picture was all right, he knew that a day or two before, and he was vaguely resentful of Philip's attitude, but he was surprised at the sudden question which Philip put him as soon as the American was gone. "'If you were in my place, would you chuck the whole thing?' "'What do you mean? I wonder if it's worth while being a second-rate painter. You see, in other things, if you're a doctor or if you're in business, it doesn't matter so much if you're mediocre. You make a living and you get along.' but what is the good of turning out second-rate pictures? Lawson was fond of Philip, and as soon as he had thought he was seriously distressed by the refusal of his picture, he set to console him. It was notorious that the Salon had refused pictures which were afterwards famous. It was the first time Philip had sent, and he must expect a rebuff. Flanagan's success was explicable. His picture was showy and superficial. It was just the sort of thing a languid jury would see merited. Philip grew impatient. It was humiliating that Lawson should think him capable of being seriously disturbed by so trivial a calamity, and would not realize that his dejection was due to a deep-seated distrust of his powers. Of late Clutton had withdrawn himself somewhat from the group who took their meals at Gravier's and lived very much by himself. Flanagan said he was in love with a girl, but Clutton's austere countenance did not suggest passion, and Philip thought it more probable that he separated himself from his friends so that he might grow clear with the new ideas which were in him. But that evening when the others had left the restaurant to go to a play, and Philip was sitting alone, Clutton came in and ordered dinner. They began to talk, and finding Clutton more loquacious and less sardonic than usual, Philip determined to take advantage of his good humor. "'I say, I wish you'd come and look at my picture,' he said. "'I'd like to know what you think of it.' "'No, I won't do that.' "'Why not?' asked Philip, reddening. The request was one which they all made of one another, and no one ever thought of refusing. Clutton shrugged his shoulders. "'People ask you for criticism, but they only want praise. Besides, what's the good of criticism?' What does it matter if your picture is good or bad? It matters to me. No, the only reason that one paints is that one can't help it. It's a function like any of the other functions of the body, only comparatively few people have got it. One paints for oneself, 
otherwise one would commit suicide. Just think of it. You spend God knows how long trying to get something onto canvas, putting the sweat of your soul into it, and what is the result? Ten to one it will be refused at the salon. If it's accepted, people glance at it for ten seconds as they pass. If you're lucky, some ignorant fool will buy it and put it on his walls and look at it as little as he looks at his dining-room table. Criticism has nothing to do with the artist. It judges objectively, but the objective doesn't concern the artist. Clutton put his hands over his eyes so that he might concentrate his mind on what he wanted to say. The artist gets a peculiar sensation from something he sees and is impelled to express it, and he doesn't know why he can only express his feeling by lines and colors. It's like a musician. He'll read a line or two and a certain combination of notes presents itself to him. He doesn't know why such and such words call forth in him such and such notes. They just do. And I'll tell you another reason why criticism is meaningless. A great painter forces the world to see nature as he sees it, but in the next generation another painter sees the world in another way, and then the public judges him not by himself but by his predecessor. So the Barbizon people taught our fathers to look at trees in a certain manner, and when Monet came along and painted differently, people said, but trees aren't like that. It never struck them that trees are exactly how a painter chooses to see them. We paint from within outwards. If we force our vision on the world, it calls us great painters. If we don't, it ignores us, but we are the same. We don't attach any meaning to greatness or to smallness. What happens to our work afterwards is unimportant. We have got all we could out of it while we were doing it. There was a pause while Clutton, with voracious appetite, devoured the food that was set before him. Philip, smoking a cheap cigar, observed him closely. The ruggedness of the head, which looked as though it were carved from a stone refractory to the sculptor's chisel, the rough mane of dark hair, the great nose, and the massive bones of the jaw, suggested a man of strength. And yet Philip wondered whether perhaps the mask concealed a strange weakness. Clutton's refusal to show his work might be sheer vanity. He could not bear the thought of anyone's criticism, and he would not expose himself to the chance of a refusal from the salon. He wanted to be received as a master, and would not risk comparisons with other work which might force him to diminish his own opinion of himself. During the eighteen months Philip had known him, Clutton had grown more harsh and bitter. Though he would not come out into the open and compete with his fellows, he was indignant with the facile success of those who did. He had no patience with Lawson, and the pair were no longer on the intimate terms upon which they had been when Philip first knew them. "'Lawson's all right,' he said contemptuously. "'He'll go back to England, become a fashionable portrait painter, earn ten thousand a year, and be an A.R.A. before he's forty. Portraits done by hand for the nobility and gentry.' Philip, too, looked into the future, and he saw Clutton in twenty years, bitter, lonely, savage and unknown still in Paris, for the life there had got into his bones, ruling a small cynical with a savage tongue, at war with himself and the world, producing little in his increasing passion for perfection he could not reach, and perhaps sinking at last into drunkenness. Of late Philip had been captivated by an idea that since one had only one life it was important to make a success of it, but he did not count success by the acquiring of money or the achieving of fame. He did not quite know yet what he meant by it, perhaps variety of experience and the making the most of his abilities. It was plain, anyway, that the life which Clutton seemed destined to was failure. Its only justification would be the painting of imperishable masterpieces. He recollected Cronshaw's whimsical metaphor of the Persian carpet. He had thought of it often, but Cronshaw with his fawny-like humor had refused to make his meaning clear he repeated that it had none unless one discovered it for oneself. It was this desire to make a success of life which was at the bottom of Philip's uncertainty about continuing his artistic career. But Clutton began to talk again. "'Do you remember my telling you about that chap I met in Brittany? I saw him the other day here. 
he's just off to Tahiti. He was broke to the world. He was a brasseur de fer, a stockbroker, I suppose you call it in English, and he had a wife and family, and he was earning a large income. He chucked it all to become a painter. He just went off and settled down in Brittany and began to paint. He hadn't got any money and did the next best thing to starving. And what about his wife and family? asked Philip. Oh, he dropped them. He left them to starve on their own account. It sounds a pretty low-down thing to do. Oh, my dear fellow, if you want to be a gentleman you must give up being an artist. They've got nothing to do with one another. You hear of men painting pot-boilers to keep an aged mother. Well, it shows they're excellent sons, but it's no excuse for bad work. They're only tradesmen. An artist would let his mother go to the workhouse. There's a writer I know over here who told me that his wife died in childbirth. He was in love with her and he was mad with grief, but as he sat at the bedside watching her die he found himself making mental notes of how she looked and what she said and the things he was feeling. Gentlemanly, wasn't it? "'But is your friend a good painter?' asked Philip. "'No, not yet. He paints just like Pizarro. He hasn't found himself, but he's got a sense of color and a sense of decoration. But that isn't the question.' It's the feeling, and that he's got. He's behaved like a perfect cad to his wife and children. He's always behaving like a perfect cad. The way he treats the people who've helped him, and sometimes he's been saved from starvation merely by the kindness of his friends, is simply beastly. He just happens to be a great artist. Philip pondered over the man who was willing to sacrifice everything, comfort, home, money, love, honor, duty for the sake of getting on to canvas with paint the emotion which the world gave him. It was magnificent, and yet his courage failed him. Thinking of Cronshaw recalled to him the fact that he had not seen him for a week, and so when Clutton left him he wandered along to the café in which he was certain to find the writer. During the first few months of his stay in Paris Philip had accepted as gospel all that Cronshaw said but Philip had a practical outlook, and he grew impatient with the theories which resulted in no action. Cronshaw's slim bundle of poetry did not seem a substantial result for a life which was sordid. Philip could not wrench out of his nature the instincts of the middle class from which he came, and the penury, the hack-work which Cronshaw did to keep body and soul together, the monotony of existence between the slovenly attic and the café table jarred with his respectability. Cronshaw was astute enough to know that the young man disapproved of him, and he attacked his philistinism with an irony which was sometimes playful, but often very keen. "'You're a tradesman,' he told Philip. "'You want to invest life in consoles so that it shall bring you in a safe three per cent. I'm a spendthrift. I run through my capital. I shall spend my last penny with my last heartbeat.' The metaphor irritated Philip because it assumed for the speaker a romantic attitude and cast a slur upon the position which Philip instinctively felt had more to say for it than he could think of at the moment. But this evening Philip, undecided, wanted to talk about himself. Fortunately it was late already, and Cronshaw's pile of saucers on the table, each indicating a drink, suggested that he was prepared to take an independent view of things in general. I wonder if you'd give me some advice, said Philip suddenly. You won't take it, will you? Philip shrugged his shoulders impatiently. I don't believe I shall ever do much good as a painter. I don't see any use in being second-rate. I'm thinking of chucking it. Why shouldn't you? Philip hesitated for an instant. I suppose I like the life. A change came over Cronshaw's placid round face. The corners of the mouth were suddenly depressed, the eyes sunk dully in their orbits. He seemed to become strangely bowed and old. This, he cried, looking round the café in which they sat. His voice really trembled a little. If you can get out of it, do while there's time. Philip stared at him with astonishment, but the sight of emotion always made him feel shy, and he dropped his eyes. He knew that he was looking upon the tragedy of failure there was silence. Philip thought that Cronshaw was looking upon his own life, and perhaps he considered his youth with its bright hopes 
and the disappointments which wore out the radiancy, the wretched monotony of pleasure, and the black future. Philip's eyes rested on the little pile of saucers, and he knew that Cronshaw's were on them too. End of chapter 50 Chapter 51 Two months passed. It seemed to Philip, brooding over these matters, that in the true painters, writers, musicians, there was a power which drove them to such complete absorption in their work as to make it inevitable for them to subordinate life to art. Succumbing to an influence they never realized, they were merely dupes of the instinct that possessed them, and life slipped through their fingers unlived. But he had a feeling that life was to be lived rather than portrayed, and he wanted to search out the various experiences of it and wring from each moment all the emotion that it offered. He made up his mind at length to take a certain step and abide by the result, and, having made up his mind, he determined to take the step at once. Luckily enough, the next morning was one of Juanet's days, and he resolved to ask him, point-blank, whether it was worth his while to go on with the study of art. He had never forgotten the master's brutal advice to Fanny Price. It had been sound. Philip could never get Fanny entirely out of his head. The studio seemed strange without her, and now and then the gesture of one of the women working there or a tone of a voice would give him a sudden start reminding him of her. Her presence was more noticeable now she was dead than it had ever been during her life, and he often dreamed of her at night waking with a cry of terror. It was horrible to think of all the suffering she must have endured. Philip knew that on the day Soinet came to the studio he lunched at a little restaurant in the Rue d'Odessa and he hurried his own meal so that he could go and wait outside till the painter came out. Philip walked up and down the crowded street and at last saw Monsieur Foinet walking with bent head towards him. Philip was very nervous, but he forced himself to go up to him. Pardon, monsieur, I should like to speak to you for one moment. Foinet gave him a rapid glance, recognized him, but did not smile the greeting. Speak, he said. I've been working here nearly two years now under you. I wanted to ask you to tell me, frankly, if you think it's worth while for me to continue. Philip's voice was trembling a little. Foinet walked on without looking up. Philip, watching his face, saw no trace of expression upon it. I don't understand. I'm very poor. If I have no talent, I would sooner do something else. Don't you know if you have talent? All my friends know they have talent, but I am aware some of them are mistaken. Juanet's bitter mouth outlined the shadow of a smile, and he asked, Do you live near here? Philip told him where his studio was. Juanet turned round. Let us go there. You shall show me your work. Now? cried Philip. Why not? Philip had nothing to say. He walked silently by the master's side. He felt horribly sick. It had never struck him that Foinet would wish to see his things there and then. He meant so that he might have time to prepare himself, to ask him if he would mind coming at some future date, or whether he might bring them to Foinet's studio. He was trembling with anxiety. In his heart he hoped that Foinet would look at his picture, and that rare smile would come into his face, and he would shake Philip's hand and say, Pasma, go on, my lad you have talent, real talent. Philip's heart swelled at the thought. It was such a relief, such a joy. Now he could go on with courage, and what did hardship matter, privation, and disappointment, if he arrived at last? He had worked very hard, it would be too cruel if all that industry were futile. And then, with a start, he remembered that he had heard Fanny Price say just that. They arrived at the house and Philip was seized with fear. If he had dared he would have asked Foinet to go away. He did not want to know the truth. They went in and the concierge handed him a letter as they passed. He glanced at the envelope and recognized his uncle's handwriting. Foinet followed him up the stairs. Philip could think of nothing to say. Foinet was mute and the silence got on his nerves. The professor sat down and Philip, without a word, placed before him the pictures which the Salon had rejected. 
Fournay nodded, but did not speak. Then Philip showed him the two portraits he had made of Ruth Chalice, two or three landscapes which he had painted at Moray, and a number of sketches. "'That's all,' he said presently, with a nervous laugh. Monsieur Fournay rolled himself a cigarette and lit it. "'You have very little private means?' he asked at last. "'Very little,' answered Philip, with a sudden feeling of cold at his heart. "'Not enough to live on.' there is nothing so degrading as the constant anxiety about one's means of livelihood i have nothing but contempt for the people who despise money they are hypocrites or fools money is like a sixth sense without which you cannot make a complete use of the other five without an adequate income half the possibilities of life are shut off the only thing to be careful about is that you do not pay more than a shilling for the shilling you earn you will hear people say that poverty is the best spur to an artist. They have never felt the iron of it in their flesh. They do not know how mean it makes you. It exposes you to endless humiliation. It cuts your wings. It eats into your soul like a cancer. It is not wealth one asks for, but just enough to preserve one's dignity, to work unhampered, to be generous, frank, and independent. I pity with all my heart the artist, whether he writes or paints, who is entirely dependent for subsistence upon his art. Philip quietly put away the various things which he had shown. I'm afraid that sounds as if you didn't think I had much chance. Master Foinet slightly shrugged his shoulders. You have a certain manual dexterity. With hard work and perseverance there is no reason why you should not become a careful, not incompetent painter you would find hundreds who painted worse than you, hundreds who painted as well. I see no talent in anything you have shown me. I see industry and intelligence. You will never be anything but mediocre. Philip obliged himself to answer quite steadily. I'm very grateful to you for having taken so much trouble. I can't thank you enough. Monsieur Foinet got up and made as if to go, but he changed his mind and stopping, put his hand on Philip's shoulder. But if you were to ask me my advice, I should say, take your courage in both hands and try your luck at something else. It sounds very hard, but let me tell you this. I would give all I have in the world if someone had given me that advice when I was your age and I had taken it. Philip looked up at him with surprise. The master forced his lips into a smile but his eyes remained grave and sad. It is cruel to discover one's mediocrity only when it is too late. It does not improve the temper. He gave a little laugh as he said the last words, and quickly walked out of the room. Philip mechanically took up the letter from his uncle. The sight of his handwriting made him anxious, for it was his aunt who always wrote to him. She had been ill for the last three months, and he had offered to go over to England and see her but she, fearing it would interfere with his work, had refused. She did not want him to put himself to inconvenience. She said she would wait till August, and then she hoped he would come and stay at the vicarage for two or three weeks. If by any chance she grew worse, she would let him know, since she did not wish to die without seeing him again. If his uncle wrote to him, it must be because she was too ill to hold a pen. Philip opened the letter. It ran as follows. My dear Philip, I regret to inform you that your dear aunt departed this life early this morning. She died very suddenly but quite peacefully. The change for the worse was so rapid that we had no time to send for you. She was fully prepared for the end and entered into rest with the complete assurance of a blessed resurrection and with resignation to the divine will of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. Your aunt would have liked you to be present at the funeral, so I trust you will come as soon as you can. There is naturally a great deal of work thrown upon my shoulders, and I am very much upset. I trust that you will be able to do everything for me. Your affectionate uncle, William Carey. End of chapter 51 Chapter 52 Next day Philip arrived at Blackstable. 
Since the death of his mother he had never lost anyone closely connected with him. His aunt's death shocked him and filled him also with a curious fear. He felt for the first time his own mortality. He could not realize what life would be for his uncle without the constant companionship of the woman who had loved and tended him for forty years. He expected to find him broken down with hopeless grief. He dreaded the first meeting. He knew that he could say nothing which would be of use. He rehearsed to himself a number of apposite speeches. He entered the vicarage by the side door and went into the dining-room. Uncle William was reading the paper. "'Your train was late,' he said, looking up. Philip was prepared to give way to his emotion, but the matter-of-fact reception startled him. His uncle, subdued but calm, handed him the paper. "'There's a very nice little paragraph about her in the Blackstable Times,' he said. Philip read it mechanically. "'Would you like to come up and see her?' Philip nodded, and together they walked upstairs. Aunt Louisa was lying in the middle of the large bed with flowers all round her. "'Would you like to say a short prayer?' said the vicar. He sank on his knees, and because it was expected of him, Philip followed his example. He looked at the little shriveled face. He was only conscious of one emotion. What a wasted life! In a minute Mr. Carey gave a cough and stood up. He pointed to a wreath at the foot of the bed. "'That's from the squire,' he said. He spoke in a low voice, as though he were in church, but one felt that, as a clergyman, he found himself quite at home. "'I expect tea is ready.' They went down again to the dining-room. The drawn blinds gave a lugubrious aspect. The vicar sat at the end of the table at which his wife had always sat, and poured out the tea with ceremony. Philip could not help feeling that neither of them should have been able to eat anything, but when he saw that his uncle's appetite was unimpaired he fell to with his usual heartiness. They did not speak for a while. Philip set himself to eat an excellent cake with the air of grief which he felt was decent. "'Things have changed a great deal since I was a curate,' said the vicar presently. "'In my young days the mourners used always to be given a pair of black gloves and a piece of black silk for their hats. Poor Louisa used to make the silk into dresses. She always said that twelve funerals gave her a new dress. Then he told Philip who had sent Reese. There were twenty-four of them already. When Mrs. Rawlingson, wife of the vicar at Fern, had died, she had had thirty-two, but probably a good many more would come the next day. The funeral would start at eleven o'clock from the vicarage, and they should beat Mrs. Rawlingson easily. Louisa never liked Mrs. Rawlingson. "'I shall take the funeral myself. I promised Louisa I would never let anyone else bury her.' Philip looked at his uncle with disapproval when he took a second piece of cake. Under the circumstances he could not help thinking it greedy. "'Mary Ann certainly makes capital cakes. I'm afraid no one else will make such good ones.' "'She's not going,' cried Philip with astonishment. Marianne had been at the vicarage ever since he could remember. She never forgot his birthday, but made a point always of sending him a trifle, absurd but touching. He had a real affection for her. "'Yes,' answered Mr. Carey. "'I don't think it would do to have a single woman in the house.' "'But good heavens, she must be over forty. "'Yes, I think she is. But she's been rather troublesome lately.' she's been inclined to take too much on herself, and I thought this was a very good opportunity to give her notice. It's certainly one which isn't likely to recur, said Philip. He took out a cigarette, but his uncle prevented him from lighting it. Not till after the funeral, Philip, he said gently. All right, said Philip. It wouldn't be quite respectful to smoke in the house so long as your poor Aunt Louisa is upstairs. Josiah Graves, churchwarden and manager of the bank, came back to dinner at the vicarage after the funeral. The blinds had been drawn up, and Philip, against his will, felt a curious sensation of relief. The body in the house had made him uncomfortable. In life the poor woman had been all that was kind and gentle, and yet, when she lay upstairs in her bedroom, cold and stark, it seemed as though she cast upon the survivors a baleful influence. The thought horrified Philip. 
he found himself alone for a minute or two in the dining-room with the churchwarden. "'I hope you'll be able to stay with your uncle a while,' he said. "'I don't think he ought to be left alone just yet.' "'I haven't made any plans,' answered Philip. "'If he wants me, I shall be very pleased to stay.' By way of cheering the bereaved husband, the churchwarden during dinner talked of a recent fire at Blackstable which had partly destroyed the Wesleyan chapel. "'I hear they weren't insured,' he said with a little smile. "'That won't make any difference,' said the vicar. "'They'll get as much money as they want to rebuild. Chapel people are always ready to give money.' "'I see that Holden sent a wreath. Holden was the dissenting minister, and though for Christ's sake who died for both of them, Mr. Carey nodded to him in the street, he did not speak to him. "'I think it was very pushing,' he remarked. "'There were forty-one wreaths. Yours was beautiful.' Philip and I admired it very much. Don't mention it, said the banker. He had noticed with satisfaction that it was larger than anyone else's. It had looked very well. They began to discuss the people who attended the funeral. Shops had been closed for it, and the church warden took out of his pocket the notice which had been printed. Owing to the funeral of Mrs. Carey, this establishment will not be opened till one o'clock. It was my idea, he said. I think it was very nice of them to close, said the vicar. Poor Louisa would have appreciated that. Philip ate his dinner. Marianne had treated the day as Sunday, and they had roast chicken and a gooseberry tart. I suppose you hadn't thought about a tombstone yet, said the churchwarden. Yes, I have. I thought of a plain stone cross. Louisa was always against ostentation. I don't think one can do much better than a cross. If you're thinking of a text, what do you say to with Christ, which is far better? The vicar pursed his lips. It was just like Bismarck to try and settle everything himself. He did not like that text. It seemed to cast an aspersion on himself. I don't think I should put it that way. I much prefer the Lord has given and the Lord has taken away. Oh, do you? That always seems to me a little indifferent. The vicar answered with some acidity and Mr. Graves replied in a tone which the widower thought too authoritative for the occasion. Things were going rather far if he could not choose his own text for his own wife's tombstone. There was a pause, and then the conversation drifted to parish matters. Philip went into the garden to smoke his pipe. He sat on a bench and suddenly began to laugh hysterically. A few days later his uncle expressed the hope that he would spend the next few weeks at Blackstable. "'Yes, that will suit me very well,' said Philip. "'I suppose it'll do if you go back to Paris in September.' Philip did not reply. He had thought much of what Poinet said to him, but he was still so undecided that he did not wish to speak of the future. There would be something fine in giving up art because he was convinced that he could not excel, but unfortunately it would seem so only to himself. To others it would be an admission of defeat and he did not want to confess that he was beaten. He was an obstinate fellow, and the suspicion that his talent did not lie in one direction made him inclined to force circumstances and aim notwithstanding precisely in that direction. He could not bear that his friends should laugh at him. This might have prevented him from ever taking the definite step of abandoning the study of painting, but the different environment made him on a sudden see things differently. Like many another, he discovered that crossing the channel makes things which had seemed important singularly futile. The life which had been so charming that he could not bear to leave it now seemed inept. He was seized with a distaste for the cafés, the restaurants with their ill-cooked food, the shabby way in which they all lived. He did not care any more what his friends thought about him. Cronshaw with his rhetoric. Mrs. Otter with her respectability, Ruth Chalice with her affectations, Lawson and Clutton with their quarrels. He felt a revulsion from them all. He wrote to Lawson and asked him to send over all his belongings. A week later they arrived. When he unpacked his canvases he found himself able to examine his work without emotion. He noticed the fact with interest. His uncle was anxious to see his pictures. Though he had so greatly disapproved of Philip's desire to go to Paris, 
he accepted the situation now with equanimity. He was interested in the life of students and constantly put Philip questions about it. He was, in fact, a little proud of him because he was a painter, and when people were present made attempts to draw him out. He looked eagerly at the studies of models which Philip showed him. Philip set before him his portrait of Miguel Ahura. "'Why did you paint him?' asked Mr. Carey. "'Oh, I wanted a model, and his head interested me. "'As you haven't got anything to do here, I wonder if you don't paint me. "'It would bore you to sit. I think I should like it. "'We must see about it.' Philip was amused at his uncle's vanity. It was clear that he was dying to have his portrait painted. To get something for nothing was a chance not to be missed. For two or three days he threw out little hints. He reproached Philip for laziness, asked him when he was going to start work, and finally began telling everyone he met that Philip was going to paint him. At last there came a rainy day, and after breakfast Mr. Carey said to Philip, "'Now, what do you say to starting on my portrait this morning?' Philip put down the book he was reading and leaned back in his chair. "'I've given up painting,' he said. "'Why?' asked his uncle in astonishment. "'I don't think there's much object in being a second-rate painter, and I came to the conclusion that I should never be anything else.' "'You surprise me. Before you went to Paris you were quite certain that you were a genius.' "'I was mistaken,' said Philip. "'I should have thought now you'd taken up a profession you'd have the pride to stick to it. It seems to me that what you lack is perseverance.' Philip was a little annoyed that his uncle did not even see how truly heroic his determination was. "'A rolling stone gathers no moss,' proceeded the clergyman. Philip hated that proverb above all, and it seemed to him perfectly meaningless. His uncle had repeated it often during the arguments which had preceded his departure from business. Apparently it recalled that occasion to his guardian. "'You're no longer a boy, you know.' you must begin to think of settling down. First you insist on becoming a chartered accountant, and then you get tired of that and you want to become a painter, and now, if you please, you change your mind again. It points to... He hesitated for a moment to consider what defects of character exactly it indicated, and Philip finished the sentence. Irresolution, incompetence, want of foresight, and lack of determination. The vicar looked up at his nephew quickly to see whether he was laughing at him. Philip's face was serious, but there was a twinkle in his eyes which irritated him. Philip should really be getting more serious. He felt it right to give him a rap over the knuckles. "'Your money matters have nothing to do with me now. You're your own master, but I think you should remember that your money won't last forever, and the unlucky deformity you have doesn't exactly make it easier for you to earn your living.' Philip knew by now that whenever anyone was angry with him his first thought was to say something about his club foot. His estimate of the human race was determined by the fact that scarcely anyone failed to resist the temptation, but he had trained himself not to show any sign that the reminder wounded him. He had even acquired control over the blushing which in his boyhood had been one of his torments. "'As you justly remark,' he answered, my money matters have nothing to do with you, and I am my own master. At all events you will do me the justice to acknowledge that I was justified in my opposition when you made up your mind to become an art student. I don't know so much about that. I dare say one profits more by the mistakes one makes off one's own bat than by doing the right thing on somebody else's advice. I've had my fling, and I don't mind settling down now what at? Philip was not prepared for the question, since in fact he had not made up his mind. He had thought of a dozen callings. The most suitable thing you could do is enter your father's profession and become a doctor. Oddly enough, that is precisely what I intend. He had thought of doctoring, among other things, chiefly because it was an occupation which seemed to give a good deal of personal freedom, and his experience of life at an office had made him determine never to have anything more to do with one. His answer to the vicar slipped out almost unawares, because it was in the nature of a repartee. 
it amused him to make up his mind in that accidental way, and he resolved then and there to enter his father's old hospital in the autumn. Then your two years in Paris may be regarded as so much wasted time? I don't know about that. I had a very jolly two years, and I learned one or two useful things. What? Philip reflected for an instant, and his answer was not devoid of a gentle desire to annoy. I learned to look at hands which I'd never looked at before, and instead of just looking at houses and trees, I learned to look at houses and trees against the sky, and I learned also that shadows are not black, but colored. I suppose you think you're very clever. I think your flippancy is quite inane. End of chapter 52 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters fifty three through fifty six of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maud. Chapter fifty three. Taking the paper with him, Mr. Carey retired to his study. Philip changed his chair for that in which his uncle had been sitting. It was the only comfortable one in the room, and looked out of the window at the pouring rain. Even in that sad weather there was something restful about the green fields that stretched to the horizon. There was an intimate charm in the landscape which he did not remember ever to have noticed before. Two years in France had opened his eyes to the beauty of his own countryside. He thought with a smile of his uncle's remark. It was lucky that the turn of his mind tended to flippancy. He had begun to realize what a great loss he had sustained in the death of his father and mother. That was one of the differences in his life which prevented him from seeing things in the same way as other people. The love of parents for their children is the only emotion which is quite disinterested. Among strangers he had grown as best as he could, but he had seldom been used with patience or forbearance. He prided himself on his self-control. It had been whipped into him by the mockery of his fellows. Then they called him cynical and callous. He had acquired calmness of demeanor, and under most circumstances an unruffled exterior, so that now he could not show his feelings. People told him he was unemotional, but he knew that he was at the mercy of his emotions. An accidental kindness touched him so much that sometimes he did not venture to speak in order not to betray the unsteadiness of his voice. He remembered the bitterness of his life at school, the humiliation which he had endured, the banter which had made him morbidly afraid of making himself ridiculous, and he remembered the loneliness he had felt since, faced with the world, the disillusion and the disappointment caused by the difference between what it promised to his active imagination and what it gave. But notwithstanding he was able to look at himself from the outside and smile with amusement. "'By Jove! If I weren't flippant I should hang myself,' he thought cheerfully. His mind went back to the answer he had given his uncle when he asked him what he had learnt in Paris. He had learnt a good deal more than he told him. A conversation with Cronshaw had stuck in his memory, and one phrase he had used, a commonplace one enough, had set his brain working. "'My dear fellow,' Cronshaw said, "'there's no such thing as abstract morality.' When Philip ceased to believe in Christianity he felt that a great weight was taken from his shoulders. Casting off the responsibility which weighed down every action, when every action was infinitely important for the welfare of his immortal soul, he experienced a vivid sense of liberty. But he knew now that this was an illusion. When he put away the religion in which he had been brought up, he had kept unimpaired the morality which was part and parcel of it. He made up his mind, therefore, to think things out for himself. He determined to be swayed by no prejudices. He swept away the virtues and the vices, the established laws of good and evil, with the idea of finding out the rules of life for himself. He did not know whether rules were necessary at all. That was one of the things he wanted to discover. Clearly much that seemed valid seemed so only because he had been taught it 
from his earliest youth. He had read a number of books, but they did not help him much, for they were based on the morality of Christianity, and even the writers who emphasized the fact that they did not believe in it were never satisfied till they had framed a system of ethics in accordance with that of the Sermon on the Mount. It seemed hardly worth while to read a long volume in order to learn that you ought to behave exactly like everybody else. Philip wanted to find out how he ought to behave, and he thought he could prevent himself from being influenced by the opinions that surrounded him. But meanwhile he had to go on living, and until he formed a theory of conduct he made himself a provisional rule. Follow your inclinations with due regard to the policeman round the corner. He thought the best thing he had gained in Paris was a complete liberty of spirit, and he felt himself at last absolutely free. In a desultory way he had read a good deal of philosophy, and he looked forward with delight to the leisure of the next few months. He began to read at haphazard. He entered upon each system with a little thrill of excitement, expecting to find in each some guide by which he could rule his conduct. He felt himself like a traveller in unknown countries and as he pushed forward the enterprise fascinated him. He read emotionally, as other men read pure literature, and his heart leaped as he discovered in noble words what himself had obscurely felt. His mind was concrete and moved with difficulty in regions of the abstract, but even when he could not follow the reasoning it gave him a curious pleasure to follow the tortuosities of thoughts that threaded their nimble way on the edge of the incomprehensible. Sometimes great philosophers seemed to have nothing to say to him, but at others he recognized a mind with which he felt himself at home. He was like the explorer in Central Africa who comes suddenly upon wide uplands, with great trees in them and stretches of meadow, so that he might fancy himself in an English park. He delighted in the robust common sense of Thomas Hobbes. Spinoza filled him with awe he had never before come in contact with a mind so noble, so unapproachable and austere. It reminded him of that statue by Rodin, L'Age de Han, which he passionately admired. And then there was Hume. The skepticism of that charming philosopher touched a kindred note in Philip, and, reveling in the lucid style which seemed able to put complicated thought into simple words, musical and measured, he read as he might have read a novel a smile of pleasure on his lips. But in none could he find exactly what he wanted. He had read somewhere that every man was born a Platonist, an Aristotelian, a Stoic, or an Epicurean, and the history of George Henry Lewes, besides telling you that philosophy was all moonshine, was there to show that the thought of each philosopher was inseparably connected with the man he was. When you knew that you could guess, to a great extent, the philosophy he wrote. It looked as though you did not act in a certain way because you thought in a certain way, but rather that you thought in a certain way because you were made in a certain way. Truth had nothing to do with it. There was no such thing as truth. Each man was his own philosopher, and the elaborate systems which the great men of the past had composed were only valid for the writers. The thing then was to discover what one was and one system of philosophy would devise itself. It seemed to Philip that there were three things to find out. Man's relation to the world he lives in, man's relation with the men among whom he lives, and finally man's relation to himself. He made an elaborate plan of study. The advantage of living abroad is that, coming in contact with the manners and customs of the people among whom you live, you observe them from the outside and see that they have not the necessity which those who practice them believe. You cannot fail to discover that the beliefs which to you are self-evident to the foreigner are absurd. The year in Germany, the long stay in Paris, had prepared Philip to receive the skeptical teaching which came to him now with such a feeling of relief. He saw that nothing was good and nothing was evil. Things were merely adapted to an end. He read The Origin of Species. It seemed to offer an explanation of much that troubled him. He was like an explorer now who has reasoned that certain natural features must be present themselves, and, beating up a broad river, finds here the tributary that he expected, there the fertile populated plains, and further on 
the mountains. When some great discovery is made the world is surprised afterwards that it was not accepted at once, and even on those who acknowledge its truth the effect is unimportant. The first readers of The Origin of Species accepted it with their reason, but their emotions, which are the ground of conduct, were untouched. Philip was born a generation after this great book was published, and much that horrified its contemporaries had passed into the feeling of the time, so that he was able to accept it with a joyful heart. He was intensely moved by the grandeur of the struggle for life, and the ethical rule which it suggested seemed to fit in with his predispositions. He said to himself that might was right. Society stood on one side, an organism with its own laws of growth and self-preservation, while the individual stood on the other. The actions which were to the advantage of society it termed virtuous, and those which were not it called vicious. Good and evil meant nothing more than that. Sin was a prejudice from which the free man should rid himself. Society had three arms in its contest with the individual, laws, public opinion, and conscience. The first two could be met by guile. Guile is the only weapon of the weak against the strong. Common opinion put the matter well when it stated that sin consisted in being found out. But conscience was the traitor within the gates. It fought in each heart the battle of society, and caused the individual to throw himself a wanton sacrifice to the prosperity of his enemy, for it was clear that the two were irreconcilable, the state and the individual conscience of himself. That uses the individual for its own ends, trampling upon him if he thwarts it, rewarding him with medals, pensions, honors, when he serves it faithfully. This, strong only in his independence, threads his way through the state, for convenience sake, paying in money or service for certain benefits, but with no sense of obligation and, indifferent to the rewards, asks only to be left alone. He is the independent traveller who uses Cook's tickets because they save trouble, but looks with good-humoured contempt on the personally conducted parties. The free man can do no wrong. He does everything he likes, if he can. His power is the only measure of his morality. He recognises the laws of the state, and he can break them without sense of sin, but if he is punished he accepts the punishment without rancor. Society has the power. But if for the individual there was no right or wrong, then it seemed to Philip that conscience lost its power. It was with a cry of triumph that he seized the knave and flung him from his breast, but he was no nearer to the meaning of life than he had been before. Why the world was there and what men had come into existence for at all was as inexplicable as ever. Surely there must be some reason. He thought of Cronshaw's parable of the Persian carpet. He offered it as a solution of the riddle, and mysteriously he stated that it was no answer at all unless you found it out for yourself. I wonder what the devil he meant, Philip smiled. And so on the last day of September, eager to put into practice all these new theories of life, Philip, with sixteen hundred pounds and his club foot, set out for a second time to London to make his third start in life. Chapter 54 The examination Philip had passed before he was articled to a chartered accountant was sufficient qualification for him to enter a medical school. He chose St. Luke's because his father had been a student there, and before the end of the summer session had gone up to London for a day in order to see the secretary. He got a list of rooms from him, and took lodgings in a dingy house which had the advantage of being within two minutes' walk of the hospital. "'You'll have to arrange about a part to dissect,' the secretary told him. "'You'd better start on a leg. They generally do. They seem to think it easier.' Philip found that his first lecture was in anatomy at eleven, and about half-past ten he limped across the road and a little nervously made his way to the medical school. Just inside the door a number of notices were pinned up, lists of lectures, football fixtures, and the like, and these he looked at idly, trying to seem at his ease. Young men and boys dribbled in and looked for letters in the rack, chatted with one another, and passed downstairs to the basement in which was the student's reading room. Philip saw several fellows with a desultory, timid look dawdling around and surmised that, like himself, they were there for the first time. 
When he had exhausted the notices he saw a glass door which led into what was apparently a museum, and having still twenty minutes to spare he walked in. It was a collection of pathological specimens. Presently a boy of about eighteen came up to him. "'I say, are you first year?' he said. "'Yes,' answered Philip. "'Where's the lecture-room, do you know? It's getting on for eleven. We'd better try to find it. They walked out of the museum into a long dark corridor with the walls painted in two shades of red, and other youths walking along suggested the way to them. They came to a door marked Anatomy Theatre. Philip found that there were a good many people already there. The seats were arranged in tiers, and just as Philip entered an attendant came in, put a glass of water on the table in the well of the lecture-room, and then brought in a pelvis and two thigh-bones, right and left. More men entered and took their seats, and by eleven the theatre was fairly full. There were about sixty students. For the most part they were a good deal younger than Philip, smooth-faced boys of eighteen, but there were a few who were older than he. He noticed one tall man with a fierce red moustache, who might have been thirty, another little fellow with black hair only a year or two younger, and then there was one man with spectacles and a beard which was quite grey. The lecturer came in, Mr. Cameron, a handsome man with white hair and clean-cut features. He called out the long list of names. Then he made a little speech. He spoke in a pleasant voice with well-chosen words, and he seemed to take a discreet pleasure in their careful arrangement. He suggested one or two books which they might buy and advised the purchase of a skeleton. He spoke of anatomy with enthusiasm. It was essential to the study of surgery a knowledge of it added to the appreciation of art. Philip pricked up his ears. He heard later that Mr. Cameron lectured also to the students at the Royal Academy. He had lived many years in Japan with a post at the University of Tokyo, and he flattered himself on his appreciation of the beautiful. "'You will have to learn many tedious things,' he finished with an indulgent smile, "'which you will forget the moment you have passed your final examination.' but in anatomy it is better to have learned and lost than never to have learned at all. He took up the pelvis which was lying on the table and began to describe it. He spoke well and clearly. At the end of the lecture the boy who had spoken to Philip in the pathological museum and sat next to him in the theatre suggested that they should go to the dissecting room. Philip and he walked along the corridor again, and an attendant told them where it was. As soon as they entered Philip understood what the acrid smell was which he had noticed in the passage. He lit a pipe. The attendant gave a short laugh. "'You'll soon get used to the smell. I don't notice it myself.' He asked Philip's name and looked at a list on the board. "'You've got a leg, number four. Philip saw that another name was bracketed with his own. "'What's the meaning of that?' he asked. "'We're very short of bodies just now. We've had to put two on each part.' The dissecting room was a large apartment painted like the corridors, the upper part a rich salmon, and the dado a dark terracotta. At regular intervals down the long sides of the room, at right angles with the wall, were iron slabs, grooved like meat dishes, and on each lay a body. Most of them were men. They were very dark from the preservative in which they had been kept, and the skin had almost the look of leather. They were extremely emaciated. The attendant took Philip up to one of the slabs. A youth was standing by it. "'Is your name Carrie?' he asked. "'Yes.' "'Oh, then we've got this leg together. It's lucky it's a man, isn't it?' "'Why?' asked Philip. "'They generally always like a male better,' said the attendant. "'A female's liable to have a lot of fat about her.' Philip looked at the body. The arms and legs were so thin that there was no shape in them, and the ribs stood out so that the skin over them was tense. A man of about forty-five with a thin gray beard and on his skull scanty colorless hair. The eyes were closed and the lower jaw sunken. Philip could not feel that this had ever been a man, and yet in the row of them there was something terrible and ghastly. I thought I'd start it too, said the young man who was dissecting with Philip. All right, I'll be here then. He had bought the day before the case of instruments which was needful, and now he was given a locker. He looked at the boy who had accompanied him into the dissecting room and saw that he was white. "'Make you feel rotten?' Philip asked him. "'I've never seen anyone dead before.' 
They walked along the corridor till they came to the entrance of the school. Philip remembered Fanny Price. She was the first dead person he had ever seen, and he remembered how strangely it had affected him. There was an immeasurable distance between the quick and the dead. They did not seem to belong to the same species, and it was strange to think that but a little while before they had spoken and moved and eaten and laughed. There was something horrible about the dead, and you could imagine that they might cast an evil influence on the living. "'What do you say to having something to eat?' said his new friend to Philip. They went down into the basement, where there was a dark room fitted up as a restaurant, and here the students were able to get the same sort of fare as they might have at an air raid at bread shop. While they ate, Philip had a scone and butter and a cup of chocolate, he discovered that his companion was called Dunsford. He was a fresh complexioned lad, with pleasant blue eyes and curly dark hair, large-limbed, slow of speech and movement. He had just come from Clifton. "'Are you taking the conjoint?' he asked Philip. "'Yes, I want to get qualified as soon as I can. I'm taking it too, but I shall take the FRCS afterwards. I'm going in for surgery.' Most of the students took the curriculum of the conjoint board of the College of Surgeons and the College of Physicians, but the more ambitious, or the more industrious, added to this the longer studies which led to a degree from the University of London. When Philip went to St. Luke's, changes had recently been made in the regulations, and the course took five years instead of four as it had done for those who registered before the autumn of 1892. Dunsford was well up in his plans and told Philip the usual course of events. The first conjoint examination consisted of biology, anatomy, and chemistry, but it could be taken in sections, and most fellows took their biology three months after entering the school. This science had been recently added to the list of subjects upon which the student was obliged to inform himself, but the amount of knowledge required was very small. When Philip went back to the dissecting room, he was a few minutes late since he had forgotten to buy the loose sleeves which they wore to protect their shirts, and he found a number of men already working. His partner had started on the minute and was busy dissecting out cutaneous nerves. Two others were engaged on the second leg, and more were occupied with the arms. "'You don't mind my having started?' "'That's all right. Fire away,' said Philip. He took the book, opened at a diagram of the dissected part, and looked at what they had to find. "'You're rather a dab at this,' said Philip. "'Oh, I've done a good deal of dissecting before. Animals, you know, for the pre -sci. There was a certain amount of conversation over the dissecting table, partly about the work, partly about the prospects of the football season, the demonstrators, and the lectures. Philip felt himself a great deal older than the others. They were raw schoolboys, but age is a matter of knowledge rather than of years and Newsome, the active young man who was dissecting with him, was very much at home with his subject. He was perhaps not sorry to show off, and he explained very fully to Philip what he was about. Philip, notwithstanding his hidden stores of wisdom, listened meekly. Then Philip took up the scalpel and the tweezers, and began working while the other looked on. "'Ripping to have him so thin,' said Newsome, wiping his hands. "'The blighter can't have had anything to eat for a month.' "'I wonder what he died of,' murmured Philip. "'Oh, I don't know, any old thing. Starvation chiefly, I suppose. I say, look out, don't cut that artery. It's all very fine to say don't cut that artery,' remarked one of the men working on the opposite leg. "'Silly old fool's got an artery in the wrong place.' "'Arteries are always in the wrong place,' said Newsome. "'The normal's the one thing you practically never get. That's why it's called the normal.' "'Don't say things like that,' said Philip, "'or I shall cut myself.' If you cut yourself, answered Newsome, full of information, wash it at once with antiseptic. It's the one thing you've got to be careful about. There was a chap here last year who gave himself only a prick, and he didn't bother about it, and he got septicemia. Did he get all right? Oh, no, he died in a week. I went and had a look at him in the P.M. room. Philip's back ached by the time it was proper to have tea, and his luncheon had been so light that he was quite ready for it. His hand smelt of that peculiar odor which he had first noticed that morning in the corridor. He thought his muffin tasted of it, too. "'Oh, you'll get used to that,' said Newsom. "'When you don't have the good old dissecting-room stink about, you feel quite lonely.' "'I'm not going to let it spoil my appetite,' said Philip, as he followed up the muffin, 
with a piece of cake. End of chapter 54 Chapter 55 Philip's ideas of the life of medical students, like those of the public at large, were founded on the pictures which Charles Dickens drew in the middle of the nineteenth century. He soon discovered that Bob Sawyer, if he ever existed, was no longer at all like the medical student of the present. It is a mixed lot which enters upon the medical profession, and naturally there are some who are lazy and reckless. They think it is an easy life, idle away a couple of years, and then because their funds come to an end, or because angry parents refuse any longer to support them, drift away from the hospital. Others find the examinations too hard for them. One failure after another robs them of their nerve. And panic-stricken, they forget as soon as they come into the forbidding buildings of the conjoint board the knowledge which before they had so pat. They remain year after year, objects of good-humored scorn to the younger men. Some of them crawl through the examination of the apothecary's hall. Others become non-qualified assistants, a precarious position in which they are at the mercy of their employers. Their lot is poverty, drunkenness, and heaven only knows their end. But for the most part medical students are industrious young men of the middle class, with a sufficient allowance to live in the respectable fashion they have been used to. Many are the sons of doctors who have already something of the professional manner. Their career is mapped out. As soon as they are qualified, they propose to apply for a hospital appointment, after holding which, and perhaps a trip to the Far East as a ship's doctor, they will join their father and spend the rest of their days in a country practice. One or two are marked out as exceptionally brilliant. They will take the various prizes and scholarships which are open each year to the deserving, get one appointment after another at the hospital, go on the staff, take a consulting room in Harley Street, and, specializing in one subject or another, become prosperous, eminent, and titled. The medical profession is the only one which a man may enter at any age with some chance of making a living. Among the men of Philip's year were three or four who were past their first youth. One had been in the Navy, from which, according to report, he had been dismissed for drunkenness. He was a man of thirty with a red face, a brusque manner, and a loud voice. Another was a married man with two children who had lost money through a defaulting solicitor. He had a bowed look as if the world were too much for him. He went about his work silently, and it was plain that he found it difficult at his age to commit facts to memory. His mind worked slowly. His effort at application was painful to see. Philip made himself at home in his tiny room. He arranged his books and hung on the walls such pictures and sketches as he possessed. Above him on the drawing-room floor lived a fifth-year man called Griffiths. But Philip saw little of him, partly because he was occupied chiefly in the wards, and partly because he had been to Oxford. Some of the students, as had been to a university, kept a good deal together. They used a variety of means natural to the young in order to impress upon the less fortunate a proper sense of their inferiority. The rest of the students found their Olympian serenity rather hard to bear. Griffiths was a tall fellow, with a quantity of curly red hair and blue eyes, a white skin, and a very red mouth. He was one of those fortunate people whom everybody liked, for he had high spirits and a constant gaiety. He strummed a little on the piano and sang comic songs with gusto, and evening after evening, while Philip was reading in his solitary room, he heard the shouts and the uproarious laughter of Griffiths' friends above him. He thought of those delightful evenings in Paris when they would sit in the studio, Lawson and he, Flanagan and Clutton, and talk of art and morals, the love affairs of the present, and the fame of the future. He felt sick at heart. He found it was easy to make a heroic gesture, but hard to abide by its results. The worst of it was that the work seemed to him very tedious. He had got out of the habit of being asked questions by demonstrators. His attention wandered at lectures. Anatomy was a dreary science, a mere matter of learning by heart an enormous number of facts. Dissection bored him. He did not see the use of dissecting out laboriously nerves and arteries when with much less trouble you could see in the diagrams of a book or in the specimens of the pathological museum exactly where they were. 
He made friends by chance, but not intimate friends, for he seemed to have nothing in particular to say to his companions. When he tried to interest himself in their concerns he felt that they found him patronizing. He was not one of those who can talk of what moves them without caring whether it bores or not the people they talk to. One man, hearing that he had studied art in Paris and fancying himself on his taste, tried to discuss art with him. But Philip was impatient of views which did not agree with his own, and finding quickly that the other's ideas were conventional grew monosyllabic. Philip desired popularity, but could bring himself to make no advances to others. A fear of rebuff prevented him from affability, and he concealed his shyness, which was still intense, under a frigid taciturnity. He was going through the same experience as he had done at school, but here the freedom of the medical student's life made it possible for him to live a good deal by himself. It was through no effort of his that he became friendly with Dunsford, the fresh-complexioned heavy lad whose acquaintances he had made at the beginning of the session. Dunsford attached himself to Philip merely because he was the first person he had known at St. Luke's. He had no friends in London, and on Saturday nights he and Philip got into the habit of going together to the pit of a music hall or the gallery of a theatre. He was stupid, but he was good-natured and never took offence. He always said the obvious thing, but when Philip laughed at him merely smiled. He had a very sweet smile. Though Philip made him his butt, he liked him. He was amused by his candor and delighted with his agreeable nature. Dunsford had the charm which himself was acutely conscious of not possessing. They often went to have tea at a shop in Parliament Street, because Dunsford admired one of the young women who waited. Philip did not find anything attractive in her. She was tall and thin with narrow hips and the chest of a boy. "'No one would look at her in Paris,' said Philip scornfully. "'She's got a ripping face,' said Dunsford. "'What does the face matter?' She had the small, regular features, the blue eyes, and the broad low brow which the Victorian painters Lord Leighton, Alma Tadema, and a hundred others induced the world they lived in to accept as a type of Greek beauty. She seemed to have a great deal of hair. It was arranged with peculiar elaboration and done over the forehead in what she called an Alexandra fringe. She was very anemic. Her thin lips were pale and her skin was delicate, of a faint green color, without a touch of red even in the cheeks. She had very good teeth. She took great pains to prevent her work from spoiling her hands, and they were small, thin, and white. She went about her duties with a bored look. Dunsford, very shy with women, had never succeeded in getting into conversation with her, and he urged Philip to help him. "'All I want is a lead,' he said, and then I can manage for myself. Philip, to please him, made one or two remarks, but she answered with monosyllables she had taken their measure. They were boys, and she surmised they were students. She had no use for them. Dunsford noticed that a man with sandy hair and a bristly moustache who looked like a German was favored with her attention whenever he came into the shop, and then it was only by calling her two or three times that they could induce her to take their order. She used the clients whom she did not know with frigid insolence, and when she was talking to a friend was perfectly indifferent to the calls of the hurry. She had the art of treating women who desired refreshment with just that degree of impertinence which irritated them without affording them an opportunity of complaining to the management. One day Dunsford told him her name was Mildred. He had heard one of the other girls in the shop address her. "'What an odious name,' said Philip. "'Why?' asked Dunsford. "'I like it. It's so pretentious.' It chanced that on this day the German was not there, and when she brought the tea Philip, smiling, remarked, "'Your friend's not here today.' "'I don't know what you mean,' she said coldly. "'I was referring to the nobleman with the sandy moustache. Has he left you for another?' "'Some people would do better to mind their own business,' she retorted. She left them, and since for a moment or two there was no one to attend to, sat down and looked at the evening paper which a customer had left behind. "'You are a fool to put her back up,' said Dunsford. "'I'm really quite indifferent to the attitude of her vertebrae,' replied Philip. But he was piqued. It irritated him that when he tried to be agreeable with a woman she should take offence. When he asked for the bill he hazarded a remark which he meant to lead further. 
"'Are we no longer on speaking terms?' he smiled. "'I'm here to take orders and to wait on customers. I've got nothing to say to them, and I don't want them to say anything to me.' She put down the slip of paper on which she had marked the sum they had to pay, and walked back to the table at which she had been sitting. Philip flushed with anger. "'That's one in the eye for you, Carrie,' said Dunsford when they got outside. "'Ill-mannered slut,' said Philip. "'I shan't go there again.' His influence with Dunsford was strong enough to get him to take their tea elsewhere, and Dunsford soon found another young woman to flirt with. But the snub which the waitress had inflicted on him rankled. If she had treated him with civility he would have been perfectly indifferent to her. But it was obvious that she disliked him rather than otherwise, and his pride was wounded. He could not suppress a desire to be even with her. He was impatient with himself because he had so petty a feeling, but three or days firmness during which he would not go to the shop did not help him to surmount it, and he came to the conclusion that it would be least trouble to see her. Having done so he would certainly cease to think of her. Pretexting an appointment one afternoon, for he was not a little ashamed of his weakness, he left Dunsford and went straight to the shop which he had vowed never again to enter. He saw the waitress the moment he came in and sat down at one of her tables. He expected her to make some reference to the fact that he had not been there for a week, but when she came up for his order she said nothing. He had heard her say to other customers, "'You're quite a stranger.' She gave no sign that she had ever seen him before. In order to see whether she had really forgotten him, when she brought his tea he asked, "'Have you seen my friend tonight? No, he's not been in here for some days.' He wanted to use this as the beginning of a conversation, but he was strangely nervous and could think of nothing to say. She gave him no opportunity, but at once went away. He had no chance of saying anything till he asked for his bill. "'Filthy weather, isn't it?' he said. It was mortifying that he had been forced to prepare such a phrase as that. He could not make out why she filled him with such embarrassment. It doesn't make much difference to me what the weather is, having to be in here all day. There was an insolence in her tone that peculiarly irritated him. A sarcasm rose to his lips, but he forced himself to be silent. I wish to God she'd say something really cheeky, he raged to himself, so that I could report her and get her sacked. It would serve her damned well right. End of chapter 55 Chapter 56 He could not get her out of his mind. He laughed angrily at his own foolishness. It was absurd to care what an anemic little waitress said to him. But he was strangely humiliated. Though no one knew of the humiliation but Dunsford, and he had certainly forgotten, Philip felt that he could have no peace till he had wiped it out. He thought over what he had better do. He made up his mind that he would go to the shop every day. It was obvious that he had made a disagreeable impression on her, but he thought he had the wits to eradicate it. He would take care not to say anything at which the most susceptible person could be offended. All this he did, but it had no effect. When he went in and said good evening she answered with the same words, but when once he omitted to say it in order to see whether she would say it first, she said nothing at all. He murmured in his heart an expression which, though frequently applicable to members of the female sex, is not often used of them in polite society. But with an unmoved face he ordered his tea. He made up his mind not to speak a word, and left the shop without his usual good night. He promised himself that he would not go any more, but the next day at tea-time he grew restless. He tried to think of other things, but he had no command over his thoughts. At last he said desperately, "'After all, there's no reason why I shouldn't go if I want to.' The struggle with himself had taken a long time, and it was getting on for seven when he entered the shop. "'I thought you weren't coming,' the girl said to him when he sat down. His heart leaped in his bosom and he felt himself reddening. "'I was detained. I couldn't come before. Cutting up people, I suppose.' not so bad as that. You are a student, aren't you? Yes. But that seemed to satisfy her curiosity. She went away, and, since at that late hour there was nobody else at her tables, she immersed herself in a novelette. This was before the time of the sixpenny reprints. There was a regular supply of inexpensive fiction written to order by poor hacks for the consumption of the illiterate. Philip was elated. She had addressed him of her own accord. 
he saw the time approaching when his turn would come and he would tell her exactly what he thought of her it would be a great comfort to express the immensity of his contempt he looked at her it was true that her profile was beautiful it was extraordinary how english girls of that class had so often a perfection of outline which took your breath away but it was as cold as marble and the faint green of her delicate skin gave an impression of unhealthiness all the waitresses were dressed alike in plain black dresses with a white apron cuffs and a small cap on a half sheet of paper that he had in his pocket philip made a sketch of her as he sat leaning over her book she outlined the words with her lips as she read and left it on the table when he went away it was an inspiration for next day when he came in she smiled at him i didn't know you could draw she said i was an art student in paris for two years i showed that drawing you'd left behind last night to the manageress and she was struck with it was it meant to be me it was said philip when she went for his tea one of the other girls came up to him i saw that picture you done of miss rogers it was the very image of her she said that was the first time he had heard her name and when he wanted his bill he called her by it i see you know my name she said when she came your friend mentioned it when she said something to me about that drawing she wants you to do one of her don't you do it if you once begin you'll have to go on and they'll all be wanting you to do them then without a pause with peculiar inconsequence she said where's that young fellow that used to come with you has he gone away fancying you remembering him said philip he was a nice-looking young fellow philip felt quite a peculiar sensation in his heart he did not know what it was dunsford had jolly curling hair a fresh complexion and a beautiful smile philip thought of these advantages with envy oh he's in love said he with a little laugh philip repeated every word of the conversation to himself as he limped home she was quite friendly with him now when opportunity arose he would offer to make a more finished sketch of her he was sure she would like that her face was interesting the profile was lovely and there was something curiously fascinating about the chloratic color he tried to think what it was like at first he thought of pea soup but driving away that idea angrily he thought of the petals of a yellow rosebud when you tore it to pieces before it had burst he had no ill feeling towards her now she's not a bad sort he murmured it was silly of him to take offence at what she had said it was doubtless his own fault she had not meant to make herself disagreeable he ought to be accustomed by now to making at first sight a bad impression on people he was flattered at the success of his drawing she looked upon him with more interest now that she was aware of this small talent he was restless next day he thought of going to lunch at the tea-shop but he was certain there would be many people there then and mildred would not be able to talk to him he had managed before this to get out of having tea with dunsford and punctually at half-past four he had looked at his watch a dozen times he went into the shop mildred had her back turned to him she was sitting down talking to the german whom philip had seen there every day till a fortnight ago and since then had not seen at all she was laughing at what he said philip thought she had a common laugh and it made him shudder he called her but she took no notice he called her again then growing angry for he was impatient he rapped the table loudly with a stick she approached sulkily how do you do he said you seem to be in a great hurry she looked down at him with the insolent manner which he knew so well i say what's the matter with you if you'll kindly give me your order i'll get what you want i can't stand talking all night tea and toasted bun please philip answered briefly he was furious with her he had the star with him and read it elaborately when she brought the tea if you'll give me my bill now i needn't trouble you again he said icily she wrote out the slip placed it on the table and went back to the german soon she was talking to him with animation he was a man of middle height with the round head of his nation and a sallow face his moustache was large and bristling he had on a tail-coat and grey trousers and he wore a massive gold watch-chain philip thought the other girls looked from him to the pair at the table and exchanged significant glances he felt certain they were laughing at him and his blood boiled he detested mildred now with all his heart he knew that the best thing he could do was to cease coming to the tea-shop 
but he could not bear to think that he had been worsted in the affair, and he devised a plan to show her that he despised her. Next day he sat down at another table and ordered his tea from another waitress. Mildred's friend was there again, and she was talking to him. She paid no attention to Philip, and so when he went out he chose a moment when she had to cross his path. As he passed he looked at her as though he had never seen her before. He repeated this for three or four days. He expected that presently she would take the opportunity to say something to him. He thought she would ask why he never came to one of her tables now, and he had prepared an answer charged with all the loathing he felt for her. He knew it was absurd to trouble, but he could not help himself. She had beaten him again. The German suddenly disappeared, but Philip still sat at other tables. She paid no attention to him. Suddenly he realized that what he did was a matter of complete indifference to her. He could go on in that way till doomsday, and it would have no effect. "'I'm not finished yet,' he said to himself. The day after he sat down in his old seat, and when she came up said good evening as though he had not ignored her for a week. His face was placid, but he could not prevent the mad beating of his heart. At that time the musical comedy had lately leaped into public favor, and he was sure that Mildred would be delighted to go to one. "'I say,' he said suddenly, "'I wonder if you'd dine with me one night and come to the Belle of New York. I'll get a couple of stalls.' He added the last sentence in order to tempt her. He knew that when the girls went to the play it was either in the pit, or, if some man took them, seldom to more expensive seats than the upper circle. Mildred's pale face showed no change of expression. "'I don't mind,' she said. "'When will you come? I get off early on Thursdays.' They made arrangements. Mildred lived with an aunt at Hearn Hill. The play began at eight, so they must dine at seven. She proposed that he should meet her in the second-class waiting-room at Victoria Station. She showed no pleasure, but accepted the invitation as though she conferred a favor. Philip was vaguely irritated. End of chapter 56 Recording by Tom Weiss TomsAudiobooks.com Chapters 57 through 60 of Of Human Bondage this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 57 Philip arrived at Victoria Station nearly half an hour before the time which Mildred had appointed, and sat down in the second-class waiting-room. He waited, and she did not come. He began to grow anxious and walked into the station, watching the incoming suburban trains. The hour which she had fixed passed, and still there was no sign of her. Philip was impatient. He went into the other waiting-rooms and looked at the people sitting in them. Suddenly his heart gave a great thud. "'There you are. I thought you were never coming. I like that. After keeping me waiting all this time, I had half a mind to go back home again.' but you said you'd come to the second-class waiting-room. I didn't say any such thing. It isn't exactly like I'd sit in the second-class room when I could sit in the first, is it? Though Philip was sure he had not made a mistake, he said nothing, and they got into a cab. "'Where are we dining?' she asked. "'I thought of the Adelphi restaurant. Will that suit you?' "'I don't mind where we dine.' She spoke ungraciously. She was put out by being kept waiting and answered Philip's attempt at conversation with monosyllables. She wore a long cloak of some rough, dark material and a crochet shawl over her head. They reached the restaurant and sat down at a table. She looked round with satisfaction. The red shades to the candles on the tables, the gold of the decorations, the looking-glasses lent the room a sumptuous air. "'I've never been here before.' She gave Philip a smile. She had taken off her cloak, and he saw that she wore a pale blue dress cut square at the neck, and her hair was more elaborately arranged than ever. He had ordered champagne, and when it came her eyes sparkled. "'You are going with it,' she said. "'Because I've ordered fizz?' he asked carelessly, as though he never drank anything else. "'I was surprised when you asked me to do a theatre with you. 
Conversation did not go very easily, for she did not seem to have much to say, and Philip was nervously conscious that he was not amusing her. She listened carelessly to his remarks, with her eyes on other diners, and made no pretense that she was interested in him. He made one or two little jokes, but she took them quite seriously. The only sign of vivacity he got was when he spoke of the other girls in the shop. She could not bear the manageress and told him all her misdeeds at length. I can't stick her at any price and all the air she gives herself. Sometimes I've got more than half a mind to tell her something she doesn't think I know anything about. What is that? asked Philip. Well, I happen to know that she's not above going to Eastbourne with a man for the weekend now and again. One of the girls has a married sister who goes there with her husband, and she's seen her. She was staying at the same boarding house, and she had a wedding ring on, and I know, for one, she's not married. Philip filled her glass, hoping that champagne would make her more affable. He was anxious that his little jaunt should be a success. He noticed that she held her knife as though it were a penholder, and when she drank protruded her little finger. He started several topics of conversation, but he could get little out of her, and he remembered with irritation that he had seen her talking nineteen to the dozen and laughing with the German. They finished dinner and went to the play. Philip was a very cultured young man, and he looked upon musical comedy with scorn. He thought the jokes vulgar and the melodies obvious. It seemed to him that they did these things much better in France. But Mildred enjoyed herself thoroughly. She laughed till her sides ached, looking at Philip now and then when something tickled her to exchange a glance of pleasure, and she applauded rapturously. "'This is the seventh time I've been,' she said after the first act, "'and I don't mind if I come seven times more.' She was much interested in the women who surrounded them in the stalls. She pointed out to Philip those who were painted and those who wore false hair. "'It is horrible, these West End people,' she said. I don't know how they can do it. She put her hand to her hair. Mine's all my own, every bit of it. She found no one to admire, and whenever she spoke of anyone it was to say something disagreeable. It made Philip uneasy. He supposed that next day she would tell the girls in the shop that he had taken her out and that he had bored her to death. He disliked her, and yet he knew not why he wanted to be with her. On the way home he asked, I hope you've enjoyed yourself? Rather. Will you come out with me again one evening? I don't mind. He could never get beyond such expressions as that. Her indifference maddened him. That sounds as if you didn't much care if you came or not. Oh, if you don't take me out, some other fellow will. I need never want for men who'll take me to the theater. Philip was silent. They came to the station, and he went to the booking office. I've got my season, she said. I thought I'd take you home as it's rather late, if you don't mind. Oh, I don't mind if it gives you any pleasure. He took a single first for her and a return for himself. Well, you're not mean, I will say that for you, she said when he opened the carriage door. Philip did not know whether he was pleased or sorry when other people entered, and it was impossible to speak. They got out at Hearn Hill, and he accompanied her to the corner of the road in which she lived. I'll say good-night to you here, she said, holding out her hand. You'd better not come up to the door. I know what people are, and I don't want to have anybody talking. She said good-night and walked quickly away. He could see the white shawl in the darkness. He thought she might turn round, but she did not. Philip saw which house she went into, and in a moment he walked along to look at it. It was a trim, common little house of yellow brick, exactly like all the other little houses in the street. He stood outside for a few minutes, and presently the window on the top floor was darkened. Philip strolled slowly back to the station. The evening had been unsatisfactory. He felt irritated, restless, and miserable. When he lay in bed he seemed still to see her sitting in the corner of the railway carriage with the white crochet shawl over her head. He did not know how he was to get through the hours that must pass before his eyes rested on her again. He thought drowsily of her thin face with its delicate features and the greenish pallor of her skin. He was not happy with her, but he was unhappy away from her. 
He wanted to sit by her side and look at her. He wanted to touch her. He wanted... The thought came to him, and he did not finish. Suddenly he grew wide awake. He wanted to kiss the thin, pale mouth with its narrow lips. The truth came to him at last. He was in love with her. It was incredible. He had often thought of falling in love, and there was one scene which he had pictured to himself over and over again. He saw himself coming into a ballroom. His eyes fell on a little group of men and women talking, and one of the women turned round. Her eyes fell upon him, and he knew that the gasp in his throat was in her throat, too. He stood quite still. She was tall and dark and beautiful with eyes like the night. She was dressed in white, and in her black hair shone diamonds. They stared at one another, forgetting that people surrounded them. He went straight up to her, and she moved a little towards him. Both felt that the formality of introduction was out of place. He spoke to her. "'I've been looking for you all my life,' he said. "'You've come at last,' she murmured. "'Will you dance with me?' She surrendered herself to his outstretched hands, and they danced. Philip always pretended that he was not lame. She danced divinely. "'I've never danced with anyone who danced like you,' she said. He tore up her program, and they danced together the whole evening. "'I'm so thankful that I waited for you,' he said to her. "'I knew that in the end I must meet you.' People in the ballroom stared. They did not care. They did not wish to hide their passion. At last they went into the garden. He flung a light cloak over her shoulders and put her in a waiting cab. They caught the midnight train to Paris, and they sped through the silent, starlit night into the unknown. He thought of this old fancy of his, and it seemed impossible that he should be in love with Mildred Rogers. Her name was grotesque. He did not think her pretty. He hated the thinness of her. Only that evening he had noticed how the bones of her chest stood out in evening dress. He went over her features one by one. He did not like her mouth, and the unhealthiness of her color vaguely repelled him. She was common. Her phrases, so bald and few, constantly repeated, showed the emptiness of her mind. He recalled her vulgar little laugh at the jokes of the musical comedy, and he remembered the little finger carefully extended when she held her glass to her mouth. Her manners, like her conversation, were obviously genteel. He remembered her insolence. Sometimes he had felt inclined to box her ears, and suddenly, he knew not why, perhaps it was the thought of hitting her or the recollection of her tiny, beautiful ears, he was seized by an uprush of emotion. He yearned for her. He thought of taking her in his arms, the thin, fragile body, and kissing her pale mouth. He wanted to pass his fingers down the slightly greenish cheeks. He wanted her. He had thought of love as a rapture which seized one so that all the world seemed spring-like. He had looked forward to an ecstatic happiness. But this was not happiness. It was a hunger of the soul. It was a painful yearning. It was a bitter anguish he had never known before. He tried to think when it had first come to him. He did not know. He only remembered that each time he had gone into the shop, after the first two or three times, it had been with a little feeling in the heart that was pain, and he remembered that when she spoke to him he felt curiously breathless. When she left him it was wretchedness, and when she came to him again it was despair. He stretched himself in his bed as a dog stretches himself. He wondered how he was going to endure that ceaseless aching of his soul. Chapter 58 Philip woke early next morning, and his first thought was of Mildred. It struck him that he might meet her at Victoria Station and walk with her to the shop. He shaved quickly, scrambled into his clothes, and took a bus to the station. He was there by twenty to eight and watched the incoming trains. Crowds poured out of them, clerks and shop people at that early hour, and thronged up the platform. They hurried along, sometimes in pairs, here and there a group of girls, but more often alone. They were white, most of them, ugly in the early morning, and they had an abstracted look. The younger ones walked lightly, as though the cement of the platform were pleasant to tread, but the others went as though impelled by a machine. Their faces were set in an anxious frown. 
At last Philip saw Mildred, and he went up to her eagerly. "'Good morning,' he said. "'I thought I'd come and see how you were after last night.' She wore an old brown ulster and a sailor hat. It was very clear that she was not pleased to see him. "'Oh, I'm all right. I haven't got much time to waste. Do you mind if I walk down Victoria Street with you?' "'I'm none too early. I shall have to walk fast,' she answered, looking down at Philip's club foot. He turned scarlet. "'I beg your pardon. I won't detain you. You can please yourself.' She went on, and he, with a sinking heart, made his way home to breakfast. He hated her. He knew he was a fool to bother about her. She was not the sort of woman who would ever care two straws for him, and she must look upon his deformity with distaste. He made up his mind that he would not go in to tea that afternoon, but, hating himself, he went. She nodded to him as he came in and smiled. "'I expect I was rather short with you this morning,' she said. "'You see, I didn't expect you, and it came like a surprise.' "'Oh, it doesn't matter at all.' He felt that a great weight had suddenly been lifted from him. He was infinitely grateful for one word of kindness. "'Why don't you sit down?' he asked. "'Nobody's wanting you just now. I don't mind if I do.' He looked at her, but could think of nothing to say. He racked his brains anxiously, seeking for a remark which should keep her by him. He wanted to tell her how much she meant to him. But he did not know how to make love now that he loved in earnest. "'Where's your friend with the fair moustache? I haven't seen him lately. Oh, he's gone back to Birmingham. He's in business there. He only comes up to London every now and again. Is he in love with you? You'd better ask him, she said with a laugh. I don't know what it's got to do with you if he is. A bitter answer leaped to his tongue, but he was learning self-restraint. I wonder why you say things like that, was all he permitted himself to say. She looked at him with those indifferent eyes of hers. It looks as if you didn't set much store on me, he added. Why should I? No reason at all. He reached over for his paper. "'You are quick-tempered,' she said when she saw the gesture. "'You do take offense easily.' He smiled and looked at her appealingly. "'Will you do something for me?' he asked. "'That depends what it is. Let me walk back to the station with you tonight. I don't mind.' He went out after tea and went back to his rooms, but at eight o'clock, when the shop closed, he was waiting outside. "'You are a caution.' she said when she came out. I don't understand you. I shouldn't have thought it was very difficult, he answered bitterly. Did any of the girls see you waiting for me? I don't know, and I don't care. They all laugh at you, you know. They say you're spoony on me. Much you care, he muttered. Now then, quarrelsome. At the station he took a ticket and said he was going to accompany her home. You don't seem to have much to do with your time, she said. I suppose I can waste it in my own way. They seemed to be always on the verge of a quarrel. The fact was that he hated himself for loving her. She seemed to be constantly humiliating him, and for each snub that he endured he owed her a grudge. But she was in a friendly mood that evening and talkative. She told them that her parents were dead. She gave him to understand that she did not have to earn her living but work for amusement. My aunt doesn't like my going to business. I can have the best of everything at home. I don't want you to think I work because I need to. Philip knew that she was not speaking the truth. The gentility of her class made her use this pretense to avoid the stigma attached to earning her living. My family's very well connected, she said. Philip smiled faintly, and she noticed it. What are you laughing at? she said quickly. Don't you believe I'm telling you the truth? "'Of course I do,' he answered. She looked at him suspiciously, but in a moment could not resist the temptation to impress him with the splendor of her early days. "'My father always kept a dog-cart, and we had three servants. We had a cook and a housemaid and an odd man. We used to grow beautiful roses. People used to stop at the gate and ask who the house belonged to. The roses were so beautiful.' Of course it wasn't very nice for me having to mix with them girls in the shop. It's not the class of person I've been used to. And sometimes I really think I'll give up business on that account. It's not the work I mind, don't mind that, but it's the class of people I have to mix with. 
They were sitting opposite one another in the train, and Philip, listening sympathetically to what she said, was quite happy. He was amused at her naivete and slightly touched. There was a very faint color in her cheeks. He was thinking that it would be delightful to kiss the tip of her chin. The moment you came into the shop I saw you as a gentleman in every sense of the word. Was your father a professional man? He was a doctor. You can always tell a professional man. There's something about them. I don't know what it is, but I know it once. They walked along from the station together. I say, I want you to come and see another play with me, he said. I don't mind, she said. You might go so far as to say you'd like to. Why? It doesn't matter. Let's fix a day. Would Saturday night suit you? Yes, that'll do. They made further arrangements and then found themselves at the corner of the road in which she lived. She gave him her hand and he held it. I say, I do so awfully want to call you Mildred. You may if you like. I don't care. And you'll call me Philip, won't you? I will if I can think of it. It seems more natural to call you Mr. Carey. He drew her slightly towards him, but she leaned back. What are you doing? Won't you kiss me good night? he whispered. Impotence, she said. She snatched her hand away and hurried towards the house. Philip bought tickets for Saturday night. It was not one of the days on which she got off early, and therefore she would have no time to go home and change, but she meant to bring a frock up with her in the morning and hurry into her clothes at the shop. If the manageress was in a good temper she would let her go at seven. Philip had agreed to wait outside from a quarter past seven onwards. He looked forward to the occasion with painful eagerness, for in the cab on the way from the theatre to the station he thought she would let him kiss her. The vehicle gave every facility for a man to put his arm round a girl's waist, an advantage which the hansom had over the taxi of the present day, and the delight of that was worth the cost of the evening's entertainment. But on Saturday afternoon when he went in to have tea in order to confirm the arrangements he met the man with the fair moustache coming out of the shop. He knew by now that he was called Miller. He was a naturalized German who had anglicized his name and he had lived many years in England. Philip had heard him speak, and though his English was fluent and natural, it had not quite the intonation of the native. Philip knew that he was flirting with Mildred, and he was horribly jealous of him, but he took comfort in the coldness of her temperament which otherwise distressed him, and, thinking her incapable of passion, he looked upon his rival as no better off than himself. But his heart sank now for his first thought was that Miller's sudden appearance might interfere with the jaunt which he had so looked forward to. He entered sick with apprehension. The waitress came up to him, took his order for tea, and presently brought it. "'I'm awfully sorry,' she said with an expression on her face of real distress. "'I shan't be able to come to-night after all.' "'Why?' said Philip. "'Don't look so stern about it,' she laughed. "'It's not my fault. My aunt was taken ill last night.' and it's the girl's night out, so I must go and sit with her. She can't be left alone, can she? It doesn't matter. I'll see you home instead. But you've got the tickets. It would be a pity to waste them. He took them out of his pocket and deliberately tore them up. What are you doing that for? You don't suppose I want to go and see a rotten musical comedy by myself, do you? I only took seats there for your sake. You can't see me home if that's what you mean. You've made other arrangements. I don't know what you mean by that. You're just as selfish as all the rest of them. You only think of yourself. It's not my fault if my aunt's queer." She quickly wrote out his bill and left him. Philip knew very little about women, or he would have been aware that one should accept their most transparent lies. He made up his mind that he would watch the shop and see for certain whether Mildred went out with the German. He had an unhappy passion for certainty. At seven he stationed himself on the opposite pavement. He looked about for Miller, but did not see him. In ten minutes she came out. She had on the cloak and shawl which she had worn when he took her to the Shaftesbury Theatre. It was obvious that she was not going home. She saw him before he had time to move away, started a little, and then came straight up to him. "'What are you doing here?' she said. "'Taking the air,' he answered. "'You're spying on me, you dirty little cad. I thought you was a gentleman. 
"'Did you think a gentleman would be likely to take any interest in you?' he murmured. There was a devil within him which forced him to make matters worse. He wanted to hurt her as much as she was hurting him. "'I suppose I can change my mind if I like. I'm not obliged to come out with you. I tell you I'm going home and I won't be followed or spied upon. Have you seen Miller today? That's no business of yours. In point of fact I haven't, so you're wrong again. I saw him this afternoon. He'd just come out of the shop when I went in. Well, what if he did? I can go out with him if I want to, can't I? I don't know what you've got to say to it. He's keeping you waiting, isn't he? Well, I'd rather wait for him than have you wait for me. Put that in your pipe and smoke it and now perhaps you'll go off home and mind your own business in future. His mood changed suddenly from anger to despair, and his voice trembled when he spoke. I say, don't be beastly with me, Mildred. You know I'm awfully fond of you. I think I love you with all my heart. Won't you change your mind? I was looking forward to this evening so awfully. You see, he hasn't come, and he can't care twopence about you, really. Won't you dine with me? I'll get some more tickets, and we'll go anywhere you like. I tell you I won't. It's no good you talking. I've made up my mind, and when I make up my mind I keep to it." He looked at her for a moment. His heart was torn with anguish. People were hurrying past them on the pavement, and cabs and omnibuses rolled by noisily. He saw that Mildred's eyes were wandering. She was afraid of missing Miller in the crowd. "'I can't go on like this,' groaned Philip. It's too degrading. If I go now, I go for good. Unless you'll come with me tonight, you'll never see me again. You seem to think that'll be an awful thing for me. All I can say is, good riddance to bad rubbish. Then good-bye. He nodded and limped away slowly, for he had hoped with all his heart that she would call him back. At the next lamppost he stopped and looked over his shoulder. He thought she might beckon to him, he was willing to forget everything, he was ready for any humiliation. But she had turned away and apparently had ceased to trouble about him. He realized that she was glad to be quit of him. End of chapter 58 Chapter 59 Philip passed the evening wretchedly. He had told his landlady that he would not be in, so there was nothing for him to eat, and he had to go to Gotti's for dinner. Afterwards he went back to his rooms, but Griffiths on the floor above him was having a party, and the noisy merriment made his own misery more hard to bear. He went to a music hall, but it was Saturday night and there was standing room only. After half an hour of boredom his legs grew tired and he went home. He tried to read, but he could not fix his attention, and yet it was necessary that he should work hard. His examination in biology was in little more than a fortnight and though it was easy he had neglected his lectures of late and was conscious that he knew nothing. It was only a viva, however, and he felt sure that in a fortnight he could find out enough about the subject to scrape through. He had confidence in his intelligence. He threw aside his book and gave himself up to thinking deliberately of the matter which was in his mind all the time. He reproached himself bitterly for his behavior that evening. Why had he given her the alternative that she must dine with him, or else never see him again? Of course she refused. He should have allowed for her pride. He had burnt his ships behind him. It would not be so hard to bear if he thought that she was suffering now, but he knew her too well. She was perfectly indifferent to him. If he hadn't been a fool he would have pretended to believe her story. He ought to have had the strength to conceal his disappointment and the self-control to master his temper. He could not tell why he loved her. He had read of the idealization that takes place in love, but he saw her exactly as she was. She was not amusing or clever. Her mind was common. She had a vulgar shrewdness which revolted him. She had no gentleness nor softness. As she would have put it herself, she was on the make. What aroused her admiration was a clever trick played on an unsuspecting person. To do somebody always gave her satisfaction. Philip laughed savagely as he thought of her gentility and the refinement with which she ate her food. She could not bear a coarse word. So far as her limited vocabulary reached she had a passion for euphemisms. 
and she scented indecency everywhere. She never spoke of trousers, but referred to them as nether garments. She thought it slightly indelicate to blow her nose, and did so in a deprecating way. She was dreadfully anemic and suffered from the dyspepsia which accompanies that ailing. Philip was repelled by her flat breast and narrow hips, and he hated the vulgar way in which she did her hair. He loathed and despised himself for loving her. The fact remained that he was helpless. He felt just as he had felt sometimes in the hands of a bigger boy at school. He had struggled against the superior strength till his own strength was gone, and he was rendered quite powerless. He remembered the peculiar languor he had felt in his limbs, almost as though he were paralyzed, so that he could not help himself at all. He might have been dead. He felt just that same weakness now. He loved the woman so that he knew he had never loved before. He did not mind her faults of person or of character. He thought he loved them too. At all events they meant nothing to him. It did not seem himself that was concerned. He felt that he had been seized by some strange force that moved him against his will, contrary to his interests, and because he had a passion for freedom he hated the chains which bound him. He laughed at himself when he thought how often he had longed to experience the overwhelming passion. He cursed himself because he had given way to it. He thought of the beginnings. Nothing of all this would have happened if he had not gone into the shop with Dunsford. The whole thing was his own fault. Except for his ridiculous vanity he would never have troubled himself with the ill-mannered slut. At all events the occurrences of that evening had finished the whole affair. Unless he was lost to all sense of shame he could not go back. He wanted passionately to get rid of the love that obsessed him. It was degrading and hateful. He must prevent himself from thinking of her. In a little while the anguish he suffered must grow less. His mind went back to the past. He wondered whether Emily Wilkinson and Fanny Price had endured on his account anything like the torment that he suffered now. He felt a pang of remorse. I didn't know then what it was like, he said to himself. He slept very badly. The next day was Sunday and he worked at his biology. He sat with the book in front of him, forming the words with his lips in order to fix his attention, but he could remember nothing. He found his thoughts going back to Mildred every minute, and he repeated to himself the exact words of the quarrel they had had. He had to force himself back to his book. He went out for a walk. The streets on the south side of the river were dingy enough on weekdays, but there was an energy a coming and going which gave them a sordid vivacity. But on Sundays, with no shops open, no carts in the roadway, silent and depressed, they were indescribably dreary. Philip thought that day would never end. But he was so tired that he slept heavily, and when Monday came he entered life with determination. Christmas was approaching, and a good many of the students had gone into the country for the short holiday between the two parts of the winter session. But Philip had refused his uncle's invitation to go down the black stable. He had given the approaching examination as his excuse, but in point of fact he had been unwilling to leave London and Mildred. He had neglected his work so much that now he had only a fortnight to learn what the curriculum allowed three months for. He set to work seriously. He found it easier each day not to think of Mildred. He congratulated himself on his force of character. The pain he suffered was no longer anguish, but a sort of soreness, like what one might be expected to feel if one had been thrown off a horse and though no bones were broken, were bruised all over and shaken. Philip found that he was able to observe with curiosity the condition he had been in during the last few weeks. He analyzed his feelings with interest. He was a little amused at himself. One thing that struck him was how little under those circumstances it mattered what one thought. The system of personal philosophy, which had given him great satisfaction to devise, had not served him. He was puzzled by this. But sometimes in the street he would see a girl who looked so like Mildred that his heart seemed to stop beating. Then he could not help himself. He hurried on to catch up to her, eager and anxious, 
only to find that it was a total stranger. Men came back from the country, and he went with Dunsford to have tea at an ABC shop. The well-known uniform made him so miserable that he could not speak. The thought came to him that perhaps she had been transferred to another establishment of the firm for which she worked, and he might suddenly find himself face to face with her. The idea filled him with panic, so that he feared Dunsford would see that something was the matter with him. He could not think of anything to say. He pretended to listen to what Dunsford was talking about. The conversation maddened him, and it was all he could do to prevent himself from crying out to Dunsford for heaven's sake to hold his tongue. Then came the day of his examination. Philip, when his turn arrived, went forward to the examiner's table with the utmost confidence. He answered three or four questions. Then they showed him various specimens. He had been to very few lectures, and, as soon as he was asked about things which he could not learn from books, he was floored. He did what he could to hide his ignorance, the examiner did not insist, and soon his ten minutes were over. He felt certain he had passed, but next day, when he went up to the examination buildings to see the result posted on the door, he was astounded not to find his number among those who had satisfied the examiners. In amazement, he read the list three times. Dunsford was with him. "'I say, I'm awfully sorry you're ploughed,' he said. He had just inquired Philip's number. Philip turned and saw by his radiant face that Dunsford had passed. "'Oh, it doesn't matter a bit,' said Philip. "'I'm jolly glad you're all right. I shall go up again in July.' He was very anxious to pretend that he did not mind, and on their way back along the embankment insisted on talking of indifferent things. Dunsford good-naturedly wanted to discuss the causes of Philip's failure, but Philip was obstinately casual. He was horribly mortified, and the fact that Dunsford, whom he looked upon as a very pleasant but quite stupid fellow, had passed made his own rebuff harder to bear. He had always been proud of his intelligence, and now he asked himself desperately whether he was not mistaken in the opinion he held of himself. In the three months of the winter session, the students who had joined in October had already shaken down into groups, and it was clear which were brilliant, which were clever or industrious, and which were rotters. Philip was conscious that his failure was a surprise to no one but himself. It was tea-time, and he knew that a lot of men would be having tea in the basement of the medical school. Those who had passed the examination would be exultant. Those who disliked him would look at him with satisfaction and the poor devils who had failed would sympathize with him in order to receive sympathy. His instinct was not to go near the hospital for a week, when the affair would be no more thought of, but because he hated so much to go just then, he went. He wanted to inflict suffering upon himself. He forgot for the moment his maxim of life to follow his inclination with due regard for the policeman round the corner, or, if he acted in accordance with it, there must have been some strange morbidity in his nature which made him take a grim pleasure in self-torture. But later on, when he had endured the ordeal to which he forced himself, going out into the night after the noisy conversation in the smoking-room, he was seized with a feeling of utter loneliness. He seemed to himself absurd and futile. He had an urgent need of consolation, and the temptation to see Mildred was irresistible. He thought bitterly that there was small chance of consolation from her. But he wanted to see her even if he did not speak to her. After all, she was a waitress and would be obliged to serve him. She was the only person in the world he cared for. There was no use in hiding that fact from himself. Of course it would be humiliating to go back to the shop as though nothing had happened. But he had not much self-respect left. Though he would not confess it to himself, he had hoped each day that she would write to him. She knew that a letter addressed to the hospital would find him, but she had not written. It was evident that she cared nothing if she saw him again or not. And he kept on repeating to himself, "'I must see her. I must see her.' The desire was so great that he could not give the time necessary to walk, but jumped in the cab. He was too thrifty to use one when it could possibly be avoided. He stood outside the shop for a minute or two. 
the thought came to him that perhaps she had left, and in terror he walked in quickly. He saw her at once. He sat down, and she came up to him. "'A cup of tea and a muffin, please,' he ordered. He could hardly speak. He was afraid for a moment that he was going to cry. "'I almost thought you was dead,' she said. She was smiling. Smiling! She seemed to have forgotten completely that last scene which Philip had repeated to himself a hundred times. "'I thought if you'd wanted to see me you'd write,' he answered. "'I've got too much to do to think about writing letters.' It seemed impossible for her to say a gracious thing. Philip cursed the fate which chained him to such a woman. She went away to fetch his tea. "'Would you like me to sit down for a minute or two? she said when she brought it. Yes. Where have you been all this time? I've been in London. I thought you'd gone away for the holidays. Why haven't you been in then? Philip looked at her with haggard, passionate eyes. Don't you remember that I said I'd never see you again? What are you doing now, then? She seemed anxious to make him drink up the cup of his humiliation. But he knew her well enough to know that she spoke at random. She hurt him frightfully and never even tried to. He did not answer. It was a nasty trick you played on me, spying on me like that. I always thought you was a gentleman in every sense of the word. Don't be beastly to me, Mildred. I can't bear it. You are a funny fellow. I can't make you out. It's very simple. I'm such a blasted fool as to love you with all my heart and soul, and I know that you don't care twopence for me. If you had been a gentleman I think you'd have come next day and begged my pardon. She had no mercy. He looked at her neck and thought how he would like to jab it with the knife he had for his muffin. He knew enough anatomy to make pretty certain of getting the carotid artery. And at the same time he wanted to cover her pale, thin face with kisses. If I could only make you understand how frightfully I'm in love with you. You haven't begged my pardon yet. He grew very white. She felt that she had done nothing wrong on that occasion. She wanted him now to humble himself. He was very proud. For one instant he felt inclined to tell her to go to hell. But he dared not. His passion made him abject. He was willing to submit to anything rather than not see her. "'I'm very sorry, Mildred. I beg your pardon.' He had to force the words out. It was a horrible effort. "'Now you said that I don't mind telling you that I wish I had come out with you that evening. I thought Miller was a gentleman, but I've discovered my mistake now. I soon sent him about his business.' Philip gave a little gasp. "'Mildred, won't you come out with me tonight? Let's go and dine somewhere. Oh, I can't. My aunt will be expecting me home. I'll send her a wire. You can say you've been detained in the shop. She won't know any better. Oh, do come, for God's sake. I haven't seen you for so long, and I want to talk to you. She looked down at her clothes. Never mind about that. We'll go somewhere where it doesn't matter how you're dressed, and we'll go to a music hall afterwards. Please say yes. It would give me so much pleasure. She hesitated a moment. He looked at her with pitifully appealing eyes. Well, I don't mind if I do. I haven't been out anywhere since I don't know how long. It was with the greatest difficulty he could prevent himself from seizing her hand there and then to cover it with kisses. End of chapter 59 Chapter 60 They dined in Soho. Philip was tremulous with joy. It was not one of the more crowded of those cheap restaurants where the respectable and needy dine in the belief that it is bohemian and the assurance that it is economical. It was a humble establishment, kept by a good man from Rouen and his wife, that Philip had discovered by accident. He had been attracted by the Gaelic look of the window, in which was generally an uncooked steak on one plate, and on each side two dishes of raw vegetables. There was one seedy French waiter who was attempting to learn English in a house where he never heard anything but French, and the customers were a few ladies of easy virtue, a menage or two, who had their own napkins reserved for them, and a few queer men who came in for hurried, scanty meals. Here Mildred and Philip were able to get a table to themselves. Philip sent the waiter for a bottle of burgundy from the neighboring tavern, and they had a potage à oeuvre 
a steak from the window au palme, and an omelette au kirsch. There was really an air of romance in the meal and in the place. Mildred, at first a little reserved in her appreciation, I never quite trust these foreign places, you never know what there is in them messed-up dishes, was insensibly moved by it. I like this place, Philip, she said. You feel you can put your elbows on the table, don't you? A tall fellow came in with a mane of gray hair and a ragged, thin beard. He wore a dilapidated cloak and a wide-awake hat. He nodded to Philip, whom he had met there before. "'He looks like an anarchist,' said Mildred. "'He is one of the most dangerous in Europe. He's been in every prison on the continent and has assassinated more persons than any gentleman unhung. He always goes about with a bomb in his pocket, and of course it makes conversation a little difficult because, if you don't agree with him, he lays it on the table in a marked manner. She looked at the man with horror and surprise, and then glanced suspiciously at Philip. She saw that his eyes were laughing. She frowned a little. "'You're getting at me!' He gave a little shout of joy. He was so happy, but Mildred didn't like being laughed at. "'I don't see anything funny in telling lies. Don't be cross.' He took her hand, which was lying on the table, and pressed it gently. "'You are lovely, and I could kiss the ground you walk on,' he said. The greenish pallor of her skin intoxicated him, and her thin white lips had an extraordinary fascination. Her anemia made her rather short of breath, and she held her mouth slightly open. It seemed to add somehow to the attractiveness of her face. "'You do like me a bit, don't you?' he asked. "'Well, if I didn't, I suppose I shouldn't be here, should I? You're a gentleman in every sense of the word. I will say that for you.' They had finished their dinner and were drinking coffee. Philip, throwing economy to the winds, smoked a threepenny cigar. "'You can't imagine what a pleasure it is for me just to sit opposite and look at you. I've yearned for you. I was sick for a sight of you.' Mildred smiled a little and faintly flushed. She was not then suffering from the dyspepsia which generally attacked her immediately after a meal. She felt more kindly disposed to Philip than ever before, and the unaccustomed tenderness in her eyes filled him with joy. He knew instinctively that it was madness to give himself into her hands. His only chance was to treat her casually and never allow her to see the untamed passion that seethed in his breast. She would only take advantage of his weakness. But he could not be prudent now. He told her all the agony he had endured during the separation from her. He told her of his struggles with himself, how he had tried to get over his passion, thought he had succeeded, and how he found out that it was as strong as ever. He knew that he had never really wanted to get over it. He loved her so much that he did not mind suffering. He bared his heart to her. He showed her proudly all his weakness. Nothing would have pleased him more than to sit on in the cozy shabby restaurant but he knew that Mildred wanted entertainment. She was restless and, whenever she was, wanted after a while to go somewhere else. He dared not bore her. "'I say, how about going to a music hall?' he said. He thought rapidly that if she cared for him at all she would say she preferred to stay there. "'I was just thinking we ought to be going, if we are going,' she answered. "'Come on, then.' Philip waited impatiently for the end of the performance. He had made up his mind exactly what to do, and when they got into the cab he passed his arm, as though almost by accident, round her waist. But he drew it back quickly with a little cry. He had pricked himself. She laughed. There. That comes of putting your arm where it's got no business to be, she said. I always know when men try and put their arm round my waist. That pin always catches them. I'll be more careful. He put his arm round again she made no objection. "'I'm so comfortable,' he sighed blissfully. "'So long as you're happy,' she retorted. They drove down St. James Street into the park, and Philip quickly kissed her. He was strangely afraid of her, and it required all his courage. She turned her lips to him without speaking. She neither seemed to mind nor to like it. "'If you only knew how long I've wanted to do that,' he murmured. He tried to kiss her again, but she turned her head away. "'Once is enough,' she said. 
on the chance of kissing her a second time, he traveled down to Hearn Hill with her, and at the end of the road in which she lived he asked her, "'Won't you give me another kiss?' She looked at him indifferently, and then glanced up the road to see that no one was in sight. "'I don't mind.' He seized her in his arms and kissed her passionately, but she pushed him away. "'Mind my hat, silly. You are clumsy,' she said. End of chapter 60 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters sixty one through sixty five of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter sixty one. He saw her then every day. He began going to lunch at the shop, but Mildred stopped him. She said it made the girls talk so he had to content himself with tea, but he always waited about to walk with her to the station, and once or twice a week they dined together. He gave her little presents, a gold bangle, gloves, handkerchiefs, and the like. He was spending more than he could afford, but he could not help it. It was only when he gave her anything that she showed any affection. She knew the price of everything, and her gratitude was in exact proportion with the value of his gift. He did not care. He was too happy when she volunteered to kiss him to mind by what means he got her demonstrativeness. He discovered that she found Sundays at home tedious, so he went down to Hearn Hill in the morning, met her at the end of the road, and went to church with her. "'I always like to go to church once,' she said. "'It looks well, doesn't it?' Then she went back to dinner, he got a scrappy meal at a hotel, and in the afternoon they took a walk in Brockwell Park. They had nothing much to say to one another, and Philip, desperately afraid she was bored, she was very easily bored, racked his brain for topics of conversation. He realized that these walks amused neither of them, but he could not bear to leave her, and did all he could to lengthen them till she became tired and out of temper. He knew that she did not care for him, and he tried to force a love which his reason told him was not in her nature. She was cold. He had no claim on her, but he could not help being exacting. Now that they were more intimate he found it less easy to control his temper. He was often irritable and could not help saying bitter things. Often they quarreled, and she would not speak to him for a while but this always reduced him to subjection, and he crawled before her. He was angry with himself for showing so little dignity. He grew furiously jealous if he saw her speaking to any other man in the shop, and when he was jealous he seemed to be beside himself. He would deliberately insult her, leave the shop, and spend afterwards a sleepless night tossing on his bed, by turns angry and remorseful. Next day he would go to the shop an appeal for forgiveness. "'Don't be angry with me,' he said. "'I'm so awfully fond of you that I can't help myself.' "'One of these days you'll go too far,' she answered. He was anxious to come to her home in order that the greater intimacy should give him an advantage over the stray acquaintances she made during her working hours, but she would not let him. "'My aunt would think it so funny,' she said. He suspected that her refusal was due only to a disinclination to let him see her aunt. Mildred had represented her as the widow of a professional man. That was her formula of distinction, and was uneasily conscious that the good woman could hardly be called distinguished. Philip imagined that she was in point of fact the widow of a small tradesman. He knew that Mildred was a snob, but he found no means by which he could indicate to her that he did not mind how common the aunt was. Their worst quarrel took place one evening at dinner when she told him that a man had asked her to go to a play with him. Philip turned pale, and his face grew stern and hard. "'You're not going,' he said. "'Why shouldn't I? He's a very nice, gentlemanly fellow. I'll take you anywhere you like.' "'But that isn't the same thing. I can't always go about with you.' 
Besides, he's asked me to fix my own day, and I'll just go one evening when I'm not going out with you. It won't make any difference to you. If you had any sense of decency, if you had any gratitude, you wouldn't dream of going. I don't know what you mean by gratitude. If you're referring to the things you've given me, you can have them back. I don't want them. Her voice had the shrewish tone it sometimes got. It's not very lively always going about with you. It's always, do you love me, do you love me, till I just about get sick of it. He knew it was madness to go on asking her that, but he could not help himself. Oh, I like you all right, she would answer. Is that all? I love you with all my heart. I'm not that sort. I'm not one to say much. If you knew how happy just one word would make me. Well, what I always say is, people must take me as they find me, and if they don't like it, they can lump it. But sometimes she expressed herself more plainly still, and when he asked the question answered, Oh, don't go on at that again. Then he became sulky and silent. He hated her. And now he said, Oh, well, if you feel like that about it, I wonder you condescend to come out with me at all. It's not my seeking, you can be very sure of that. You just force me to. His pride was bitterly hurt, and he answered madly. You think I'm just good enough to stand you dinners and theaters when there's no one else to do it, and when someone else turns up, I can go to hell. Thank you, I'm about sick of being made a convenience. I'm not going to be talked to like that by anyone. I'll just show you how much I want your dirty dinner. She got up put on her jacket, and walked quickly out of the restaurant. Philip sat on. He determined he would not move, but ten minutes afterwards he jumped in a cab and followed her. He guessed that she would take a bus to Victoria so that they would arrive about the same time. He saw her on the platform, escaped her notice, and went down to Hearn Hill in the same train. He did not want to speak to her till she was on the way home and could not escape him. As soon as she had turned out of the main street, brightly lit and noisy with traffic, he caught up with her. Mildred, he called. She walked on and would neither look at him nor answer. He repeated her name. Then she stopped and faced him. What do you want? I saw you hanging about Victoria. Why don't you leave me alone? I'm awfully sorry. Won't you make it up? No, I'm sick of your temper and your jealousy. I don't care for you. I never have cared for you, and I never shall care for you. I don't want to have anything more to do with you. She walked on quickly, and he had to hurry to keep up with her. You never make allowances for me, he said. It's all very well to be jolly and amiable when you're indifferent to anyone. It's very hard when you're as much in love as I am. Have mercy on me. I don't mind that you don't care for me. After all, you can't help it. I only want you to let me love you." She walked on, refusing to speak, and Philip saw with agony that they had only a few hundred yards to go before they reached her house. He abased himself. He poured out an incoherent story of love and penitence. "'If you'll only forgive me this time, I promise you you'll never have to complain of me in the future. You can go out with whoever you choose. I'll be only too glad if you'll come with me when you've got nothing better to do. She stopped again, for they had reached the corner at which he always left her. Now you can take yourself off. I won't have you coming up to the door. I won't go till you say you'll forgive me. I'm sick and tired of the whole thing. He hesitated a moment, for he had an instinct that he could say something that would move her. It made him feel almost sick to utter the words. It is cruel I have so much to put up with. You don't know what it is to be a cripple. Of course you don't like me. I can't expect you to. Philip, I didn't mean that, she answered quickly, with a sudden break of pity in her voice. You know it's not true. He was beginning to act now, and his voice was husky and low. Oh, I've felt it, he said. She took his hand and looked at him, and her own eyes were filled with tears. I promise you it never made any difference to me. I never thought about it after the first day or two. He kept a gloomy, tragic silence. He wanted her to think he was overcome with emotion. You know, I like you awfully, Philip, only you are so trying sometimes. Let's make it up. 
she put up her lips to his, and with a sigh of relief he kissed her. "'Now are you happy again?' she asked. "'Madly.' She bade him good night and hurried down the road. Next day he took her in a little watch with a brooch to pin on her dress. She had been hankering for it. But three or four days later, when she brought him his tea, Mildred said to him, "'You remember what you promised the other night? You mean to keep that, don't you?' Yes. He knew exactly what she meant, and was prepared for her next words. "'Because I'm going out with that gentleman I told you about tonight.' "'All right. I hope you'll enjoy yourself.' "'You don't mind, do you?' He had himself now under excellent control. "'I don't like it,' he smiled, "'but I'm not going to make myself more disagreeable than I can help.' She was excited over the outing and talked about it willingly. Philip wondered whether she did so in order to pain him or merely because she was callous. He was in the habit of condoning her cruelty by the thought of her stupidity. She had not the brains to see when she was wounding him. It's not much fun to be in love with a girl who has no imagination and no sense of humor, he thought, as he listened. But the want of these things excused her. He felt that if he had not realized this he could never forgive her for the pain she caused him. "'He's got seats for the Tivoli,' she said. "'He gave me my choice, and I chose that, and we're going to dine at the Café Royal. He says it's the most expensive place in London.' "'He's a gentleman in every sense of the word,' thought Philip, but he clenched his teeth to prevent himself from uttering a syllable. Philip went to the Tivoli and saw Mildred with her companion a smooth-faced young man with sleek hair and the spruce look of a commercial traveller, sitting in the second row of the stalls. Mildred wore a black picture hat with ostrich feathers in it, which became her well. She was listening to her host with that quiet smile which Philip knew. She had no vivacity of expression, and it required broad farce to excite her laughter. But Philip could see that she was interested and amused, he thought to himself bitterly that her companion, flashy and jovial, exactly suited her. Her sluggish temperament made her appreciate noisy people. Philip had a passion for discussion, but no talent for small talk. He admired the easy drollery of which some of his friends were masters, Lawson, for instance, and his sense of inferiority made him shy and awkward. The things which interested him bored Mildred. She expected men to talk about football and racing, and he knew nothing of either. He did not know the catchwords which only need to be said to excite a laugh. Printed matter had always been a fetish to Philip, and now, in order to make himself more interesting, he read industriously the Sporting Times. End of chapter 61 Chapter 62 Philip did not surrender himself willingly to the passion that consumed him. He knew that all things human are transitory, and therefore that it must cease one day or another. He looked forward to that day with eager longing. Love was like a parasite in his heart, nourishing a hateful existence on his life's blood. It absorbed his existence so intensely that he could take pleasure in nothing else. He had been used to delight in the grace of St. James Park, and often he sat and looked at the branches of a tree silhouetted against the sky. It was like a Japanese print, and he found a continual magic in the beautiful Thames with its barges and its wharfs. The changing sky of London had filled his soul with pleasant fancies. But now beauty meant nothing to him. He was bored and restless when he was not with Mildred. Sometimes he thought he would console his sorrow by looking at pictures but he walked through the National Gallery like a sightseer, and no picture called up in him a thrill of emotion. He wondered if he could ever care again for all the things he had loved. He had been devoted to reading, but now books were meaningless, and he spent his spare hours in the smoking-room of the hospital club, turning over innumerable periodicals. This love was a torment, and he resented bitterly the subjugation in which it held him. He was a prisoner, and he longed for freedom. Sometimes he awoke in the morning and felt nothing. His soul leaped, for he thought he was free. He loved no longer. 
but in a little while, as he grew wide awake, the pain settled in his heart, and he knew that he was not cured yet. Though he yearned for Mildred so madly, he despised her. He thought to himself that there could be no greater torture in the world than at the same time to love and to contemn. Philip, burrowing as was his habit into the state of his feelings, discussing with himself continually his condition, came to the conclusion that he could only cure himself of his degrading passion by making Mildred his mistress. It was sexual hunger that he suffered from, and if he could satisfy this he might free himself from the intolerable chains that bound him. He knew that Mildred did not care for him at all in that way. When he kissed her passionately she withdrew herself from him with instinctive distaste. She had no sensuality. Sometimes he had tried to make her jealous by talking of adventures in Paris, but they did not interest her. Once or twice he had sat at other tables in the tea-shop and affected to flirt with the waitress who attended them, but she was entirely indifferent. He could see that it was no pretense on her part. "'You don't mind my not sitting at one of your tables this afternoon?' he asked once when he was walking to the station with her. "'Yours seem to be all full.' This was not a fact, but she did not contradict him. Even if his desertion meant nothing to her, he would have been grateful if she had pretended it did. A reproach would have been balm to his soul. "'I think it's silly of you to sit at the same table every day. You ought to give the other girls a turn now and again.' But the more he thought of it, the more he was convinced that complete surrender on her part was his only way to freedom. He was like a knight of old, metamorphosed by magic spells, who sought the potions which should restore him to his fair and proper form. Philip had only one hope. Mildred greatly desired to go to Paris. To her, as to most English people, it was the center of gaiety and fashion. She had heard of the Megues in Deleuve, where you could get the very latest thing for about half the price you had to pay in London. A friend of hers had passed her honeymoon in Paris, and had spent all day at the Louvre, and she and her husband, my dear, they never went to bed till six in the morning all the time they were there, the Moulin Rouge, and I don't know what all. Philip did not care that if she yielded to his desires it would only be the unwilling price she paid for the gratification of her wish. He did not care upon what terms he satisfied his passion. He had even had a mad melodramatic idea to drug her. He had plied her with liquor in the hope of exciting her, but she had no taste for wine, and though she liked him to order champagne because it looked well, she never drank more than half a glass. She liked to leave untouched a large glass filled to the brim. "'It shows the waiters who you are,' she said. Philip chose an opportunity when she seemed more than usually friendly. He had an examination in anatomy at the end of March. Easter, which came a week later, would give Mildred three whole days' holiday. "'I say, why don't you come over to Paris, then?' he suggested. "'We'd have such a ripping time.' "'How could you? It would cost no end of money.' Philip had thought of that. It would cost at least five and twenty pounds. It was a large sum to him. He was willing to spend his last penny on her. "'What does that matter? Say you'll come, darling.' what next I should like to know. I can't see myself going away with a man that I wasn't married to. You oughtn't to suggest such a thing. What does it matter? He enlarged on the glories of the Rue de la Paix and the garish splendor of the Fouli Berger. He described the Louvre and the Bon Marche. He told her about the Cabaret du Nord, the Abbe, and the various haunts to which foreigners go. He painted in glowing colors the side of Paris which he despised. He pressed her to come with him. "'You know, you say you love me, but if you really love me you'd want to marry me. You've never asked me to marry you. You know I can't afford it. After all, I'm in my first year. I shan't earn a penny for six years. Oh, I'm not blaming you. I wouldn't marry you if you went down on your bended knees to me.' He had thought of marriage more than once but it was a step from which he shrank. In Paris he had come by the opinion that marriage was a ridiculous institution of the Philistines. He knew also that a permanent tie would ruin him. 
He had middle-class instincts, and it seemed a dreadful thing to him to marry a waitress. A common wife would prevent him from getting a decent practice. Besides, he had only just enough money to last him till he was qualified. He could not keep a wife even if they arranged not to have children. He thought of Cronshaw bound to a vulgar slattern, and he shuddered with dismay. He foresaw what Mildred, with her genteel ideas and her mean mind, would become. It was impossible for him to marry her. But he decided only with his reason. He felt that he must have her, whatever happened, and if he could not get her without marrying her, he would do that. The future could look after itself it might end in disaster. He did not care. When he got hold of an idea that obsessed him, he could think of nothing else, and he had a more than common power to persuade himself of the reasonableness of what he wished to do. He found himself overthrowing all the sensible arguments which had occurred to him against marriage. Each day he found that he was more passionately devoted to her, and his unsatisfied love became angry and resentful. "'By George, if I marry her I'll make her pay for all the suffering I've endured,' he said to himself. At last he could bear the agony no longer. After dinner one evening in the little restaurant in Soho, to which now they often went, he spoke to her. "'I say, did you mean it the other day that you wouldn't marry me if I asked you?' "'Yes, why not?' "'Because I can't live without you.' I want you with me always. I've tried to get over it, and I can't. I never shall now. I want you to marry me. She had read too many novelettes not to know how to take such an offer. I'm sure I'm very grateful to you, Philip. I'm very much flattered at your proposal. Oh, don't talk rot. You will marry me, won't you? Do you think we should be happy? No, but what does that matter? The words were wrung out of him almost against his will. They surprised her. "'Well, you are a funny chap. Why do you want to marry me, then? The other day you said you couldn't afford it. I think I've got about fourteen hundred pounds left. Two can live just as cheaply as one. That'll keep us till I'm qualified and have got through with my hospital appointments, and then I can get an assistantship. That means you wouldn't be able to earn anything for six years.' We should have about four pounds a week to live on till then, shouldn't we? Not much more than three. There are all my fees to pay. And what would you get as an assistant? Three pounds a week. Do you mean to say that you have to work all that time and spend a small fortune just to earn three pounds a week at the end of it? I don't see that I should be any better off than I am now. He was silent for a moment. Do you mean to say you won't marry me? he asked hoarsely. Does my great love mean nothing to you at all? One has to think of oneself in those things, don't one? I shouldn't mind marrying, but I don't want to marry if I'm going to be no better off than what I am now. I don't see the use of it. If you cared for me you wouldn't think of all that. Perhaps not. He was silent. He drank a glass of wine in order to get rid of the choking in his throat. Look at that girl who's just going out said Mildred. She got them furs at the Bar Marche at Brixton. I saw them in the window last time I went down there. Philip smiled grimly. What are you laughing at? she asked. It's true, and I said to my aunt at that time I wouldn't buy anything that had been in the window like that for everyone to know how much you paid for it. I can't understand you. You make me frightfully unhappy, and in the next breath you talk rot that has nothing to do with what we're speaking about. "'You are nasty to me,' she answered, aggrieved. "'I can't help noticing those furs, because I said to my aunt—' "'I don't care a damn what you said to your aunt,' he interrupted impatiently. "'I wish you wouldn't use bad language when you speak to me, Philip. You know I don't like it.' Philip smiled a little, but his eyes were wild. He was silent for a while. He looked at her sullenly. He hated, despised, and loved her. If I had an ounce of sense I'd never see you again, he said at last. If you only knew how heartily I despise myself for loving you. That's not a very nice thing to say to me, she replied sulkily. It isn't, he laughed. Let's go to the pavilion. That's what's so funny in you. You start laughing just when one doesn't expect you to. 
and if I make you that unhappy, why do you want to take me to the pavilion? I'm quite ready to go home. Merely because I'm less unhappy with you than away from you. I should like to know what you really think of me. He laughed outright. My dear, if you did, you'd never speak to me again. End of chapter 62 Chapter 63 Philip did not pass the examination in anatomy at the end of March. He and Dunsford had worked at the subject together on Philip's skeleton, asking each other questions till both knew by heart every attachment and the meaning of every nodule and groove on the human bones. But in the examination room Philip was seized with panic and failed to give right answers to questions from a sudden fear that they might be wrong. He knew he was ploughed and did not even trouble to go up to the building next day to see whether his number was up. The second failure put him definitely among the incompetent and idle men of his year. He did not care much. He had other things to think of. He told himself that Mildred must have senses like anybody else, it was only a question of awakening them. He had theories about women, the rip at heart, and thought that there must come a time with everyone when she would yield to persistence. It was a question of watching for the opportunity, keeping his temper, wearing her down with small attentions, taking advantage of the physical exhaustion which opened the heart to tenderness, making himself a refuge from the petty vexations of her work. He talked to her of the relations between his friends in Paris and the fair ladies they admired. The life he described had a charm an easy gaiety, in which was no grossness. Weaving into his own recollections the adventures of Mimi and Rudolphi, of Musset and the rest of them, he poured into Mildred's ears a story of poetry made picturesque by song and laughter, of lawless love made romantic by beauty and youth. He never attacked her prejudices directly, but sought to combat them by the suggestion that they were suburban. He never let himself be disturbed by her inattention nor irritated by her indifference. He thought he had bored her. By an effort he made himself affable and entertaining. He never let himself be angry. He never asked for anything. He never complained. He never scolded. When she made engagements and broke them, he met her next day with a smiling face. When she excused herself, he said it did not matter. He never let her see that she pained him. He understood that his passionate grief had wearied her, and he took care to hide every sentiment which could be, in the least degree, troublesome. He was heroic. Though she never mentioned the change, for she did not take any conscious notice of it, it affected her nevertheless. She became more confidential with him. She took her little grievances to him and she always had some grievance against the manageress of the shop, one of her fellow waitresses, or her aunt. She was talkative enough now, and though she never said anything that was not trivial, Philip was never tired of listening to her. "'I like you when you don't want to make love to me,' she told him once. "'That's flattering for me,' he laughed. She did not realize how her words made his heart sink, nor what an effort it needed for him to answer so lightly. Oh, I don't mind your kissing me now and then. It doesn't hurt me, and it gives you pleasure. Occasionally she went so far as to ask him to take her out to dinner, and the offer coming from her filled him with rapture. I wouldn't do it to anyone else, she said by way of apology, but I know I can with you. You couldn't give me greater pleasure, he smiled. She asked him to give her something to eat one evening towards the end of April. All right, he said where would you like to go afterwards? Oh, don't let's go anywhere. Let's just sit and talk. You don't mind, do you? Rather not. He thought she must be beginning to care for him. Three months before the thought of an evening spent in conversation would have bored her to death. It was a fine day, and the spring added to Philip's high spirits. He was content with very little now. I say, won't it be ripping when the summer comes along? he said as they drove along on the top of a bus to Soho. She had herself suggested that they should not be so extravagant as to go by cab. We shall be able to spend every Sunday on the river. We'll take our luncheon in a basket. She smiled slightly, and he was encouraged to take her hand. She did not withdraw it. 
I really think you're beginning to like me a bit, he smiled. You are silly. You know I like you, or else I shouldn't be here, should I? They were old customers at the little restaurant in Soho by now, and the Patroni gave them a smile as they came in. The waiter was obsequious. Let me order the dinner tonight, said Mildred. Philip, thinking her more enchanting than ever, gave her the menu, and she chose her favorite dishes. The range was small, and they had eaten many times all that the restaurant could provide. Philip was gay. He looked into her eyes, and he dwelt on every perfection of her pale cheek. When they had finished, Mildred, by way of exception, took a cigarette. She smoked very seldom. "'I don't like to see a lady smoking,' she said. She hesitated a moment, and then spoke. "'Were you surprised my asking you to take me out and give me a bit of dinner tonight?' I was delighted. "'I've got something to say to you, Philip.' He looked at her quickly, his heart sank, but he had trained himself well. "'Well, fire away,' he said, smiling. "'You're not going to be silly about it, are you? The fact is, I'm going to get married.' "'Are you?' said Philip. He could think of nothing else to say. He had considered the possibility often, and had imagined to himself what he would do and say. He had suffered agonies when he thought of the despair he would suffer, he had thought of suicide, of the mad passion of anger that would seize him, but perhaps he had too completely anticipated the emotion he would experience, so that now he felt merely exhausted. He felt as one does in a serious illness when the vitality is so low that one is indifferent to the issue and wants only to be left alone. "'You see, I'm getting on,' she said. "'I'm twenty-four and it's time I settle down. He was silent. He looked at the Patroni sitting behind the counter, and his eye dwelt on a red feather one of the diners wore in her hat. Mildred was nettled. You might congratulate me, she said. I might, mind I. I can hardly believe it's true. I've dreamt it so often. It rather tickles me that I should have been so jolly glad that you asked me to take you out to dinner. Whom are you going to marry? Miller, she answered with a slight blush. Miller? cried Philip, astounded. But you've not seen him for months. He came in to lunch one day last week and asked me then. He's earning very good money. He makes seven pounds a week now, and he's got prospects. Philip was silent again. He remembered that she had always liked Miller. He amused her. There was in his foreign birth an exotic charm which she felt unconsciously. I suppose it was inevitable, he said at last. You were bound to accept the highest bidder. When are you going to marry? On Saturday next. I have given notice. Philip felt a sudden pang. As soon as that. We're going to be married at the registry office. Amel prefers it. Philip felt dreadfully tired. He wanted to get away from her. He thought he would go straight to bed. He called for the bill. I'll put you in a cab and send you down to Victoria. I dare say you won't have to wait long for a train. Won't you come with me? I think I'd rather not, if you don't mind. It's just as you please, she answered haughtily. I suppose I shall see you at tea-time tomorrow? No, I think we'd better make a full stop now. I don't see why I should go on making myself unhappy. I've paid the cab." He nodded to her and forced a smile on his lips, then jumped on a bus and made his way home. He smoked a pipe before he went to bed, but he could hardly keep his eyes open. He suffered no pain. He fell into a heavy sleep almost as soon as his head touched the pillow. End of chapter 63 Chapter 64 But about three in the morning Philip awoke and could not sleep again. He began to think of Mildred. He tried not to, but he could not help himself. He repeated to himself the same thing time after time till his brain reeled. It was inevitable that she should marry. Life was hard for a girl who had to earn her own living, and if she found someone who could give her a comfortable home she should not be blamed if she accepted. Philip acknowledged that, from her point of view, it would have been madness to marry him. 
Only love could have made such poverty bearable. And she did not love him. It was no fault of hers. It was a fact that must be accepted like any other. Philip tried to reason with himself. He told himself that deep down in his heart was mortified pride. His passion had begun in wounded vanity, and it was this at bottom which caused now a great part of his wretchedness. He despised himself as much as he despised her. Then he made plans for the future, the same plans over and over again, interrupted by recollections of kisses on her soft pale cheek and by the sound of her voice with its trailing accent. He had a great deal of work to do, since in the summer he was taking chemistry as well as the two examinations he had failed in. He had separated himself from his friends at the hospital, but now he wanted companionship. There was one happy occurrence. Hayward, a fortnight before, had written to say that he was passing through London and had asked him to dinner. But Philip, unwilling to be bothered, had refused. He was coming back for the season, and Philip made up his mind to write to him. He was thankful when eight o'clock struck and he could get up. He was pale and weary, but when he bathed, dressed, and had breakfast, he felt himself joined up again with the world at large, and his pain was a little easier to bear. He did not feel like going to lectures that morning, but went instead to the Army and Navy stores to buy Mildred a wedding present. After much wavering he settled on a dressing-bag. It cost twenty pounds, which was more than he could afford, but it was showy and vulgar. He knew she would be aware exactly how much it cost. He got a melancholy satisfaction in choosing a gift which would give her pleasure and at the same time indicate for himself the contempt he had for her. Philip had looked forward with apprehension to the day on which Mildred was to be married. He was expecting an intolerable anguish, and it was relief that he got a letter from Hayward on Saturday morning to say that he was coming up early on that very day and would fetch Philip to help him find rooms. Philip, anxious to be distracted, looked up a timetable and discovered the only train Hayward was likely to come by. He went to meet him, and the reunion of the friends was enthusiastic. They left the luggage at the station and set off gaily. Hayward characteristically proposed that first of all they should go for an hour to the National Gallery. He had not seen pictures for some time, and he stated that it needed a glimpse to set him in tune with life. Philip for months had had no one with whom he could talk of art and books. Since the Paris days Hayward had immersed himself in the modern French persifiers, and such a plethora of poets is there in France he had several new geniuses to tell Philip about. They walked through the gallery pointing out to one another their favorite pictures. One subject led to another. They talked excitedly. The sun was shining and the air was warm. "'Let's go and sit in the park,' said Hayward. "'We'll look for rooms after luncheon.' The spring was pleasant there. It was a day upon which one felt it good merely to live. The young green of the trees was exquisite against the sky, and the sky, pale and blue, was dappled with little white clouds. At the end of the ornamental water was the gray mass of the horse guards. The ordered elegance of the scene had the charm of an eighteenth-century picture. It reminded you not of Watteau, whose landscapes are so idyllic that they recall only the woodland glens seen in dreams, but of the more prosaic Jean Portis de Poitier. Philip's heart was filled with lightness. He realized what he had only read before, that art, for there was art in the manner in which he looked upon nature, might liberate the soul from pain. They went to an Italian restaurant for luncheon and ordered themselves a fichetto of Chianti. Lingering over the meals, they talked on. They reminded one another of the people they had known at Heidelberg. They spoke of Philip's friends in Paris. They talked of books, pictures, moral, life. And suddenly Philip heard a clock strike three. He remembered that, by this time, Mildred was married. He felt a sort of stitch in his heart, and for a minute or two he could not hear what Hayward was saying. But he filled his glass with Chianti. He was unaccustomed to alcohol, and it had gone to his head. For the time, at all events, he was free from care. 
His quick brain had lain idle for so many months that he was intoxicated now with conversation. He was thankful to have someone to talk to who would interest himself in the things that interested him. I say, don't let's waste this beautiful day in looking for rooms. I'll put you up tonight. You can look for rooms tomorrow or Monday. All right. What shall we do? answered Hayward. Let's get on a penny steamboat and go down to Greenwich. The idea appealed to Hayward, and they jumped into a cab which took them to Westminster Bridge. They got on the steamboat just as she was starting. Presently, Philip, a smile on his lips, spoke. I remember when first I went to Paris. Clutton, I think it was, gave a long discourse on the subject that beauty is put into things by painters and poets. They create beauty. In themselves there is nothing to choose between the Compagnie of Giotto and a factory chimney. And then beautiful things grow rich with the emotion that they have aroused in succeeding generations. That is why old things are more beautiful than modern. The ode on a Grecian urn is more lovely now than when it was written, because for a hundred years lovers have read it, and the sick at heart taken comfort in its lines. Philip left Hayward to infer what in the passing scene had suggested these words to him, and it was a delight to know that he could safely leave the inference. It was in sudden reaction from the life he had been leading for so long that he was now deeply affected. The delicate iridescence of the London air gave the softness of a pastel to the grey stone of the buildings, and in the wharfs and storehouses there was the severity of grace of a Japanese print. They went further down, and the splendid channel, a symbol of the great empire, broadened, and it was crowded with traffic. Philip thought of the painters and the poets who had made all these things so beautiful, and his heart was filled with gratitude. They came to the Pool of London, and who can describe its majesty? The imagination thrills, and heaven knows what figures people still its broad stream, Dr. Johnson with Boswell by his side, an old Pepys going on board a man of war, the pageant of English history and romance and high adventure. Philip turned to Hayward with shining eyes. Dear Charles Dickens, he murmured, smiling a little at his own emotion. "'Aren't you rather sorry you chucked painting?' asked Hayward. "'No. I suppose you like doctoring. No, I hate it, but there was nothing else to do. The drudgery of the first two years is awful, and unfortunately I haven't got the scientific temperament. Well, you can't go on changing professions. Oh, no, I'm going to stick to this. I think I shall like it better when I get into the wards.' I have an idea that I'm more interested in people than in anything else in the world, and as far as I can see it's the only profession in which you have your freedom. You carry your knowledge in your head, with a box of instruments and a few drugs you can make your living anywhere. Aren't you going to take a practice, then? Not for a good long time, at any rate, Philip answered. As soon as I've got through my hospital appointments I shall get a ship. I want to go to the East the Malay archipelago, Siam, China, and all that sort of thing, and then I shall take odd jobs. Something always comes along, cholera duty in India and things like that. I want to go from place to place. I want to see the world. The only way a poor man can do that is by going in for the medical. They came to Greenwich then. The noble building of Inigo Jones faced the River Grandly. I say, look, that must be the place where poor Jack dived into the mud for pennies, said Philip. They wandered in the park. Ragged children were playing in it, and it was noisy with their cries. Here and there old seamen were basking in the sun. There was an air of a hundred years ago. It seems a pity you wasted two years in Paris, said Hayward. Waste? Look at the movement of that child. Look at the pattern which the sun makes on the ground, shining through the trees, look at that sky. Why, I should never have seen that sky if I hadn't been to Paris. Hayward thought that Philip choked a sob, and he looked at him with astonishment. What's the matter with you? Nothing. I'm sorry to be so damned emotional, but for six months I've been starved for beauty. You used to be so matter-of-fact. It's very interesting to hear you say that. Damn it all, I don't want to be interesting, laughed Philip. 
let's go and have a stodgy tea. End of chapter 64 Chapter 65 Hayward's visit did Philip a great deal of good. Each day his thoughts dwelt less on Mildred. He looked back upon the past with disgust. He could not understand how he had submitted to the dishonor of such a love, and when he thought of Mildred it was with angry hatred, because she had submitted him to so much humiliation. His imagination presented her to him now with her defects of person and manner exaggerated, so that he shuddered at the thought of having been connected with her. "'It just shows how damned weak I am,' he said to himself. The adventure was like a blunder that no one had committed at a party so horrible that one felt nothing could be done to excuse it. The only remedy was to forget. His horror at the degradation he had suffered helped him. He was like a snake casting its skin and he looked upon the old covering with nausea. He exulted in the possession of himself once more. He realized how much of the delight of the world he had lost when he was absorbed in that madness which they called love. He had had enough of it. He did not want to be in love any more if love was that. Philip told Hayward something of what he had gone through. "'Wasn't it Sophocles,' he asked, who prayed for the time when he could be delivered from the wild beast of passion that devoured his heartstrings? Philip seemed really to be born again. He breathed the circumambient air as though he had never breathed it before, and he took a child's pleasure in all the facts of the world. He called his period of insanity six months hard labor. Hayward had only been settled in London a few days when Philip received from Blackstable, where it had been sent, a card for a private view at some picture gallery. He took Hayward and, on looking at the catalogue, saw that Lawson had a picture in it. I suppose he sent the card, said Philip. Let's go and find him. He's sure to be in front of his picture. This, a profile of Ruth Chalice, was tucked away in a corner, and Lawson was not far from it. He looked a little lost in his large soft hat and loose pale clothes amongst the fashionable throng that had gathered for the private view. He greeted Philip with enthusiasm, and, with his usual volubility, told him that he had come to live in London Ruth Chalice was a hussy, he had taken a studio, Paris was played out, he had a commission for a portrait, and they'd better dine together and have a good old talk. Philip reminded him of his acquaintance with Hayward and was entertained to see that Lawson was slightly awed by Hayward's elegant clothes and grand manner. They sat upon him better than they had done in the shabby little studio which Lawson and Philip had shared. At dinner Lawson went on with his news. Flanagan had gone back to America. Clutton had disappeared. He had come to the conclusion that a man had no chance of doing anything so long as he was in contact with art and artist. The only thing was to get right away. To make the step easier he had quarreled with all his friends in Paris. He developed a talent for telling them home truths, which made them bear with fortitude his declaration that he had done with that city and was settling in Girona, a little town in the north of Spain which had attracted him when he saw it from the train on his way to Barcelona. He was living there now alone. "'I wonder if he'll ever do any good,' said Philip. He was interested in the human side of that struggle to express something which was so obscure in the man's mind that he was become morbid and querulous. Philip felt vaguely that he was himself in the same case, but with him it was the conduct of his life as a whole that perplexed him. It was his means of self-expression, and what he must do with it it was not clear. But he had no time to continue with his train of thought, for Lawson poured out a frank recital of his affair with Ruth Chalice. She had left him for a young student who had just come from England, and was behaving in a scandalous fashion. Lawson really thought someone ought to step in and save the young man. She would ruin him. Philip gathered that Lawson's chief grievance was that the rapture had come in the middle of a portrait he was painting. Women have no real feeling for art, he said. They only pretend they have. But he finished philosophically enough. However, I got four portraits out of her, and I'm not sure if the last I was working on would ever have been a success. 
Philip envied the easy way in which the painter managed his love affairs. He had passed eighteen months pleasantly enough, had got an excellent model for nothing, and had parted from her at the end with no great pang. "'And what about Cronshaw?' asked Philip. "'Oh, he's done for,' answered Lawson, with the cheerful callousness of his youth. "'He'll be dead in six months. He got pneumonia last winter. He was in the English hospital for seven weeks, and when he came out they told him his only chance was to give up liquor. "'Poor devil!' smiled the abstemious Philip. He kept off for a bit. He used to go to the Lilas all the same, he couldn't keep away from that, but he used to drink hot milk, avec de la fleur de Angers, and he was damn dull. I take it you did not conceal the fact from him. Oh, he knew it himself. A little while ago he started on whiskey again. He said he was too old to turn over any new leaves. He would rather be happy for six months and die at the end of it than linger on for five years. And then I think he's been awfully hard up lately. You see, he didn't earn anything while he was ill, and the slut he lives with has been giving him a rotten time. I remember the first time I saw him I admired him awfully, said Philip. I thought he was wonderful. It is sickening that vulgar middle-class virtue should pay. Of course he was a rotter. He was bound to end in the gutter sooner or later, said Lawson. Philip was hurt because Lawson would not see the pity of it. Of course it was cause and effect, but in the necessity with which one follows the other lay all tragedy of life. Oh, I forgot, said Lawson. Just after you left he sent round a present for you. I thought you'd be coming back and I didn't bother about it, and then I didn't think it worth sending on. But it'll come over to London with the rest of my things, and you can come to my studio one day and fetch it away if you want it. You haven't told me what it is yet. Oh, it's only a ragged little bit of carpet. I shouldn't think it's worth anything. I asked him one day what the devil he'd sent the filthy thing for. He told me he'd seen it at a shop in the Rue de Rennes and bought it for fifteen francs. It appears to be a Persian rug. He said you'd asked him the meaning of life, and that was the answer. But he was very drunk. Philip laughed. Oh, yes, I know. I'll take it. It was a favorite wheeze of his. He said I must find out for myself, or else the answer meant nothing. End of chapter 65 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters 66 through 69 of Of Human Bondage This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 66. Philip worked well and easily. He had a good deal to do, since he was taking in July the three parts of the first conjoint examination, two of which he had failed in before. But he found life pleasant. He made a new friend. Lawson, on the lookout for models, had discovered a girl who was understudying at one of the theatres, and in order to induce her to sit to him arranged a little luncheon party one Sunday. She brought a chaperone with her, and to her Philip, asked to make a fourth, was instructed to confine his attentions. He found this easy, since she turned out to be an agreeable chatterbox with an amusing tongue. She asked Philip to go and see her. She had rooms in Vincent Square and was always in to tea at five o'clock. He went, was delighted with his welcome, and went again. Mrs. Nesbit was not more than twenty-five, very small, with a pleasant, ugly face. She had very bright eyes, high cheekbones, and a large mouth. The excessive contrast of her coloring reminded one of a portrait by one of the modern French painters. Her skin was very white, her cheeks were very red, her thick eyebrows, her hair, were very black. The effect was odd, a little unnatural, but far from unpleasing. She was separated from her husband and earned her living and her child's by writing penny novelettes. There were one or two publishers who made a specialty of that sort of thing, and she had as much work as she could do. It was ill-paid she received fifteen pounds for a story of thirty thousand words, but she was satisfied. After all, 
It only costs the reader two pence, she said, and they like the same thing over and over again. I just change the names, and that's all. When I'm bored I think of the washing and the rent and clothes for baby, and I go on again. Besides, she walked on at various theatres where they wanted supers, and earned by this when in work from sixteen shillings to a guinea a week. At the end of her day she was so tired that she slept like a top. She made the best of her difficult lot. Her keen sense of humor enabled her to get amusement out of every vexatious circumstance. Sometimes things went wrong, and she found herself with no money at all. Then her trifling possessions found their way to a pawn shop in the Vauxhall Bridge Road, and she ate bread and butter till things grew brighter. She never lost her cheerfulness. Philip was interested in her shiftless life, and she made him laugh with fantastic narration of her struggles. He asked her why she did not try her hand at literary work of a better sort, but she knew that she had no talent, and the abominable stuff she turned out by the thousand words was not only tolerably paid, but was the best she could do. She had nothing to look forward to but a continuation of the life she led. She seemed to have no relations, and her friends were as poor as herself. I don't think of the future, she said, as long as I have enough money for three weeks' rent and a pound or two over for food, I never bother. Life wouldn't be worth living if I worried over the future as well as the present. When things are at their worst I find something always happens. Soon Philip grew in the habit of going into tea with her every day, and so that his visits might not embarrass her he took in a pound of cake or a pound of butter or some tea. They started to call one another by their Christian names. Feminine sympathy was new to him, and he delighted in someone who gave a willing ear to all his troubles. The hours went quickly. He did not hide his admiration for her. She was a delightful companion. He could not help comparing her with Mildred, and he contrasted with the one's obstinate stupidity, which refused interest to everything she did not know, the other's quick appreciation and ready intelligence. His heart sank when he thought that he might have been tied for life to such a woman as Mildred. One evening he told Nora the whole story of his love. It was not one to give him much reason for self-esteem, and it was very pleasant to receive such charming sympathy. "'I think you're well out of it,' she said when he had finished. She had a funny way at times of holding her head on one side like an Aberdeen puppy. She was sitting in an upright chair, sewing, for she had no time to do nothing, and Philip had made himself comfortable at her feet. "'I can't tell you how heartily thankful I am it's all over,' he sighed. "'Poor thing! You must have had a rotten time,' she murmured, and by way of showing her sympathy put her hand on his shoulder. He took it and kissed it, but she withdrew it quickly. "'Why did you do that?' she asked with a blush. "'Have you any objection?' She looked at him for a moment with twinkling eyes, and she smiled. "'No,' she said. He got up on his knees and faced her. She looked into his eyes steadily, and her large mouth trembled with a smile. "'Well,' she said, "'you know you are a ripper. I'm so grateful to you for being nice to me. I like you so much.' "'Don't be idiotic,' she said. Philip took hold of her elbows and drew her towards him. She made no resistance, but bent forward a little, and he kissed her red lips. "'Why did you do that?' she asked again. "'Because it's comfortable.' She did not answer, but a tender look came into her eyes, and she passed her hand softly over his hair. "'You know, it's awfully silly of you to behave like this. We were such good friends. It would be so jolly to leave it at that.' "'If you really want to appeal to my better nature,' replied Philip, you'll do well not to stroke my cheek while you're doing it. She gave a little chuckle, but she did not stop. It's very wrong of me, isn't it? she said. Philip, surprised and a little amused, looked into her eyes, and as he looked he saw them soften and grow liquid, and there was an expression in them that enchanted him. His heart was suddenly stirred, and tears came to his eyes. Nora, you're not fond of me, are you? he asked incredulously. "'You clever boy, you ask such stupid questions.' "'Oh, my dear, it never struck me that you could be.' 
he flung his arms round her and kissed her while she, laughing, blushing, and crying, surrendered herself willingly to his embrace. Presently he released her and, sitting back on his heels, looked at her curiously. "'Well, I'm blowed,' he said. "'Why? I'm so surprised.' "'And pleased?' "'Delighted,' he cried with all his heart, "'and so proud and so happy and so grateful.' He took her hands and covered them with kisses. This was the beginning for Philip of a happiness which seemed both solid and durable. They became lovers, but remained friends. There was in Nora a maternal instinct which received satisfaction in her love for Philip. She wanted someone to pet and scold and make a fuss of. She had a domestic temperament and found pleasure in looking after his health and his linen. She pitied his deformity over which he was so sensitive, and her pity expressed itself instinctively in tenderness. She was young, strong, and healthy, and it seemed quite natural to her to give her love. She had high spirits and a merry soul. She liked Philip because he laughed with her at all the amusing things in life that caught her fancy, and above all she liked him because he was he. When she told him this he answered gaily, "'Nonsense! You like me because I'm a silent person and never want to get a word in.' Philip did not love her at all. He was extremely fond of her, glad to be with her, amused and interested by her conversation. She restored his belief in himself and put healing ointments, as it were, on all the bruises of his soul. He was immensely flattered that she cared for him. He admired her courage, her optimism, her impotent defiance of fate. She had a little philosophy of her own, ingenuous and practical. "'You know, I don't believe in churches and parsons and all that,' she said. "'But I believe in God, and I don't believe He minds much about what you do as long as you keep your end up and help a lame dog over a stile when you can. And I think people on the whole are very nice and I'm sorry for those who aren't. And what about afterwards? asked Philip. Oh, well, I don't know for certain, you know, she smiled, but I hope for the best. And anyhow, there'll be no rent to pay and no novelettes to write. She had a feminine gift for delicate flattery. She thought that Philip did a brave thing when he left Paris because he was conscious he could not be a great artist, and he was enchanted when she expressed enthusiastic admiration for him. He had never been quite certain whether this action indicated courage or infirmity of purpose. It was delightful to realize that she considered it heroic. She ventured to tackle him on a subject which his friends instinctively avoided. "'It's very silly of you to be so sensitive about your club foot,' she said. She saw him blush darkly, but went on. "'You know, people don't think about it nearly as much as you do. They notice it the first time they see you, and then they forget about it. He would not answer. You're not angry with me, are you? No. She put her arm round his neck. You know, I only speak about it because I love you. I don't want it to make you unhappy. I think you can say anything you choose to me, he answered, smiling. I wish I could do something to show you how grateful I am to you. She took him in hand in other ways. She would not let him be bearish and laughed at him when he was out of temper. She made him more urbane. "'You can make me do anything you like,' he said to her once. "'Do you mind?' "'No, I want to do what you like.' He had the sense to realize his happiness. It seemed to him that she gave him all that a wife could, and he preserved his freedom. She was the most charming friend he had ever had, with a sympathy that he had never found in a man. The sexual relationship was no more than the strongest link in their friendship. It completed it, but was not essential. And because Philip's appetites were satisfied, he became more equable and easier to live with. He felt in complete possession of himself. He thought sometimes of the winter during which he had been obsessed by a hideous passion, and he was filled with loathing for Mildred and with horror of himself. His examinations were approaching, and Nora was as interested in them as he. He was flattered and touched by her eagerness. She made him promise to come at once and tell her the results. He passed the three parts this time without mishap. 
and when he went to tell her she burst into tears. "'Oh, I'm so glad. I was so anxious.' "'You silly little thing,' he laughed, but he was choking. No one could help being pleased with the way she took it. "'And what are you going to do now?' she asked. "'I could take a holiday with a clear conscience. I have no work to do till the winter session begins in October.' "'I suppose you'll go down to your uncle's at Blackstable?' "'You suppose quite wrong. I'm going to stay in London and play with you. I'd rather you went away.' "'Why, are you tired of me?' She laughed and put her hands on his shoulders. "'Because you've been working hard, and you look utterly washed out. You want some fresh air and a rest. Please go.' He did not answer for a moment. He looked at her with loving eyes. "'You know, I'd never believe it of anyone but you. You're only thinking of my good. I wonder what you see in me.' "'Will you give me a good character with my month's notice?' she laughed gaily. "'I'll say that you're thoughtful and kind, and you're not exacting. You never worry, you're not troublesome, and you're easy to please.' "'Oh, that's nonsense,' she said. "'But I'll tell you one thing. I'm one of the few persons I ever met who are able to learn from experience.' End of chapter 66 Chapter 67 Philip looked forward to his return to London with impatience. During the two months he spent at Blackstable, Nora wrote to him frequently, long letters in a bold, large hand, in which with cheerful humor she described the little events of the daily round, the domestic troubles of her landlady, rich food for laughter, the comic vexations of her rehearsals. She was walking on in an important spectacle at one of the London theatres, and her odd adventures with the publishers of novelettes. Philip read a great deal, bathed, played tennis, and sailed. At the beginning of October he settled down in London to work for the second conjoint examination. He was eager to pass it, since that ended the drudgery of the curriculum. After it was done with, the student became an outpatient's clerk, and was brought in contact with men and women as well as with textbooks. Philip saw Nora every day. Lawson had been spending the summer at Pool and had a number of sketches to show of the harbor and of the beach. He had a couple of commissions for portraits and proposed to stay in London till the bad light drove him away. Hayward, in London, too, intended to spend the winter abroad, but remained week after week from sheer inability to make up his mind to go. Hayward had run to fat during the last two or three years. It was five years since Philip first met him in Heidelberg, and he was prematurely bald. He was very sensitive about it and wore his hair long to conceal the unsightly patch on the crown of his head. His only consolation was that his brow was now very noble. His blue eyes had lost their color, they had a listless droop, and his mouth, losing the fullness of youth, was weak and pale. He still talked vaguely of the things he was going to do in the future but with less conviction, and he was conscious that his friends no longer believed in him. When he drank two or three glasses of whiskey he was inclined to be elegiac. "'I'm a failure,' he murmured. "'I'm unfit for the brutality of the struggle of life. All I can do is to stand aside and let the vulgar throng hustle by in their pursuit of the good things. He gave you the impression that to fail was a more delicate a more exquisite thing than to succeed. He insinuated that his aloofness was due to distaste for all that was common and low. He talked beautifully of Plato. "'I should have thought you'd got through with Plato by now,' said Philip impatiently. "'Would you?' he asked, raising his eyebrows. He was not inclined to pursue the subject. He had discovered of late the effective dignity of silence. I don't see the use of reading the same thing over and over again, said Philip. That's only a laborious form of idleness. But are you under the impression that you have so great a mind that you can understand the most profound writer at a first reading? I don't want to understand him. I'm not a critic. I'm not interested in him for his sake, but for mine. What do you read, then? Partly for pleasure, because it's a habit, and I'm just as uncomfortable if I don't read as if I don't smoke, and partly to know myself. When I read a book I seem to read it with my eyes only. 
but now and then I come across a passage, perhaps only a phrase, which has a meaning for me, and it becomes part of me. I've got out of the book all that's any use to me, and I can't get anything more if I read it a dozen times. You see, it seems to me one's like a closed bud, and most of what one reads and does has no effect at all. But there are certain things that have a peculiar significance for one, and they open a petal, and the petals open one by one, and at last the flower is there. Philip was not satisfied with his metaphor, but he did not know how else to explain a thing which he felt and yet was not clear about. "'You want to do things, you want to become things,' said Hayward, with a shrug of the shoulders. "'It's so vulgar.' Philip knew Hayward very well by now. He was weak and vain, so vain that you had to be on the watch constantly not to hurt his feelings. He mingled idleness and idealism so that he could not separate them. At Lawson's studio one day he met a journalist who was charmed by his conversation, and a week later the editor of a paper wrote to suggest that he should do some criticism for him. For forty-eight hours Hayward lived in an agony of indecision. He had talked of getting occupation of this sort so long that he had not the face to refuse outright, but the thought of doing anything filled him with panic. At last he declined the offer and breathed freely. It would have interfered with my work, he told Philip. What work? asked Philip brutally. My inner life, he answered. Then he went on to say beautiful things about Emil, the professor of Geneva whose brilliancy promised achievement which was never fulfilled, till at his death the reason of his failure and the excuse were at once manifest in the minute wonderful journal which was found among his papers. Hayward smiled enigmatically but Hayward could still talk delightfully about books. His taste was exquisite and his discrimination elegant, and he had a constant interest in ideas which made him an entertaining companion. They meant nothing to him, really, since they never had any effect on him, but he treated them as he might have pieces of china in an auction room, handling them with pleasure in their shape and their glaze, pricing them in his mind, and then putting them back into their case thought of them no more. And it was Hayward who made a momentous discovery. One evening, after due preparation, he took Philip and Lawson to a tavern situated in Beak Street, remarkable not only in itself and for its history, it had memories of eighteenth-century glories which excited the romantic imagination, but for its snuff, which was the best in London, and above all, for its punch. Hayward led them into a large, long room, dingily magnificent, with huge pictures on the walls of nude women. They were vast allegories of the school of Hayden, but smoke, gas, and the London atmosphere had given them a richness which made them look like old masters. The dark paneling, the massive tarnished gold of the cornice, the mahogany tables, gave the room an air of sumptuous comfort and the leather-covered seats along the wall were soft and easy. There was a ram's head on a table opposite the door, and this contained the celebrated snuff. They ordered punch. They drank it. It was hot rum punch. The pen falters when it attempts to treat of the excellence thereof, the sober vocabulary, the sparse epithet of this narrative are inadequate to the task, and pompous terms, jeweled, exotic phrases rise to the excited fancy. It warmed the blood and cleared the head. It filled the soul with well-being. It disposed the mind at once to utter wit and to appreciate the wit of others. It had the vagueness of music and the precision of mathematics. Only one of its qualities was comparable to anything else. It had the warmth of a good heart, but its taste, its smell, its feel, were not to be described in words. Charles Lamb, with his infinite tact attempting to, might have drawn charming pictures of the life of his day. Lord Byron, in a stanza of Don Juan, aiming at the impossible, might have achieved the sublime. Oscar Wilde, heaping jewels of Ispahan upon brocades of Byzantium, might have created a troubling beauty. Considering it, the mind reeled under visions of the feasts of Elagabalus, 
and the subtle harmonies of Debussy mingled with the musty, fragrant romance of chests in which have been kept old clothes, ruffs, hose, doublets, of a forgotten generation, and the wan odor of lilies of the valley and the savor of cheddar cheese. Hayward discovered the tavern at which this priceless beverage was to be obtained by meeting in the street a man called McAllister, who had been at Cambridge with him. He was a stockbroker and a philosopher. He was accustomed to go to the tavern once a week, and soon Philip, Lawson, and Hayward got into the habit of meeting there every Tuesday evening. Change of manners made it now little frequented, which was an advantage to persons who took pleasure in conversation. McAllister was a big-boned fellow, much too short for his width, with a large, fleshy face and a soft voice. He was a student of Kant and judged everything from the standpoint of pure reason. He was fond of expounding his doctrines. Philip listened with excited interest. He had long come to the conclusion that nothing amused him more than metaphysics, but he was not so sure of their efficacy in the affairs of life. The neat little system which he had formed as the result of his meditations at Blackstable had not been of conspicuous use during his infatuation for Mildred. He could not be positive that reason was much help in the conduct of life. It seemed to him that life lived itself. He remembered very vividly the violence of the emotion which had possessed him and his inability, as if he were tied down to the ground with ropes, to react against it. He read many wise things in books, but he could only judge from his own experience. He did not know whether he was different from other people. He did not calculate the pros and cons of an action, the benefits which must befall him if he did it, the harm which might result from the omission. But his whole being was urged on irresistibly. He did not act with a part of himself, but altogether. The power that possessed him seemed to have nothing to do with reason. All that reason did was to point out the methods of obtaining what his whole soul was striving for. McAllister reminded him of the categorical imperative. Act so that every action of yours shall be capable of becoming a universal rule of action for all men. That seems to me perfect nonsense, said Philip. You're a bold man to say that of anything stated by Immanuel Kant, retorted McAllister. Why? Reverence for what somebody said is a stultifying quality. There's a damn sight too much reverence in the world. Kant thought things not because they were true, but because he was Kant. Well, what is your objection to the categorical imperative? They talk as though the fate of empires were in the balance. It suggests that one can choose one's course by an effort of will, and it suggests that reason is the surest guide. Why should its dictates be any better than those of passion? They're different, that's all. You seem to be a contented slave of your passions. A slave because I can't help myself, but a contented one, laughed Philip. While he spoke he thought of that hot madness which had driven him in pursuit of Mildred. He remembered how he had chaffed against it and how he had felt the degradation of it. Thank God I'm free from all that now, he thought and yet, even as he said it, he was not quite sure whether he spoke sincerely. When he was under the influence of passion he had felt a singular vigor, and his mind had worked with unwanted force. He was more alive, there was an excitement in sheer being, an eager vehemence of soul which made life now a trifle dull. For all the misery he had endured there was a compensation in that sense of rushing, overwhelming existence but Philip's unlucky words engaged him in a discussion on the freedom of the will, and McAllister, with his well-stored memory, brought out argument after argument. He had a mind that delighted in dialectics, and he forced Philip to contradict himself. He pushed him into corners from which he could only escape by damaging concessions. He tripped him up with logic and battered him with authorities. At last Philip said, "'Well, I can't say anything about other people. I can only speak for myself. The illusion of free will is so strong in my mind that I can't get away from it, but I believe it is only an illusion. But it is an illusion which is one of the strongest motives of my actions. 
before I do anything I feel that I have choice, and that influences what I do. But afterwards, when the thing is done, I believe that it was inevitable from all eternity. What do you deduce from that? asked Hayward. Why, merely the futility of regret. It's no good crying over spilt milk, because all the forces of the universe were bent on spilling it. End of chapter 67 Chapter 68 One morning Philip, on getting up, felt his head swim, and going back to bed suddenly discovered he was ill. All his limbs ached and he shivered with cold. When the landlady brought in his breakfast he called to her through the open door that he was not well and asked for a cup of tea and a piece of toast. A few minutes later there was a knock at his door, and Griffiths came in. They had lived in the same house for over a year, but had never done more than nod to one another in the passage. "'I say, I hear your seedy,' said Griffiths. "'I thought I'd come in and see what was the matter with you.' Philip, blushing he knew not why, made light of the whole thing. He would be all right in an hour or two. "'Well, you'd better let me take your temperature,' said Griffiths. "'It's quite unnecessary,' answered Philip irritably. "'Come on.' Philip put the thermometer in his mouth. Griffiths sat down on the side of the bed and chatted brightly for a moment. Then he took it out and looked at it. "'Now, look here, old man, you must stay in bed, and I'll bring old Deacon in to have a look at you.' "'Nonsense,' said Philip. "'There's nothing the matter. I wish you wouldn't bother about me. But it isn't any bother. You've got a temperature, and you must stay in bed.' you will, won't you? There was a peculiar charm in his manner, a mingling of gravity and kindliness which was infinitely attractive. You've got a wonderful bedside manner, Philip murmured, closing his eyes with a smile. Griffiths shook out his pillow for him, deftly smoothed down the bedclothes, and tucked him up. He went into Philip's sitting-room to look for a siphon, could not find one, and fetched it from his own room. He drew down the blind. Now go to sleep, and I'll bring the old man round as soon as he's done the wars. It seemed hours before anyone came to Philip. His head felt as if it would split, anguish rent his limbs, and he was afraid he was going to cry. Then there was a knock at the door, and Griffiths, healthy, strong, and cheerful, came in. Here's Dr. Deacon, he said. The physician stepped forward, an elderly man with a bland manner, whom Philip knew only by sight. A few questions, a brief examination, and the diagnosis. "'What do you make it?' he asked Griffiths, smiling. "'Influenza.' "'Quite right.' Dr. Deacon looked round the dingy lodging-house room. "'Wouldn't you like to go to the hospital? They'll put you in a private ward, and you can be better looked after than you can here.' "'I'd rather stay where I am,' said Philip. He did not want to be disturbed, and he was always shy of new surroundings. He did not fancy nurses fussing about him and the dreary cleanliness of the hospital. "'I can look after him, sir,' said Griffiths at once. "'Oh, very well.' He wrote a prescription, gave instructions, and left. "'Now, you've got to do exactly as I tell you,' said Griffiths. "'I'm day-nurse and night-nurse all in one.' "'It's very kind of you, but I shan't want anything,' said Philip. Griffiths put his hand on Philip's forehead, a large, cool, dry hand, and the touch seemed to him good. I'm just going to take this round to the dispensary to have it made up, and then I'll come back. In a little while he brought the medicine and gave Philip a dose. Then he went upstairs to fetch his books. You won't mind my working in your room this afternoon, will you? he said when he came down. I'll leave the door open so that you can give me a shout if you want anything. Later in the day Philip, awaking from an uneasy doze, heard voices in his sitting room. A friend had come in to see Griffiths. I say, you better not come in tonight, he heard Griffiths saying. And then, a minute or two afterwards, someone else entered the room and expressed his surprise at finding Griffiths there. Philip heard him explain. I'm looking after a second year's man who's got these rooms, the wretched blighters down with influenza. No whist tonight, old man. Presently, Griffiths was left alone, and Philip called him. I say, you're not putting off a party tonight, are you? he asked. Not on your account. I must work at my surgery. Don't put it off. I shall be all right. You needn't bother about me. That's all right. Philip grew worse. As the night came on he became slightly delirious, but towards morning he awoke from a restless sleep. 
he saw Griffiths get out of an armchair, go down on his knees, and with his fingers put piece after piece of coal on the fire. He was in pajamas and a dressing gown. "'What are you doing here?' he asked. "'Did I wake you up? I tried to make up the fire without making a row. Why aren't you in bed? What's the time?' After five, I thought I'd better sit up with you tonight. I brought an armchair in as I thought if I put a mattress down I should sleep so soundly that I shouldn't hear you if you wanted anything. I wish you wouldn't be so good to me, groaned Philip. Suppose you catch it. Then you shall nurse me, old man, said Griffiths with a laugh. In the morning Griffiths drew up the blind. He looked pale and tired after his night's watch, but was full of spirits. Now I'm going to wash you he said to Philip cheerfully. "'I can wash myself,' said Philip ashamed. "'Nonsense. If you were in the small ward a nurse would wash you, and I can do it just as well as a nurse.' Philip, too weak and wretched to resist, allowed Griffiths to wash his hands and face, his feet, his chest, and back. He did it with charming tenderness, carrying on meanwhile a stream of friendly chatter. Then he changed the sheet, just as they did at the hospital, shook out the pillow, and arranged the bedclothes. I should like Sister Arthur to see me. It would make her sit up. Deacon's coming in to see you early. I can't imagine why you should be so good to me, said Philip. It's good practice for me. It's rather lark having a patient. Griffiths gave him his breakfast and went off to get dressed and have something to eat. A few minutes before ten he came back with a bunch of grapes and a few flowers. "'You are awfully kind,' said Philip. He was in bed for five days. Nora and Griffiths nursed him between them. Though Griffiths was the same age as Philip, he adopted towards him a humorous, motherly attitude. He was a thoughtful fellow, gentle and encouraging, but his greatest quality was a vitality which seemed to give health to everyone with whom he came in contact. Philip was unused to the petting which most people enjoy from mothers or sisters, and he was deeply touched by the feminine tenderness of this strong young man. Philip grew better. Then Griffiths, sitting idly in Philip's room, amused him with gay stories of amorous adventure. He was a flirtatious creature, capable of carrying on three or four affairs at a time, and his account of the devices he was forced to in order to keep out of difficulties made excellent hearing. He had a gift for throwing a romantic glamour over everything that happened to him. He was crippled with debts, everything he had of any value was pawned, but he managed always to be cheerful, extravagant, and generous. He was the adventurer by nature. He loved people of doubtful occupations and shifty purposes, and his acquaintance among the riff-raff that frequents the bars of London was enormous. Loose women, treating him as a friend, told him the troubles, difficulties, and successes of their lives, and card-sharpers, respecting his impecuniosity, stood him dinners and lent him five-pound notes. He was ploughed in his examinations time after time, but he bore this cheerfully and submitted with such a charming grace to the parental expostulations that his father, a doctor in practice at Leeds, had not the heart to be seriously angry with him. I'm an awful fool at books, he said cheerfully, but I can't work. Life was much too jolly, but it was clear that when he had got through the exuberance of his youth and was at last qualified he would be a tremendous success in practice. He would cure people by the sheer charm of his manner. Philip worshipped him as at school he had worshipped boys who were tall and straight and high of spirits. By the time he was well they were fast friends and it was a peculiar satisfaction to Philip that Griffiths seemed to enjoy sitting in his little parlour, wasting Philip's time with his amusing chatter, and smoking innumerable cigarettes. Philip took him sometimes to the tavern off Regent Street. Hayward found him stupid, but Lawson recognised his charm and was eager to paint him. He was a picturesque figure with his blue eyes, white skin, and curly hair. Often they discussed things he knew nothing about, and then he sat quietly with a good-natured smile on his handsome face, feeling quite rightly that his presence was sufficient contribution to the entertainment of the company. When he discovered that McAllister was a stockbroker, he was eager for tips, and McAllister, with his grave smile, 
told him what fortunes he could have made if he had bought certain stock at certain times. It made Philip's mouth water, for in one way and another he was spending more than he had expected, and it would have suited him very well to make a little money by the easy method McAllister suggested. "'Next time I hear of a really good thing I'll let you know,' said the stockbroker. "'They do come along sometimes. It's only a matter of biding one's time.' Philip could not help thinking how delightful it would be to make fifty pounds, so that he could give Nora the furs she so badly needed for the winter. He looked at the shops in Regent Street and picked out the articles he could buy for the money. She deserved everything. She made his life very happy. End of chapter 68 Chapter 69 one afternoon, when he went back to his rooms from the hospital to wash and tidy himself before going to tea as usual with Nora, as he let himself in with his latch-key, his landlady opened the door for him. "'There's a lady waiting to see you,' she said. "'Me?' exclaimed Philip. He was surprised. It would only be Nora, and he had no idea what had brought her. I shouldn't have let her in, only she's been three times.' and she seemed that upset at not finding you, so I told her she could wait. He pushed past the explaining landlady and burst into the room. His heart turned sick. It was Mildred. She was sitting down, but got up hurriedly as he came in. She did not move towards him nor speak. He was so surprised that he did not know what he was saying. "'What the hell do you want?' he asked. She did not answer, but began to cry. She did not put her hands to her eyes, but kept them hanging by the side of her body. She looked like a housemaid applying for a situation. There was a dreadful humility in her bearing. Philip did not know what feelings came over him. He had a sudden impulse to turn round and escape from the room. "'I didn't think I'd ever see you again,' he said at last. "'I wish I was dead,' she moaned. Philip left her standing where she was. He could only think at the moment of steadying himself. His knees were shaking. He looked at her, and he groaned in despair. "'What's the matter?' he said. "'He's left me. Emil. Philip's heart bounded. He knew then that he loved her as passionately as ever. He had never ceased to love her. She was standing before him humble and unresisting. He wished to take her in his arms and cover her tear-stained face with kisses. Oh, how long the separation had been! He did not know how he could have endured it. You'd better sit down. Let me give you a drink. He drew the chair near the fire, and she sat in it. He mixed her whiskey and soda, and sobbing still, she drank it. She looked at him with great mournful eyes. There were large black lines under them. She was thinner and whiter than when last he had seen her. I wish I'd married you when you asked me," she said. Philip did not know why the remark seemed to swell his heart. He could not keep the distance from her which he had forced upon himself. He put his hand on her shoulder. "'I'm awfully sorry you're in trouble.' She leaned her head against his bosom and burst into hysterical crying. Her hat was in the way and she took it off. He had never dreamt that she was capable of crying like that. He kissed her again and again. It seemed to ease her a little. "'You were always good to me, Philip,' she said. "'That's why I knew I could come to you. Tell me what's happened.' "'Oh, I can't, I can't,' she cried out, breaking away from him. He sank down on his knees beside her and put his cheek against hers. "'Don't you know that there's nothing you can't tell me? I can never blame you for anything.' She told him the story little by little and sometimes she sobbed so much that he could hardly understand. Last Monday we went up to Birmingham, and he promised to be back on Thursday, and he never came, and he didn't come on the Friday, so I wrote to ask what was the matter, and he never answered the letter, and I wrote and said that if I didn't hear from him by return I'd go up to Birmingham, and this morning I got a solicitor's letter to say I had no claim on him and if I molested him he'd seek the protection of the law. "'But that's absurd,' cried Philip. "'A man can't treat his wife like that. Had you had a row?' "'Oh, yes, we'd had a quarrel on the Sunday, and he said he was sick of me, 
but he'd said it before and he'd come back all right. I didn't think he meant it. He was frightened because I told him a baby was coming. I kept it from him as long as I could. Then I had to tell him. He said it was my fault, and I ought to have known better. If you'd only heard the things he said to me! But I found out, precious quick, that he wasn't a gentleman. He left me without a penny. He hadn't paid the rent, and I hadn't got the money to pay it, and the woman who kept the house said such things to me. Well, I might have been a thief the way she talked. I thought you were going to take a flat. That's what he said. But we just took furnished apartments in Highbury. He was that mean. He said I was extravagant. He didn't give me anything to be extravagant with. She had an extraordinary way of mixing the trivial with the important. Philip was puzzled. The whole thing was incomprehensible. No man could be such a blackguard. You don't know him. I wouldn't go back to him now, not if he was to come and ask me on his bended knees. I was a fool ever to think of him. And he wasn't earning the money he said he was. The lies he told me. Philip thought for a minute or two. He was so deeply moved by her distress that he could not think of himself. Would you like me to go to Birmingham? I could see him and try to make things up. Oh, there's no chance of that. He'll never come back now. I know him. But he must provide for you. He can't get out of that. I don't know anything about these things. You better go and see a solicitor. How can I? I haven't got the money. I'll pay all that. I'll write a note to my own solicitor, the sportsman who was my father's executor. Would you like me to come with you now? I expect he'll still be at his office. No, give me a letter to him. I'll go alone. She was a little calmer now. He sat down and wrote a note. Then he remembered that she had no money. He had fortunately changed a check the day before and was able to give her five pounds. "'You are good to me, Philip,' she said. "'I'm so happy to be able to do something for you. Are you fond of me still?' "'Just as fond as ever.' She put up her lips and he kissed her. There was a surrender in the action which he had never seen in her before. It was worth all the agony he had suffered. She went away and he found that she had been there for two hours. He was extraordinarily happy. Poor thing, poor thing, he murmured to himself, his heart glowing with a greater love than he had ever felt before. He never thought of Nora at all till about eight o'clock a telegram came. He knew before opening it that it was from her. Is anything the matter? Nora. He did not know what to do nor what to answer. He could fetch her after the play in which she was walking on, was over, and stroll home with her as he sometimes did, but his whole soul revolted against the idea of seeing her that evening. He thought of writing to her, but he could not bring himself to address her as usual, dearest Nora. He made up his mind to telegraph. Sorry, could not get away. Philip. He visualized her. He was slightly repelled by the ugly little face with its high cheekbones and the crude color. There was a coarseness in her skin which gave him goose flesh. He knew that his telegram must be followed by some action on his part, but at all events it postponed it. Next day he wired again. Regret unable to come. Will write. Mildred has suggested coming at four in the afternoon and he would not tell her that the hour was inconvenient. After all, she came first. He waited for her impatiently. He watched for her at the window and opened the front door himself. Well, did you see Nixon? Yes, she answered. He said it wasn't any good. Nothing's to be done. I must just grin and bear it. But that's impossible, cried Philip. She sat down wearily. Did he give you any reasons? he asked. She gave him a crumpled letter. There's your letter, Philip. I never took it. I couldn't tell you yesterday. I really couldn't. Emil didn't marry me. He couldn't. He had a wife already and three children. Philip felt a sudden pang of jealousy and anguish. It was almost more than he could bear. That's why I couldn't go back to my aunt. There's no one I can go to but you. What made you go away with him? Philip asked in a low voice which he struggled to make firm. I don't know. 
I didn't know he was a married man at first, and when he told me I gave him a piece of my mind, and then I didn't see him for months, and when he came to the shop again and asked me I don't know what came over me, I felt as if I couldn't help it. I had to go with him. Were you in love with him? I don't know. I couldn't hardly help laughing at the things he said, and there was something about him. He said I'd never regret it. He promised to give me seven pounds a week. He said he was earning fifteen, and it was all a lie. He wasn't. And then I was sick of going to the shop every morning, and I wasn't getting on very well with my aunt. She wanted to treat me as a servant instead of a relation, said I ought to do my own room, and if I didn't do it nobody was going to do it for me. Oh, I wish I hadn't. But when he came to the shop and asked me, I felt I couldn't help it. Philip moved away from her. He sat down at the table and buried his face in his hands. He felt dreadfully humiliated. "'You're not angry with me, Philip?' she asked piteously. "'No,' he answered, looking up but away from her. "'Only I'm awfully hurt.' "'Why?' "'You see, I was so dreadfully in love with you. I did everything I could to make you care for me. I thought you were incapable of loving anyone. It's so horrible to know that you were willing to sacrifice everything for that bounder. I wonder what you saw in him. I'm awfully sorry, Philip. I regretted it bitterly afterwards. I promise you that. He thought of Emil Miller, with his pasty, unhealthy look, his shifty blue eyes, and the vulgar smartness of his appearance. He always wore bright red knitted waistcoats. Philip sighed. She got up and went to him. She put her arm round his neck. I shall never forget that you offered to marry me, Philip. He took her hand and looked up at her. She bent down and kissed him. Philip, if you want me still, I'll do anything you like now. I know you're a gentleman in every sense of the word. His heart stood still. Her words made him feel slightly sick. It's awfully good of you, but I couldn't. Don't you care for me any more? Yes, I love you with all my heart. Then why shouldn't we have a good time while we've got the chance? You see, it can't matter now. He released himself from her. You don't understand. I've been sick with love for you ever since I saw you. But now, that man. I've unfortunately got a vivid imagination. The thought of it simply disgusts me. You are funny, she said. He took her hand again and smiled at her. You mustn't think I'm not grateful. I can never thank you enough, but you see, it's just stronger than I am. You are a good friend, Philip. They went on talking, and soon they had returned to the familiar companionship of old days. It grew late. Philip suggested that they should dine together and go to a music hall. She wanted some persuasion, for she had an idea of acting up to her situation, and felt instinctively that it did not accord with her distressed condition to go to a place of entertainment. At last Philip asked her to go simply to please him, and when she could look upon it as an act of self-sacrifice, she accepted. She had a new thoughtfulness which delighted Philip. She asked him to take her to the little restaurant in Soho to which they had so often been. He was infinitely grateful to her, because her suggestion showed that happy memories were attached to it. She grew much more cheerful as dinner proceeded. The burgundy from the public house at the corner warmed her heart, and she forgot that she ought to preserve a dolorous countenance. Philip thought it safe to speak to her of the future. "'I suppose you haven't got a brass farthing, have you?' he asked, when an opportunity presented itself. Only what you gave me yesterday, and I had to give the landlady three pounds of that. Well, I'd better give you a tenner to go on with. I'll go and see my solicitor and get him to write to Miller. We can make him pay up something, I'm sure. If we can get a hundred pounds out of him, it'll carry you on till after the baby comes. I won't take a penny from him. I'd rather starve. But it's monstrous that he should leave you in the lurch like this. I've got my pride to consider. It was a little awkward for Philip. 
he needed rigid economy to make his own money last till he was qualified, and he must have something over to keep him during the year he intended to spend as house physician and house surgeon either at his own or at some other hospital. But Mildred had told him various stories of Emil's meanness, and he was afraid to remonstrate with her in case she accused him too of want of generosity. "'I won't take a penny piece from him. I'd sooner beg my bread. I'd have seen about getting some work to do long before now. Only it wouldn't be good for me in the state I'm in. You have to think of your health, don't you?' "'You needn't bother about the present,' said Philip. "'I can let you have all you want till you're fit to work again. I knew I could depend on you. I told Emil he didn't think I hadn't got somebody to go to. I told him you was a gentleman in every sense of the word. By degrees Philip learned how the separation had come about. It appeared that the fellow's wife had discovered the adventure he was engaged in during his periodical visits to London, and had gone to the head of the firm that employed him. She threatened to divorce him, and they announced that they would dismiss him if she did. He was passionately devoted to his children and could not bear the thought of being separated from them. When he had to choose between his wife and his mistress, he chose his wife. He had always been anxious that there should be no child to make the entanglement more complicated, and when Mildred, unable longer to conceal its approach, informed him of the fact, he was seized with panic. He picked a quarrel and left her without more ado. "'When do you expect to be confined?' asked Philip. "'At the beginning of March. Three months. It was necessary to discuss plans. Mildred declared she would not remain in the rooms at Highbury, and Philip thought it more convenient, too, that she should be nearer to him. He promised to look for something next day. She suggested the Vauxhall Bridge Road as a likely neighborhood and it would be near for afterwards, she said. What do you mean? Well, I should only be able to stay there about two months, or a little more, and then I should have to go into a house. I know a very respectable place, where they have a most superior class of people, and they take for four guineas a week and no extras. Of course the doctor's extra, but that's all. A friend of mine went there, and the lady who keeps it is a thorough lady." I mean to tell her that my husband's an officer in India, and I've come to London for my baby because it's better for my health. It seemed extraordinary to Philip to hear her talking in this way. With her delicate little features and her pale face she looked cold and maidenly. When he thought of the passions that burnt within her, so unexpected, his heart was strangely troubled. His pulse beat quick. End of chapter 69. Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapters 70 through 73 of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan Chapter 70 Philip expected to find a letter from Nora when he got back to his rooms, but there was nothing. Nor did he receive one the following morning. The silence irritated and at the same time alarmed him. They had seen one another every day he had been in London since the previous June and it must seem odd to her that he should let two days go by without visiting her or offering a reason for his absence. He wondered whether by an unlucky chance she had seen him with Mildred. He could not bear to think that she was hurt or unhappy, and he made up his mind to call on her that afternoon. He was almost inclined to reproach her because he had allowed himself to get on such intimate terms with her. The thought of continuing them filled him with disgust. He found two rooms for Mildred on the second floor of a house in the Vauxhall Bridge Road. They were noisy, but he knew that she liked the rattle of traffic under her windows. "'I don't like a dead and a live street where you don't see a soul pass all day,' she said. "'Give me a bit of life.' Then he forced himself to go to Vincent Square. He was sick with apprehension when he rang the bell. He had an uneasy sense that he was treating Nora badly. 
he dreaded reproaches. He knew she had a quick temper and he hated scenes. Perhaps the best way would be to tell her, frankly, that Mildred had come back to him and his love for her was as violent as it had ever been. He was very sorry, but he had nothing to offer Nora any more. Then he thought of her anguish, for he knew she loved him. It had flattered him before, and he was immensely grateful. But now it was horrible. She had not deserved that he should inflict pain upon her. He asked himself how she would greet him now, and as he walked up the stairs all possible forms of her behavior flashed across his mind. He knocked at the door. He felt that he was pale and wondered how to conceal his nervousness. She was writing away industriously, but she sprang to her feet as he entered. "'I recognized your step,' she cried. "'Where have you been hiding yourself, you naughty boy?' She came towards him joyfully and put her arms round his neck. She was delighted to see him. He kissed her and then, to give himself countenance, said he was dying for tea. She bustled the fire to make the kettle boil. "'I've been awfully busy,' he said lamely. She began to chatter in her bright way, telling him of a new commission she had to provide a novelette for a firm which had not hitherto employed her. She was to get fifteen guineas for it. "'It's money from the clouds. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll stand ourselves a little jaunt. Let's go and spend a day at Oxford, shall we? I'd love to see the colleges.' He looked at her to see whether there was any shadow of reproach in her eyes, but they were as frank and merry as ever. She was overjoyed to see him. His heart sank. He could not tell her the brutal truth. She made some toast for him and cut it into little pieces and gave it him as though he were a child. "'Is the brute fed?' she asked. He nodded, smiling, and she lit a cigarette for him. Then, as she loved to do, she came and sat on his knees. She was very light. She leaned back in his arms with a sigh of delicious happiness. "'Say something nice to me,' she murmured. "'What shall I say?' "'You might, by an effort of imagination, say that you rather liked me. You know I do that.' He had not the heart to tell her then. He would give her peace at all events for that day, and perhaps he might write to her. That would be easier. He could not bear to think of her crying. She made him kiss her, and as he kissed her he thought of Mildred and Mildred's pale, thin lips. The recollection of Mildred remained with him all the time like an incorporated form, but more substantial than a shadow, and the sight continually distracted his attention. "'You were very quiet today,' Nora said. Her loquacity was a standing joke between them, and he answered, "'You never let me get a word in, and I've got out of the habit of talking. But you're not listening, and that's bad manners.' He reddened a little, wondering whether she had some inkling of his secret. He turned away his eyes uneasily. The weight of her irked him this afternoon, and he did not want her to touch him. "'My foot's gone to sleep,' he said. "'I'm so sorry,' she cried, jumping up. "'I shall have to bant if I can't break myself of this habit of sitting on gentlemen's knees.' He went through an elaborate form of stamping his foot and walking about. Then he stood in front of the fire so that she should not resume her position. While she talked he thought that she was worth ten of Mildred. She amused him much more and was jollier to talk to. She was cleverer, and she had a much nicer nature. She was a good, brave, honest little woman, and Mildred, he thought bitterly, deserved none of these epithets. If he had any sense he would stick to Nora, she would make him much happier than he would ever be with Mildred. After all, she loved him and Mildred was only grateful for his help. But when all was said, the important thing was to love rather than to be loved, and he yearned for Mildred with his whole soul. He would sooner have ten minutes with her than a whole afternoon with Nora. He prized one kiss of her cold lips more than all Nora could give him. "'I can't help myself,' he thought. "'I've just got her in my bones.' He did not care if she was heartless, vicious, and vulgar stupid and grasping. He loved her. He would rather have misery with the one than happiness with the other. When he got up to go, Nora said casually, "'Well, I shall see you tomorrow, shan't I?' "'Yes,' he answered. He knew that he would not be able to come since he was going to help Mildred with her moving, but he had not the courage to say so. 
he made up his mind that he would send a wire. Mildred saw the rooms in the morning, was satisfied with them, and after luncheon Philip went up with her to Highbury. She had a trunk for her clothes and another for the various odds and ends, cushions, lampshades, photograph frames, with which she had tried to give the apartments a homelike air. She had two or three large cardboard boxes besides, but in all there was no more than could be put on the roof of a four-wheeler. As they drove through Victoria Street, Philip sat well back in the cab in case Nora should happen to be passing. He had not had an opportunity to telegraph and could not do so from the post office in the Vauxhall Bridge Road, since she would wonder what he was doing in the neighborhood, and if he was there he could have no excuse for not going into the neighboring square where she lived. He made up his mind that he had better go in and see her for half an hour. But the necessity irritated him. He was angry with Nora because she forced him to vulgar and degrading shifts. But he was happy to be with Mildred. It amused him to help her with the unpacking, and he experienced a charming sense of possession in installing her in these lodgings which he had found and was paying for. He would not let her exert herself. It was a pleasure to do things for her, and she had no desire to do what somebody else seemed desirous to do for her. He unpacked her clothes and put them away. She was not proposing to go out again, so he got her slippers and took off her boots. It delighted him to perform menial offices. "'You do spoil me,' she said, running her fingers affectionately through his hair while he was on his knees unbuttoning her boots. He took her hands and kissed them. It is nipping to have you here. He arranged the cushions and the photograph frames. She had several jars of green earthenware. I'll get you some flowers for them, he said. He looked round at his work proudly. As I'm not going out any more, I think I'll get into a tea gown, she said. Undo me behind, will you? She turned round as unconcernedly as though he were a woman. His sex meant nothing to her but his heart was filled with gratitude for the intimacy her request showed. He undid the hooks and eyes with clumsy fingers. "'That first day I came into the shop I never thought I'd be doing this for you now,' he said, with a laugh which he forced. "'Somebody must do it,' she answered. She went into the bedroom and slipped into a pale blue tea-gown decorated with a great deal of cheap lace. Then Philip settled her on a sofa and made tea for her. I'm afraid I can't stay and have it with you, he said regretfully. I've got a beastly appointment, but I shall be back in half an hour. He wondered what he should say if she asked him what the appointment was, but she showed no curiosity. He had ordered dinner for the two of them when he took the rooms and proposed to spend the evening with her quietly. He was in such a hurry to get back that he took a tram along the Vauxhall Bridge Road. He thought he had better break the fact to Nora at once that he could not stay more than a few minutes. "'I say, I've got only just time to say how do you do,' he said, as soon as he got into her rooms. "'I'm frightfully busy.' Her face fell. "'Why, what's the matter?' It exasperated him that she should force him to tell lies, and he knew that he reddened when he answered that there was a demonstration at the hospital which he was bound to go to. He fancied that she looked as though she did not believe him, and this irritated him all the more. "'Oh, well, it doesn't matter,' she said. "'I shall have you all to-morrow.' He looked at her blankly. It was Sunday, and he had been looking forward to spending the day with Mildred. He told himself that he must do that in common decency. He could not leave her by herself in a strange house. "'I'm awfully sorry. I'm engaged to-morrow.' He knew this was the beginning of a scene which he would have given anything to avoid. The color on Nora's cheeks grew brighter. "'But I've asked the Gordons to lunch.' They were an actor and his wife who were touring the provinces and in London for Sunday. "'I told you about it a week ago.' "'I'm awfully sorry. I forgot,' he hesitated. "'I'm afraid I can't possibly come. Isn't there somebody else you can get?' "'What are you doing tomorrow, then? I wish you wouldn't cross-examine me.' don't you want to tell me? I don't in the least mind telling you, but it's rather annoying to be forced to account for all one's movements. Nora suddenly changed. With an effort of self-control she got the better of her temper, and going up to him took his hands. 
don't disappoint me to-morrow, Philip. I've been looking forward so much to spending the day with you. The Gordons want to see you, and we'll have such a jolly time. I'd love to, if I could. I'm not very exacting, am I? I don't often ask you to do something that's a bother. Won't you get out of your horrid engagement just this once? I'm awfully sorry. I don't see how I can, he replied sullenly. Tell me what it is, she said coaxingly. He had had time to invent something. Griffith's two sisters are up for the weekend, and we're taking them out. Is that all? she said joyfully. Griffiths can so easily get another man. He wished he had thought of something more urgent than that. It was a clumsy lie. No, I'm awfully sorry. I can't. I've promised, and I mean to keep my promise. But you promised me, too. Surely I come first. I wish you wouldn't persist, he said. She flared up. You won't come because you don't want to. I don't know what you've been doing the last few days. You've been quite different. He looked at his watch. I'm afraid I'll have to be going, he said. You won't come tomorrow? No. In that case you needn't trouble to come again, she cried, losing her temper for good. That's just as you like, he answered. Don't let me detain you any longer, she added ironically. He shrugged his shoulders and walked out. He was relieved that it had gone no worse. There had been no tears. As he walked along he congratulated himself on getting out of the affair so easily. He went into Victoria Street and bought a few flowers to take in to Mildred. The little dinner was a great success. Philip had sent in a small pot of caviar, which he knew she was very fond of, and the landlady brought them up some cutlets with vegetables and a sweet. Philip had ordered burgundy, which was her favorite wine. With the curtains drawn, a bright fire, and one of Mildred's shades on the lamp, the room was cozy. "'It's really just like home,' smiled Philip. "'I might be worse off, mind I,' she answered. When they finished, Philip drew two armchairs in front of the fire, and they sat down. He smoked his pipe comfortably. He felt happy and generous. "'What would you like to do tomorrow? he asked. "'Oh, I'm going to Tulse Hill. You remember the manageress at the shop? Well, she's married now, and she's asked me to go and spend the day with her. Of course she thinks I'm married, too.' Philip's heart sank but I refused an invitation so that I might spend Sunday with you. He thought that if she loved him she would say that in that case she would stay with him. He knew very well that Nora would not have hesitated. Well, you were a little silly to do that. I promised to go for three weeks and more. But how can you go alone? Oh, I shall say that Emil's away on business. Her husband's in the glove trade, and he's a very superior fellow. Philip was silent, and bitter feelings passed through his heart. She gave him a sidelong glance. "'You don't grudge me a little pleasure, Philip. You see, it's the last time I shall be able to go anywhere for I don't know how long, and I had promised.' He took her hand and smiled. "'No, darling, I want you to have the best time you can. I only want you to be happy.' There was a little book bound in blue paper lying open, face downwards, on the sofa, and Philip idly took it up. It was a two-penny novelette, and the author was Courtney Paget. That was the name under which Nora wrote. "'I do like his books,' said Mildred. "'I read them all. They're so refined.' He remembered what Nora had said of herself. "'I have an immense popularity among kitchen-maids. They think me so genteel.' End of chapter 70 Chapter 71 Philip in return for Griffith's confidences, had told him the details of his own complicated amours, and on Sunday morning, after breakfast, when they sat by the fire in their dressing-gowns and smoked, he recounted the scene of the previous day. Griffiths congratulated him because he had got out of his difficulties so easily. "'It's the simplest thing in the world to have an affair with a woman,' he remarked sententiously, "'but it's a devil of a nuisance to get out of it.' Philip felt a little inclined to pat himself on the back for his skill in managing the business. At all events he was immensely relieved. He thought of Mildred enjoying herself in Tulse Hill, and he found in himself a real satisfaction because she was happy. 
it was an act of self-sacrifice on his part that he did not grudge her pleasure even though paid for by his own disappointment and it filled his heart with a comfortable glow but on monday morning he found on his table a letter from nora she wrote dearest i'm sorry i was cross on saturday forgive me and come to tea in the afternoon as usual i love you your nora his heart sank and he did not know what to do he took the note to griffiths and showed it to him you'd better leave it unanswered said he oh i can't cried philip i should be miserable if i thought of her waiting and waiting you don't know what it is to be sick for the postman's knock i do and i can't expose anybody else to that torture my dear fellow you can't break that sort of affair off without somebody suffering you must just set your teeth to that one thing is it doesn't last very long philip felt that nora had not deserved that he should make her suffer and what did griffiths know about the degrees of anguish she was capable of he remembered his own pain when mildred had told him she was going to be married he did not want anyone to experience what he had experienced then if you're so anxious not to give her pain go back to her said griffiths i can't do that he got up and walked up and down the room nervously he was angry with Nora because she had not let the matter rest. She must have seen that he had no more love to give her. They said women were so quick at seeing those things. "'You might help me,' he said to Griffiths. "'My dear fellow, don't make such a fuss about it. People do get over these things, you know. She probably isn't so wrapped up in you as you think, either. One's always rather apt to exaggerate the passion one's inspired other people with. He paused and looked at Philip with amusement. "'Look here. There's only one thing you can do. Write to her and tell her the thing's over. Put it so that there can be no mistake about it. It'll hurt her, but it'll hurt her less if you do the thing brutally than if you try half-hearted ways.' Philip sat down and wrote the following letter. "'My dear Nora, I am sorry to make you unhappy, but I think we had better let things remain where we left them on Saturday.' I don't think there's any use in letting these things drag on when they cease to be amusing. You told me to go, and I went. I do not propose to come back. Goodbye, Philip Carey. He showed the letter to Griffiths and asked him what he thought of it. Griffiths read it and looked at Philip with twinkling eyes. He did not say what he felt. I think that'll do the trick, he said. Philip went out and posted it. He passed an uncomfortable morning, for he imagined with great detail what Nora would feel when she received his letter. He tortured himself with the thought of her tears, but at the same time he was relieved. Imagined grief was more easy to bear than grief seen, and he was free now to love Mildred with all his soul. His heart leaped at the thought of going to see her that afternoon when his day's work at the hospital was over. When, as usual, he went back to his rooms to tidy himself, he had no sooner put the latch-key in his door than he heard a voice behind him. "'May I come in? I've been waiting for you for half an hour.' It was Nora. He felt himself blush to the roots of his hair. She spoke gaily. There was no trace of resentment in her voice, and nothing to indicate that there was a rupture between them. He felt himself cornered. He was sick with fear, but he did his best to smile. "'Yes, do,' he said. He opened the door, and she preceded him into his sitting-room. He was nervous and, to give himself countenance, offered her a cigarette and lit one for himself. She looked at him brightly. "'Why did you write me such a horrid letter, you naughty boy? If I'd taken it seriously it would have made me perfectly wretched.' "'It was meant seriously,' he answered gravely. "'Don't be so silly. I lost my temper the other day.' and I wrote and apologized. You weren't satisfied, so I've come here to apologize again. After all, you're your own master, and I have no claims upon you. I don't want you to do anything you don't want to. She got up from the chair in which she was sitting and went towards him impulsively with outstretched hands. Let's make friends again, Philip. I'm so sorry if I offended you. He could not prevent her from taking his hands, but he could not look at her. "'I'm afraid it's too late,' he said. She let herself down on the floor by his side and clasped his knees. "'Philip, don't be silly. 
I'm quick-tempered, too, and I can understand that I hurt you, but it's so stupid to sulk over it. What's the good of making us both unhappy? It's been so jolly, our friendship. She passed her fingers slowly over his hand. I love you, Philip. He got up, disengaging himself from her, and went to the other side of the room. I'm awfully sorry. I can't do anything. The whole thing's over. Do you mean to say you don't love me any more? I'm afraid so. You were just looking for an opportunity to throw me over, and you took that one? He did not answer. She looked at him steadily for a time which seemed intolerable. She was sitting on the floor where he had left her, leaning against the armchair. She began to cry, quite silently, without trying to hide her face, and the large tears rolled down her cheeks one after the other. She did not sob. It was horribly painful to see her. Philip turned away. "'I'm awfully sorry to hurt you. It's not my fault if I don't love you.' She did not answer. She merely sat there as though she were overwhelmed, and the tears flowed down her cheeks. It would have been easier to bear if she had reproached him. He had thought her temper would get the better of her, and he was prepared for that. At the back of his mind was a feeling that a real quarrel, in which each said to the other cruel things, would in some way be a justification for his behavior. The time passed. At last he grew frightened by her silent crying. He went into his bedroom and got a glass of water. He leaned over her. "'Won't you drink a little? It'll relieve you.' She put her lips listlessly to the glass and drank two or three mouthfuls. Then, in an exhausted whisper, she asked him for a handkerchief. She dried her eyes. "'Of course I knew you never loved me as much as I loved you,' she moaned. I'm afraid that's always the case, he said. There's always one who loves and one who lets himself be loved. He thought of Mildred and a bitter pain traversed his heart. Nora did not answer for a long time. I'd been so miserably unhappy and my life was so hateful, she said at last. She did not speak to him but to herself. He had never heard her before complain of the life she had led with her husband or of her poverty. He had always admired the bold front she displayed to the world. And then you came along, and you were so good to me. And I admired you because you were clever, and it was so heavenly to have someone I could put my trust in. I loved you. I never thought it could come to an end, and without any fault of mine at all. Her tears began to flow again, but now she was more mistress of herself, and she hid her face in Philip's handkerchief. She tried hard to control herself. "'Give me some more water,' she said. She wiped her eyes. "'I'm sorry to make such a fool of myself. I was so unprepared.' "'I'm awfully sorry, Nora. I want you to know that I'm very grateful for all you've done for me.' He wondered what it was she saw in him. "'Oh, it's always the same,' she sighed. "'If you want men to behave well to you, you must be beastly to them.' If you treat them decently, they make you suffer for it. She got up from the floor and said she must go. She gave Philip a long, steady look. Then she sighed. It's so inexplicable. What does it all mean? Philip took a sudden determination. I think I'd better tell you. I don't want you to think too badly of me. I want you to see that I can't help myself. Mildred's come back. The color came to her face. Why didn't you tell me at once? I deserved that, surely. I was afraid to. She looked at herself in the glass and set her hat straight. Will you call me a cab, she said. I don't feel I can walk. He went to the door and stopped a passing hansom. But when she followed him into the street, he was startled to see how white she was. There was a heaviness in her movements as though she had suddenly grown older. She looked so ill that he had not the heart to let her go alone. I'll drive back with you if you don't mind. She did not answer, and he got into the cab. They drove along in silence over the bridge, through shabby streets in which children with shrill cries played in the road. When they arrived at her door she did not immediately get out. It seemed as though she could not summon enough strength to her legs to move. I hope you'll forgive me, Nora, he said. She turned her eyes towards him, 
and he saw that they were bright again with tears, but she forced a smile to her lips. "'Poor fellow, you're quite worried about me. You mustn't bother. I don't blame you. I shall get over it all right.' Lightly and quickly she stroked his face to show him that she bore no ill-feeling, the gesture was scarcely more than suggested. Then she jumped out of the cab and let herself into her house. Philip paid the hansom and walked to Mildred's lodging. There was a curious heaviness in his heart. He was inclined to reproach himself. But why? He did not know what else he could have done. Passing a fruitier's, he remembered that Mildred was fond of grapes. He was so grateful that he could show his love for her by recollecting every whim she had. End of chapter 71 Chapter 72 For the next three months Philip went every day to see Mildred. He took his books with him and after tea worked while Mildred lay on the sofa reading novels. Sometimes he would look up and watch her for a minute. A happy smile crossed his lips. She would feel his eyes upon her. "'Don't waste your time looking at me, silly. Go on with your work,' she said. "'Tyrant,' he answered gaily. He put aside his book when the landlady came in to lay the cloth for dinner, and in his high spirits he exchanged chaff with her. She was a little cockney of middle age with an amusing humor and a quick tongue. Mildred had become great friends with her and had given her an elaborate but mendacious account of the circumstances which had brought her to the pass she was in. The good-hearted little woman was touched and found no trouble too great to make Mildred comfortable. Mildred's sense of propriety had suggested that Philip should pass himself off as her brother. They dined together and Philip was delighted when he had ordered something which tempted Mildred's capricious appetite. It enchanted him to see her sitting opposite him, and every now and then, from sheer joy, he took her hand and pressed it. After dinner she sat in the armchair by the fire, and he settled himself down on the floor beside her, leaning against her knees, and smoked. Often they did not talk at all, and sometimes Philip noticed that she had fallen into a doze. He dared not move then in case he woke her, and he sat very quietly looking lazily into the fire and enjoying his happiness. "'Had a nice little nap?' he smiled, when she woke. "'I've not been sleeping,' she answered. "'I only just closed my eyes.' She would never acknowledge that she had been asleep. She had a phlegmatic temperament and her condition did not seriously inconvenience her. She took a lot of trouble about her health and accepted the advice of anyone who chose to offer it. She went for a constitutional every morning that it was fine and remained out a definite time. When it was not too cold she sat in St. James Park, but the rest of the day she spent quite happily on her sofa reading one novel after another or chatting with the landlady. She had an inexhaustible interest in gossip, and told Philip with abundant detail the history of the landlady, of the lodgers on the drawing-room floor, and of the people who lived in the next house on either side. Now and then she was seized with panic. She poured out her fears to Philip about the pain of the confinement, and was in terror lest she should die. She gave a full account of the confinements of the landlady and of the lady on the drawing-room floor. Mildred did not know her. I'm one to keep myself to myself, she said. I'm not one to go about with anybody. And she narrated details with a queer mixture of horror and gusto. But for the most part she looked forward to the occurrence with equanimity. After all, I'm not the first one to have a baby, am I? And the doctor says I shan't have any trouble. You see, it isn't as if I wasn't well made. Mrs. Owen, the owner of the house she was going to when her time came, had recommended a doctor, and Mildred saw him once a week. He was to charge fifteen guineas. Of course I could have got it done cheaper, but Mrs. Owen strongly recommended him, and I thought it wasn't worth while to spoil the ship for a coat of tar. "'If you feel happy and comfortable, I don't mind a bit about the expense,' said Philip. She accepted all that Philip did for her as if it were the most natural thing in the world, and on his side he loved to spend money on her. Each five-pound note he gave her caused him a little thrill of happiness and pride. He gave her a good many, for she was not economical. "'I don't know where the money goes to,' she said herself. "'It seems to slip through my fingers like water.' 
"'It doesn't matter,' said Philip. "'I'm so glad to be able to do anything I can for you.' She could not sew well, and so did not make the necessary things for the baby. She told Philip it was much cheaper in the end to buy them. Philip had lately sold one of the mortgages in which his money had been put, and now with five hundred pounds in the bank waiting to be invested in something that could more easily be realized, he felt himself uncommonly well-to-do. They talked often of the future. Philip was anxious that Mildred should keep the child with her, but she refused. She had her living to earn, and it would be more easy to do this if she had not also to look after a baby. Her plan was to get back into one of the shops of the company for which she had worked before, and the child could be put with some decent woman in the country. "'I can find someone who'll look after it well for seven and sixpence a week. It'll be better for the baby and better for me.' It seemed callous to Philip, but when he tried to reason with her she pretended to think he was concerned with the expense. "'You needn't worry about that,' she said. "'I shan't ask you to pay for it you know I don't care how much I pay. At the bottom of her heart was the hope that the child would be stillborn. She did no more than hint it, but Philip saw that the thought was there. He was shocked at first, and then, reasoning with himself, he was obliged to confess that for all concerned such an event was to be desired. "'It's all very fine to say this and that,' Mildred remarked garrulously but it's jolly difficult for a girl to earn her living by herself. It doesn't make it any easier when she's got a baby. Fortunately you've got me to fall back on, smiled Philip, taking her hand. You've been good to me, Philip. Oh, what rot! You can't say I didn't offer anything in return for what you've done. Good heavens, I don't want a return. If I've done anything for you, I've done it because I love you. You owe me nothing." I don't want you to do anything unless you love me." He was a little horrified by her feeling that her body was a commodity which she could deliver indifferently as an acknowledgment for services rendered. "'But I do want to, Philip. You've been so good to me.' "'Well, it won't hurt for waiting. When you're all right again we'll go for our little honeymoon. You are naughty,' she said, smiling. Mildred expected to be confined early in March and as soon as she was well enough she was to go to the seaside for a fortnight. That would give Philip a chance to work without interruption for his examination. After that came the Easter holidays, and they had arranged to go to Paris together. Philip talked endlessly of the things they would do. Paris was delightful then. They would take a room in a little hotel he knew in the Latin Quarter, and they would eat in all sorts of charming little restaurants they would go to the play and he would take her to music halls. It would amuse her to meet his friends. He had talked to her about Cronshaw. She would see him. And there was Lawson. He had gone to Paris for a couple of months. And they would go to the Balbouillet. There were excursions. They would make trips to Versailles, Chartres, Fontainebleau. "'It'll cost a lot of money,' she said. "'Oh, damn the expense. Think how I've been looking forward to it. Don't you know what it means to me?' I've never loved anyone but you. I never shall." She listened to his enthusiasm with smiling eyes. He thought she saw in them a new tenderness, and he was grateful to her. She was much gentler than she used to be. There was in her no longer the superciliousness which had irritated him. She was so accustomed to him now that she took no pains to keep up before him any pretenses. She no longer troubled to do her hair with the old elaboration, but just tied it into a knot, and she left off the vast fringe which she generally wore. The more careless style suited her. Her face was so thin that it made her eyes seem very large. There were heavy lines under them, and the pallor of her cheeks made their color more profound. She had a wistful look which was infinitely pathetic. There seemed to Philip to be in her something of the Madonna he wished they could continue in that same way always. He was happier than he had ever been in his life. He used to leave her at ten o'clock every night, for she liked to go to bed early, and he was obliged to put in another couple of hours' work to make up for the lost evening. He generally brushed her hair for her before he went. He had made a ritual of the kisses he gave her when he bade her good night. 
First he kissed the palms of her hands. How thin the fingers were! The nails were beautiful, for she spent much time in manicuring them. Then he kissed her closed eyes, first the right one and then the left, and at last he kissed her lips. He went home with a heart overflowing with love. He longed for an opportunity to gratify the desire for self-sacrifice which consumed him. Presently the time came for her to move to the nursing home where she was to be confined. Philip was then able to visit her only in the afternoons. Mildred changed her story and represented herself as the wife of a soldier who had gone to India to join his regiment, and Philip was introduced to the mistress of the establishment as her brother-in-law. "'I have to be rather careful what I say,' she told him, "'as there's another lady here whose husband's in the Indian civil.' "'I wouldn't let it disturb me if I were you,' said Philip. "'I'm convinced that her husband and yours went out on the same boat.' "'What boat?' she asked innocently. "'The Flying Dutchman.' Mildred was safely delivered of a daughter, and when Philip was allowed to see her the child was lying by her side. Mildred was very weak, but relieved that everything was over. She showed him the baby, and herself looked at it curiously. "'It's a funny-looking little thing, isn't it? I can't believe it's mine.' It was red and wrinkled and odd. Philip smiled when he looked at it. He did not quite know what to say, and it embarrassed him because the nurse who owned the house was standing by his side, and he felt by the way she was looking at him that, disbelieving Mildred's complicated story, she thought he was the father. "'What are you going to call her?' asked Philip. "'I can't make up my mind if I shall call her Madeline or Cecilia.' The nurse left them alone for a few minutes, and Philip bent down and kissed Mildred on the mouth. "'I'm so glad it's all over happily, darling.' She put her thin arms round his neck. "'You have been a brick to me, Philip, dear. And now I feel that you're mine at last. I've waited so long for you, my dear.' They heard the nurse at the door, and Philip hurriedly got up. The nurse entered. There was a slight smile on her lips. End of chapter 72 Chapter 73 Three weeks later Philip saw Mildred and her baby off to Brighton. She had made a quick recovery and looked better than he had ever seen her. She was going to a boarding-house where she had spent a couple of weekends with Emil Miller and had written to say that her husband was obliged to go to Germany on business and she was coming down with her baby. She got pleasure out of the story she invented, and she showed a certain fertility of invention in the working out of the details. Mildred proposed to find in Brighton some woman who would be willing to take charge of the baby. Philip was startled at the callousness with which she insisted on getting rid of it so soon, but she argued with common sense that the poor child had much better be put somewhere before it grew used to her. Philip had expected the maternal instinct to make itself felt when she had had the baby two or three weeks, and had counted on this to help him persuade her to keep it. But nothing of the sort occurred. Mildred was not unkind to her baby. She did all that was necessary. It amused her sometimes, and she talked about it a good deal. But at heart, she was indifferent to it. She could not look upon it as part of herself. She fancied it resembled its father already. She was continually wondering how she would manage it when it grew older, and she was exasperated with herself for being such a fool as to have it at all. "'If I'd only known then all I do now,' she said. She laughed at Philip because he was anxious about his welfare. "'You couldn't make more fuss if you was the father,' she said. I'd like to see Emil getting into such a stew about it." Philip's mind was full of the stories he had heard of baby farming and the ghouls who ill-treat the wretched children that selfish, cruel parents have put in their charge. "'Don't be so silly,' said Mildred. "'That's when you give a woman a sum down to look after a baby. But when you're going to pay so much a week it's to their interest to look after it well.' Philip insisted that Mildred should place the child with people who had no children of their own and would promise to take no other. "'Don't haggle about the price,' he said. "'I'd rather pay half a guinea a week than run any risk of the kid being starved or beaten.' "'You're a funny old thing, Philip,' she laughed. To him there was something very touching in the child's helplessness. 
It was small, ugly, and querulous. Its birth had been looked forward to with shame and anguish. Nobody wanted it. It was dependent on him, a stranger, for food, shelter, and clothes to cover its nakedness. As the train started he kissed Mildred. He would have kissed the baby, too, but she was afraid he would laugh at him. "'You will write to me, darling, won't you? And I shall look forward to your coming back with, oh, such impatience. Mind you get through your exam.' He had been working for it industriously, and now with only ten days before him he made a final effort. He was very anxious to pass, first to save himself time and expense, for money had been slipping through his fingers during the last four months with incredible speed, and then because this examination marked the end of the drudgery. After that the student had to do with medicine, midwifery, and surgery, the interest of which was more vivid than the anatomy and physiology with which he had been hitherto concerned. Philip looked forward with interest to the rest of the curriculum, nor did he want to have to confess to Mildred that he had failed. Though the examination was difficult, and the majority of the candidates were ploughed at the first attempt, he knew that she would think less well of him if he did not succeed. She had a peculiarly humiliating way of showing what she thought. Mildred sent him a postcard to announce her safe arrival, and he snatched half an hour every day to write a long letter to her. He had always a certain shyness in expressing himself by word of mouth, but he found he could tell her, pen in hand, all sorts of things which it would have made him feel ridiculous to say. Profiting by the discovery he poured out to her his whole heart. He had never been able to tell her before how his adoration filled every part of him so that all his actions, all his thoughts, were touched with it. He wrote to her of the future, the happiness that lay before him, and the gratitude which he owed her. He asked himself, he had often asked himself before, but had never put it into words, what it was in her that filled him with such extravagant delight. He did not know. He only knew that when she was with him he was happy, and when she was away from him the world was on a sudden cold and gray. He knew only that when he thought of her his heart seemed to grow big in his body so that it was difficult to breathe, as if it pressed against his lungs, and it throbbed so that the delight of her presence was almost pain. His knees shook, and he felt strangely weak, as though, not having eaten, he were tremulous from want of food. He looked forward eagerly to her answers. He did not expect her to write often, for he knew that letter-writing came difficultly to her, and he was quite content with the clumsy little note that arrived in reply to four of his. She spoke of the boarding-house in which she had taken a room, of the weather and the baby, told him she had been for a walk on the front with a lady friend whom she had met in the boarding-house and who had taken such a fancy to baby she was going to the theatre on Saturday night and Brighton was filling up. It touched Philip because it was so matter-of-fact. The crab style, the formality of the matter, gave him a queer desire to laugh and to take her in his arms and kiss her. He went into the examination with happy confidence. There was nothing in either of the papers that gave him trouble. He knew that he had done well, and though the second part of the examination was viva voce and he was more nervous, he managed to answer the questions adequately. He sent a triumphant telegram to Mildred when the result was announced. When he got back to his rooms Philip found a letter from her, saying that she thought it would be better for her to stay another week in Brighton. She had found a woman who would be glad to take the baby for seven shillings a week, but she wanted to make inquiries about her, and she was herself benefiting so much by the sea air that she was sure a few days more would do her no end of good. She hated asking Philip for money, but would he send some by return, as she had had to buy herself a new hat? She couldn't go about with her lady friend always in the same hat, and her lady friend was so dressy. Philip had a moment of bitter disappointment. It took away all his pleasure at getting through his examination. If she loved me one quarter as much as I love her, she couldn't bear to stay away a day longer than necessary. He put the thought away from him quickly. It was pure selfishness. Of course her health was more important than anything else. But he had nothing to do now. He might spend the week with her in Brighton, 
and they could be together all day. His heart leaped at the thought. It would be amusing to appear before Mildred suddenly with the information that he had taken a room in the boarding-house. He looked out trains, but he paused. He was not certain that she would be pleased to see him. She had made friends in Brighton. He was quiet, and she liked boisterous joviality. He realized that she might amuse herself more with other people than with him. It would torture him if he felt for an instant that he was in the way. He was afraid to risk it. He dared not even write and suggest that, with nothing to keep him in town, he would like to spend the week where he could see her every day. She knew he had nothing to do. If she wanted him to come, she would have asked him to. He dared not risk the anguish he would suffer if he proposed to come, and she made excuses to prevent him. He wrote to her the next day, sent her a five-pound note, and at the end of the letter said that if she were very nice and cared to see him for the weekend, he would be glad to run down, but she was by no means to alter any plan she had made. He awaited her answer with impatience. In it she said that if she had only known before she could have arranged it, but she had promised to go to a music hall on the Saturday night. Besides, it would make the people at the boarding-house talk if he stayed there. Why did he not come down on Sunday morning and spend the day? They could lunch at the Metropole, and she would take him afterwards to see the very superior ladylike person who was going to take the baby. Sunday! He blessed the day because it was fine. As the train approached Brighton the sun poured through the carriage window. Mildred was waiting for him on the platform. "'How jolly of you to come and meet me!' he cried as he seized her hands. "'You expected me, didn't you?' "'I hoped you would. I say, how well you're looking. It's done me a rare lot of good, but I think I'm wise to stay here as long as I can, and there are a very nice class of people at the boarding-house.' I wanted cheering up after seeing nobody all these months. It was dull sometimes. She looked very smart in her new hat, a large black straw with a great many inexpensive flowers on it, and round her neck floated a long boa of imitation swan's down. She was still very thin, and she stooped a little when she walked. She had always done that. But her eyes did not seem so large, and though she never had any color, her skin had lost the earthy look it had. They walked down to the sea. Philip, remembering that he had not walked with her for months, grew suddenly conscious of his limp, and walked stiffly in the attempt to conceal it. "'Are you glad to see me?' he asked, love dancing madly in his heart. "'Of course I am. You needn't ask that.' "'By the way, Griffiths sends you his love.' "'What cheek!' He had talked to her a great deal of Griffiths. He had told her how flirtatious he was, and had amused her often with the narration of some adventure which Griffiths, under the seal of secrecy, had imparted to him. Mildred had listened with some pretense of disgust sometimes, but generally with curiosity, and Philip, admiringly, had enlarged upon his friend's good looks and charm. "'I'm sure you'll like him just as much as I do. He's so jolly and amusing, and he's such an awfully good sport.' Philip told her how, when they were perfect strangers, Griffiths had nursed him through an illness, and in the telling Griffiths' self-sacrifice lost nothing. "'You can't help liking him,' said Philip. "'I don't like good-looking men,' said Mildred. "'They're too conceited for me. He wants to know you. I've talked to him about you an awful lot.' "'What have you said?' asked Mildred. Philip had no one but Griffiths to talk to of his love for Mildred, and little by little had told him the whole story of his connection with her. He described her to him fifty times. He dwelt amorously on every detail of her appearance, and Griffiths knew exactly how her thin hands were shaped and how white her face was, and he laughed at Philip when he talked of the charm of her pale thin lips. "'By Jove, I'm glad I don't take things so badly as that,' he said. "'Life wouldn't be worth living.' Philip smiled. Griffiths did not know the delight of being so madly in love that it was like meat and wine and the air one breathed and whatever else was essential to existence. Griffiths knew that Philip had looked after the girl while she was having her baby and was now going away with her. "'Well, I must say you've deserved to get something,' he remarked. "'It must have cost you a pretty penny. It's lucky you can afford it.' "'I can't,' said Philip. "'But what do I care?' 
Since it was early for luncheon, Philip and Mildred sat in one of the shelters on the parade, sunning themselves and watching the people pass. There were the Brighton shop boys who walked in twos and threes, swinging their canes, and there were the Brighton shop girls who tripped along in giggling bunches. They could tell the people who had come from London for the day. The keen air gave a fillip to their weariness. There were many Jews, stout ladies in tight satin dresses and diamonds, little corpulent men with a gesticulative manner. There were middle-aged gentlemen spending a weekend in one of the large hotels, carefully dressed, and they walked industriously after too substantial a breakfast to give themselves an appetite for too substantial a luncheon. They exchanged the time of day with friends and talked of Dr. Brighton or London by the sea. Here and there a well-known actor passed, elaborately unconscious of the attention he excited. Sometimes he wore patent leather boots, a coat with an astrakhan collar, and carried a silver knob stick, and sometimes, looking as though he had come from a day's shooting, he strolled in knickerbockers and ulster of Harris Tweed, and a tweed hat on the back of his head. The sun shone on the blue sea, and the blue sea was trim and neat. After luncheon they went to Hove to see the woman who was to take charge of the baby. She lived in a small house in a back street, but it was clean and tidy. Her name was Mrs. Harding. She was an elderly, stout person with gray hair and a red, fleshy face. She looked motherly in her cap, and Philip thought she seemed kind. "'Won't you find it an awful nuisance to look after a baby?' he asked her. She explained that her husband was a curate, a good deal older than herself, who had difficulty in getting permanent work since vicars wanted young men to assist them. He earned a little now and then by doing locums when someone took a holiday or fell ill, and a charitable institution gave them a small pension. But her life was lonely. It would be something to do to look after a child, and the few shillings a week paid for it would help her keep things going. She promised that it should be well fed. "'Quite the lady, isn't she?' said Mildred when they went away. They went back to have tea at the Metropole. Mildred liked the crowd and the band. Philip was tired of talking, and he watched her face as she looked with keen eyes at the dresses of the women who came in. She had a peculiar sharpness for reckoning up what things cost, and now and then she leaned over to him and whispered the result of her meditations. "'Do you see that aigret there? That cost every bit of seven guineas.' Or, "'Look at that ermine, Philip. That's rabbit, that is. That's not ermine.' She laughed triumphantly. "'I'd know it a mile off.' Philip smiled happily. He was glad to see her pleasure, and the ingenuousness of her conversation amused and touched him. The band played sentimental music. After dinner they walked down to the station, and Philip took her arm. He told her what arrangements he had made for their journey to France. She was to come up to London at the end of the week, but she told him that she could not get away till the Saturday of the week after that. He had already engaged a room in a hotel in Paris. He was looking forward eagerly to taking the tickets. "'You won't mind going second class, will you? We mustn't be extravagant, and it'll be all the better if we can do ourselves pretty well when we get there.' He had talked to her a hundred times of the quarter. They would wander through its pleasant old streets, and they would sit idly in the charming gardens of the Luxembourg. If the weather was fine, perhaps, when they had had enough of Paris, they might go to Fontainebleau. The trees would be just bursting into leaf. The green of the forest in the spring was more beautiful than anything he knew. It was like a song, and it was like the happy pain of love. Mildred listened quietly. He turned to her and tried to look deep into her eyes. "'You do want to come, don't you?' he said. "'Of course I do,' she smiled. "'You don't know how I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how I shall get through the next days. I'm so afraid something will happen to prevent it. It maddens me sometimes that I can't tell you how much I love you. And at last, at last—' He broke off. They reached the station, but they had dawdled on the way, and Philip had barely time to say good night. He kissed her quickly and ran towards the wicket as fast as he could go. She stood where he left her. He was strangely grotesque when he ran. End of chapter 73 Recording by Tom Weiss, 
LibriVox.org/slash/tomsaudiobooks.com. Chapters seventy-four through seventy-seven of *Of Human Bondage*. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maugham. Chapter seventy-four. The following Saturday, Mildred returned, and that evening Philip kept her to himself. He took seats for the play, and they drank champagne at dinner. It was her first gaiety in London for so long that she enjoyed everything ingenuously. She cuddled up to Philip when they drove from the theatre to the room he had taken for her in Pimlico. "'I really believe you're quite glad to see me,' he said. She did not answer, but gently pressed his hand. Demonstrations of affection were so rare with her that Philip was enchanted. "'I've asked Griffiths to dine with us to-morrow,' he told her. "'Oh, I'm glad you've done that. I wanted to meet him. There was no place of entertainment to take her to on Sunday night, and Philip was afraid she would be bored if she were alone with him all day. Griffiths was amusing. He would help them to get through the evening, and Philip was so fond of them both that he wanted them to know and to like one another. He left Mildred with the words, Only six more days. They had arranged to dine in the gallery at Romano's on Sunday because the dinner was excellent and looked as though it cost a good deal more than it did. Philip and Mildred arrived first and had to wait some time for Griffiths. "'He's an unpunctual devil,' said Philip. "'He's probably making love to one of his numerous flames.' But presently he appeared. He was a handsome creature, tall and thin. His head was placed well on the body. It gave him a conquering air which was attractive, and his curly hair, his bold, friendly blue eyes, his red mouth, were charming. Philip saw Mildred look at him with appreciation, and he felt a curious satisfaction. Griffiths greeted them with a smile. "'I've heard a great deal about you,' he said to Mildred as he took her hand. "'Not so much as I've heard about you,' she answered. "'Not so bad,' said Philip. "'Has he been blackening my character?' Griffiths laughed and Philip saw that Mildred noticed how white and regular his teeth were and how pleasant his smile. "'You ought to feel like old friends,' said Philip. "'I've talked so much about you to one another.' Griffiths was in the best possible humour, for, having at length passed his final examination, he was qualified, and he had just been appointed house surgeon at a hospital in the north of London. He was taking up his duties at the beginning of May, and meanwhile was going home for a holiday. This was his last week in town, and he was determined to get as much enjoyment into it as he could. He began to talk the gay nonsense which Philip admired because he could not copy it. There was nothing much in what he said, but his vivacity gave it point. There flowed from him a force of life which affected everyone who knew him. It was almost as sensible as bodily warmth. Mildred was more lively than Philip had ever known her and he was delighted to see that his little party was a success. She was amusing herself enormously. She laughed louder and louder. She quite forgot the genteel reserve which had become second nature to her. Presently Griffiths said, "'I say, it's dreadfully difficult for me to call you Mrs. Miller. Philip never calls you anything but Mildred. I dare say she won't scratch your eyes out if you call her that too,' laughed Philip. "'Then she must call me Harry.' Philip sat silent while they chattered away and thought how good it was to see people happy. Now and then Griffiths teased him a little, kindly, because he was always so serious. "'I believe he's quite fond of you, Philip,' smiled Mildred. "'He isn't a bad old thing,' answered Griffiths, and taking Philip's hand he shook it gaily. It seemed an added charm in Griffiths that he liked Philip. They were all sober people, and the wine they had drunk went to their heads." Griffiths became more talkative and so boisterous that Philip, amused, had to beg him to be quiet. He had a gift for storytelling, and his adventures lost nothing of their romance and their laughter in his narration. He played in all of them a gallant, humorous part. Mildred, her eyes shining with excitement, urged him on. He poured out anecdote after anecdote. When the lights began to be turned out, 
she was astonished. "'My word, the evening has gone quickly. I thought it wasn't more than half-past nine. They got up to go, and when she said good-bye she added, "'I'm coming to have tea at Philip's room tomorrow. You might look in if you can.' "'All right,' he smiled. On the way back to Pimlico Mildred talked of nothing but Griffiths. She was taken with his good looks, his well-cut clothes, his voice, his gaiety. "'I am glad you like him,' said Philip. "'Do you remember you were rather sniffy about meeting him? I think it's so nice of him to be so fond of you, Philip. He is a nice friend for you to have.' She put up her face to Philip for him to kiss her. It was a thing she did rarely. "'I have enjoyed myself this evening, Philip. Thank you so much.' "'Don't be absurd,' he laughed, touched by her appreciation, so that he felt the moisture come to his eyes. She opened the door, and just before she went in, turned again to Philip. "'Tell Harry I'm madly in love with him,' she said. "'All right,' he laughed. "'Good night.' Next day, when they were having tea, Griffiths came in. He sank lazily into an armchair. There was something strangely sensual in the slow movements of his large limbs. Philip remained silent while the others chattered away, but he was enjoying himself. He admired them both so much that it seemed natural enough for them to admire one another. He did not care if Griffiths absorbed Mildred's attention, he would have her to himself during the evening. He had something of the attitude of a loving husband, confident in his wife's affection, who looks on with amusement when she flirts harmlessly with a stranger. But at half-past seven, he looked at his watch and said, "'It's about time we went out to dinner, Mildred.' There was a moment's pause, and Griffiths seemed to be considering. "'Well, I'll be getting along,' he said at last. "'I didn't know it was so late.' "'Are you doing anything tonight?' asked Mildred. "'No.' There was another silence. Philip felt slightly irritated. "'I'll just go and have a wash,' he said, and to Mildred he added, "'Would you like to wash your hands?' She did not answer him. "'Why don't you come and dine with us?' she said to Griffiths. He looked at Philip and saw him staring at him somberly. "'I dined with you last night,' he laughed. "'I should be in the way.' "'Oh, that doesn't matter,' insisted Mildred. "'Make him come, Philip. He won't be in the way, will he?' "'Let him come by all means if he'd like to.' "'All right, then,' said Griffiths promptly. "'I'll just go upstairs and tidy myself.' The moment he left the room Philip turned to Mildred angrily. Why on earth did you ask him to dine with us? I couldn't help myself. It would have looked so funny to say nothing when he said he wasn't doing anything. Oh, what rot! And why the hell did you ask him if he was doing anything? Mildred's pale lips tightened a little. I want a little amusement sometimes. I get tired always being alone with you. They heard Griffiths coming heavily down the stairs, and Philip went into his bedroom to wash. They dined in the neighborhood in an Italian restaurant. Philip was cross and silent, but he quickly realized that he was showing to disadvantage in comparison with Griffiths, and he forced himself to hide his annoyance. He drank a good deal of wine to destroy the pain that was gnawing at his heart, and he set himself to talk. Mildred, as though remorseful for what he had said, did all she could to make herself pleasant to him. She was kindly and affectionate. Presently Philip began to think he had been a fool to surrender to a feeling of jealousy. After dinner, when they got into a hansom to drive to a music hall, Mildred, sitting between the two men of her own accord, gave him her hand. His anger vanished. Suddenly, he knew not how, he grew conscious that Griffiths was holding her other hand. The pain seized him again violently. It was a real physical pain, and he asked himself, panic-stricken what he might have asked himself before, whether Mildred and Griffiths were in love with one another. He could not see anything of the performance on account of the mist of suspicion, anger, dismay, and wretchedness which seemed to be before his eyes, but he forced himself to conceal the fact that anything was the matter. He went on talking and laughing. Then a strange desire to torture himself seized him, and he got up saying he wanted to go and drink something. Mildred and Griffiths had never been alone together for a moment. He wanted to leave them by themselves. "'I'll come too,' said Griffiths. "'I've got rather a thirst on. Oh, nonsense, you stay and talk to Mildred.' Philip did not know why he said that. 
He was throwing them together now to make the pain he suffered more intolerable. He did not go to the bar, but went up into the balcony from where he could watch them and not be seen. They had ceased to look at the stage and were smiling into one another's eyes. Griffiths was talking with his usual happy fluency, and Mildred seemed to hang on his lips. Philip's head began to ache frightfully. He stood there motionless. He knew he would be in the way if he went back. They were enjoying themselves without him, and he was suffering, suffering. Time passed, and now he had an extraordinary shyness about rejoining them. He knew they had not thought of him at all, and he reflected bitterly that he had paid for the dinner and their seats in the music hall. What a fool they were making of him! He was hot with shame. He could see how happy they were without him. His instinct was to leave them to themselves and go home, but he had not his hat and coat, and it would necessitate endless explanations. He went back. He felt a shadow of annoyance in Mildred's eyes when she saw him, and his heart sank. "'You've been a devil of a time,' said Griffiths, with a smile of welcome. "'I met some men I knew. I've been talking to them, and I couldn't get away. I thought you'd be all right together.' "'I've been enjoying myself thoroughly,' said Griffiths. "'I don't know about Mildred.' She gave a little laugh of happy complacency. There was a vulgar sound in the ring of it that horrified Philip. He suggested that they should go. "'Come on,' said Griffiths. "'We'll both drive you home.' Philip suspected that she had suggested that arrangement so that she might not be left alone with him. In the cab he did not take her hand, nor did she offer it, and he knew all the time that she was holding Griffiths. His chief thought was that it was all so horribly vulgar. As they drove along he asked himself what plans they had made to meet without his knowledge. He cursed himself for having left them alone, he had actually gone out of his way to enable them to arrange things. "'Let's keep the cab,' said Philip, when they reached the house in which Mildred was lodging. "'I'm too tired to walk home.' On the way back Griffiths talked gaily and seemed indifferent to the fact that Philip answered in monosyllables. Philip felt he must notice that something was the matter. Philip's silence at last grew too significant to struggle against and Griffiths, suddenly nervous, ceased talking. Philip wanted to say something, but he was so shy he could hardly bring himself to, and yet the time was passing and the opportunity would be lost. It was best to get at the truth at once. He forced himself to speak. "'Are you in love with Mildred?' he asked suddenly. "'I?' Griffiths laughed. "'Is that what you've been so funny about this evening? Of course not, my dear old man.' He tried to slip his hand through Philip's arm, but Philip drew himself away. He knew Griffiths was lying. He could not bring himself to force Griffiths to tell him that he had not been holding the girl's hand. He suddenly felt very weak and broken. "'It doesn't matter to you, Harry,' he said. "'You've got so many women. Don't take her away from me. It means my whole life. I've been so awfully wretched.' His voice broke, and he could not prevent the sob that was torn from him. He was horribly ashamed of himself. "'My dear old boy, you know I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. I'm far too fond of you for that. I was only playing the fool. If I'd known you were going to take it like that, I'd have been more careful.' "'Is that true?' asked Philip. "'I don't care a two-penny damn for her. I give you my word of honor. Philip gave a sigh of relief. The cab stopped at their door. End of chapter 74 Chapter 75 Next day Philip was in a good temper. He was very anxious not to bore Mildred with too much of his society, and so had arranged that he should not see her till dinner-time. She was ready when he fetched her, and he chafed her for her unwanted punctuality. She was wearing a new dress he had given her. He remarked on its smartness. "'It'll have to go back and be altered,' she said. "'The skirt hangs all wrong.' You'll have to make the dressmaker hurry up if you want to take it to Paris with you. It'll be ready in time for that. Only three more whole days. We'll go over by the eleven o'clock, shall we? If you like. He would have her for nearly a month entirely to himself. His eyes rested on her with hungry adoration. He was able to laugh a little at his own passion. I wonder what it is I see in you, he smiled. That's a nice thing to say, she answered. 
Her body was so thin that one could almost see her skeleton. Her chest was as flat as a boy's. Her mouth with its narrow pale lips was ugly and her skin was faintly green. "'I shall give you Blod's pills in quantities when we're away,' said Philip, laughing. "'I'm going to bring you back fat and rosy.' "'I don't want to get fat,' she said. She did not speak of Griffiths, and presently, while they were dining, Philip, half in malice, for he felt sure of himself and his power over her, said, "'It seems to me you were having a great flirtation with Harry last night.' "'I told you I was in love with him,' she laughed. "'I'm glad to know that he's not in love with you.' "'How do you know?' "'I asked him.' She hesitated a moment, looking at Philip, and a curious gleam came into her eyes. "'Would you like to read a letter I had from him this morning?' She handed him an envelope, and Philip recognized Griffith's bold, legible writing. There were eight pages. It was well written, frank, and charming. It was the letter of a man who was used to making love to women. He told Mildred that he loved her passionately. He had fallen in love with her the first moment he saw her. He did not want to love her, for he knew how fond Philip was of her, but he could not help himself. Philip was such a dear, and he was very much ashamed of himself, but it was not his fault. He was just carried away. He paid her delightful compliments. Finally he thanked her for consenting to lunch with him next day, and said he was dreadfully impatient to see her. Philip noticed that the letter was dated the night before. Griffiths must have written it after leaving Philip, and had taken the trouble to go out and post it when Philip thought he was in bed. He read it with a sickening palpitation of his heart, but gave no outward sign of surprise. He handed it back to Mildred with a smile, calmly. "'Did you enjoy your lunch?' "'Rather,' she said emphatically. He felt that his hands were trembling as he put them under the table. "'You mustn't take Griffiths too seriously. He's just a butterfly, you know.' She took the letter and looked at it again. "'I can't help it either,' she said in a voice which she tried to make nonchalant. "'I don't know what's come over me.' "'It's a little awkward for me, isn't it?' said Philip. She gave him a quick look. "'You're taking it pretty calmly, I must say.' what do you expect me to do? Do you want me to tear out my hair in handfuls? I knew you'd be angry with me. The funny thing is, I'm not at all. I ought to have known this would happen. I was a fool to bring you two together. I know perfectly well that he's got every advantage over me. He's much jollier, and he's very handsome. He's more amusing. He can talk to you about the things that interest you. I don't know what you mean by that. If I'm not clever I can't help it, but I'm not the fool you think I am, not by a long way, I can tell you. You're a bit too superior for me, my young friend. Do you want to quarrel with me? he asked mildly. No, but I don't see why you should treat me as if I was, I don't know what. I'm sorry I didn't mean to offend you. I just wanted to talk things over quietly. We don't want to make a mess of them if we can help it. I saw you were attracted by him and it seemed to me very natural. The only thing that really hurts me is that he should have encouraged you. He knew how awfully keen I was on you. I think it's rather shabby of him to have written that letter to you five minutes after he told me he didn't care two pence about you. If you think you're going to make me like him any the less by saying nasty things about him, you're mistaken. Philip was silent for a moment. He did not know what words he could use to make her see his point of view. He wanted to speak coolly and deliberately, but he was in such a turmoil of emotion that he could not clear his thoughts. It's not worth while sacrificing everything for an infatuation that you know can't last. After all, he doesn't care for anyone more than ten days, and you're rather cold. That sort of thing doesn't mean very much to you. That's what you think. She made it more difficult for him by adopting a cantankerous tone. "'If you're in love with him you can't help it. I'll just bear it as best I can. We get on very well together, you and I. And I've not behaved badly to you, have I? I've always known that you're not in love with me, but you like me all right, and when we get over to Paris you'll forget about Griffiths. If you make up your mind to put him out of your thoughts you won't find it so hard as all that.' 
and I deserve that you should do something for me. She did not answer, and they went on eating their dinner. When the silence grew oppressive, Philip began to talk of indifferent things. He pretended not to notice that Mildred was inattentive. Her answers were perfunctory, and she volunteered no remarks of her own. At last she interrupted abruptly what he was saying. "'Philip, I'm afraid I shan't be able to go away on Saturday. The doctor says I oughtn't to.' He knew this was not true, but he answered, "'When will you be able to come away?' She glanced at him, saw that his face was white and rigid, and looked nervously away. She was at that moment a little afraid of him. "'I may as well tell you and have done with it. I can't come away with you at all.' "'I thought you were driving at that. It's too late to change your mind now. I've got the tickets and everything. You said you didn't wish me to go unless I wanted it too and I don't. I've changed my mind. I'm not going to have any more tricks played with me. You must come. I like you very much, Philip, as a friend, but I can't bear to think of anything else. I don't like you that way. I couldn't, Philip. You were quite willing to a week ago. It was different then. You hadn't met Griffiths? You said yourself I couldn't help it if I'm in love with him. Her face was set into a sulky look, and she kept her eyes fixed on her plate. Philip was white with rage. He would have liked to hit her in the face with his clenched fist, and in fancy he saw how she would look with a black eye. There were two lads of eighteen dining at a table near them, and now and then they looked at Mildred. He wondered if they envied him dining with a pretty girl. Perhaps they were wishing they stood in his shoes. It was Mildred who broke the silence. "'What's the good of our going away together? I'll be thinking of him all the time. It wouldn't be much fun for you.' "'That's my business,' he answered. She thought over all his reply implicated, and she reddened. "'But that's just beastly.' "'What of it? I thought you were a gentleman in every sense of the word. You were mistaken.' His reply entertained him, and he laughed as he said it. "'For God's sake, don't laugh,' she cried. I can't come away with you, Philip. I'm awfully sorry. I know I haven't behaved well to you, but one can't force themselves. Have you forgotten that when you were in trouble I did everything for you? I planked out the money to keep you till your baby was born. I paid for your doctor and everything. I paid for you to go to Brighton, and I'm paying for the keep of your baby. I'm paying for your clothes. I'm paying for every stitch you've got on now. If you was a gentleman you wouldn't throw what you've done for me in my face. Oh, for goodness sake, shut up. What do you suppose I care if I'm a gentleman or not? If I were a gentleman I shouldn't waste my time with a vulgar slut like you. I don't care a damn if you like me or not. I'm sick of being made a blasted fool of. You're jolly well coming to Paris with me on Saturday, or you can take the consequences. Her cheeks were red with anger and when she answered her voice had the hard commonness which she concealed generally by a genteel enunciation. "'I never liked you, not from the beginning, but you forced yourself on me. I always hated it when you kissed me. I wouldn't let you touch me now, not if I was starving.' Philip tried to swallow the food on his plate, but the muscles of his throat refused to act. He gulped down something to drink and lit a cigarette. He was trembling in every part. He did not speak. He waited for her to move, but she sat in silence, staring at the white tablecloth. If they had been alone he would have flung his arms round her and kissed her passionately. He fancied the throwing back of her long white throat as he pressed upon her mouth with his lips. They passed an hour without speaking, and at last Philip thought the waiter began to stare at them curiously. He called for the bill. "'Shall we go?' he said then, in an even tone. She did not reply, but gathered together her bag and her gloves. She put on her coats. "'When are you seeing Griffiths again?' "'Tomorrow,' she answered indifferently. "'You'd better talk it over with him.' She opened her bag mechanically and saw a piece of paper in it. She took it out. "'Here's the bill for this dress,' she said hesitatingly. "'What of it?' "'I promised I'd give her the money tomorrow.' "'Did you?' Does that mean you won't pay for it after having told me I could get it? It does. I'll ask Harry, she said, flushing quickly. He'll be glad to help you. He owes me seven pounds at the moment, and he pawned his microscope last week 
because he was so broke. "'You needn't think you can frighten me by that. I'm quite capable of earning my own living.' "'It's the best thing you can do. I don't propose to give you a farthing more.' She thought of her rent due on Saturday and the baby's keep, but did not say anything. They left the restaurant, and in the street Philip asked her, "'Shall I call a cab for you? I'm going to take a little stroll.' "'I haven't got any money. I had to pay a bill this afternoon.' "'It won't hurt you to walk. If you want to see me tomorrow, I shall be in about tea-time.' He took off his hat and sauntered away. He looked round in a moment and saw that she was standing helplessly where he had left her, looking at the traffic. He went back and with a laugh pressed a coin into her hand. "'Here's two bob for you to get home with.' Before she could speak he hurried away. End of chapter 75 Chapter 76 Next day in the afternoon Philip sat in his room and wondered whether Mildred would come. He had slept badly. He had spent the morning in the club of the medical school reading one newspaper after another. It was the vacation and few students he knew were in London, but he found one or two people to talk to, he played a game of chess, and so wore out the tedious hours. After luncheon he felt so tired, his head was aching so, that he went back to his lodgings and lay down. He tried to read a novel. He had not seen Griffiths. He was not in when Philip returned the night before. He had heard him come back, but he did not, as usual, look into Philip's room to see if he was asleep, and in the morning Philip heard him go out early. It was clear that he wanted to avoid him. Suddenly there was a light tap at his door. Philip sprang to his feet and opened it. Mildred stood on the threshold. She did not move. "'Come in,' said Philip. He closed the door after her. She sat down. She hesitated to begin. "'Thank you for giving me that two shillings last night,' she said. "'Oh, that's all right.' She gave him a faint smile. It reminded Philip of the timid, ingratiating look of a puppy that has been beaten for naughtiness and wants to reconcile himself with his master. "'I've been lunching with Harry,' she said. "'Have you?' "'If you still want me to go away with you on Saturday, Philip, I'll come.' A quick thrill of triumph shot through his heart, but it was a sensation that only lasted for an instant. It was followed by a suspicion. "'Because of the money?' he asked. Partly, she answered simply. Harry can't do anything. He owes five weeks here, and he owes you seven pounds, and his tailor's pressing him for money. He'd pawn anything he could, but he's pawned everything already. I had a job to put the woman off about my new dress, and on Saturday there's the book at my lodgings, and I can't get work in five minutes. It always means waiting some little time till there's a vacancy." She said all this in an even, querulous tone, as though she were recounting the injustices of fate which had to be borne as part of the natural order of things. Philip did not answer. He knew what she told him well enough. "'You said partly,' he observed at last. "'Well, Harry says you've been a brick to both of us. You've been a real good friend to him,' he says, "'and you've done for me what perhaps no other man would have done. We must do the straight thing, he says. And he said what you said about him, that he's fickle by nature, he's not like you, and I should be a fool to throw you away for him. He won't last, and you will, he says so himself. Do you want to come away with me? asked Philip. I don't mind. He looked at her, and the corners of his mouth turned down in an expression of misery. He had triumphed, indeed and he was going to have his way. He gave a little laugh of derision at his own humiliation. She looked at him quickly, but did not speak. I've looked forward with all my soul to going away with you, and I thought at last, after all that wretchedness, I was going to be happy. He did not finish what he was going to say, and then on a sudden, without warning, Mildred broke into a storm of tears. She was sitting in the chair in which Nora had sat and wept, and like her she hid her face on the back of it, towards the side where there was a little bump formed by the sagging in the middle where the head had rested. "'I'm not lucky with women,' thought Philip. Her thin body was shaken with sobs. 
Philip had never seen a woman cry with such an utter abandonment. It was horribly painful, and his heart was torn. Without realizing what he did, he went up to her and put his arms round her. She did not resist, but in her wretchedness surrendered herself to his comforting. He whispered to her little words of solace. He scarcely knew what he was saying. He bent over her and kissed her repeatedly. "'Are you awfully unhappy?' he said at last. "'I wish I was dead,' she moaned. "'I wish I'd died when the baby come.' Her hat was in her way, and Philip took it off for her. He placed her head more comfortably in the chair, and then he went and sat down at the table and looked at her. "'It is awful, love, isn't it?' he said. "'Fancy anyone wanting to be in love.' Presently the violence of her sobbing diminished, and she sat in the chair, exhausted, with her head thrown back and her arms hanging by her side. She had the grotesque look of one of the painter's dummies used to hang draperies on. "'I didn't know you loved him so much as all that,' said Philip. He understood Griffith's love well enough, for he put himself in Griffith's place and saw with his own eyes, touched with his hands. He was able to think himself in Griffith's body, and he kissed her with his lips, smiled at her with his smiling blue eyes. It was her emotion that surprised him. He had never thought her capable of passion, and this was passion. There was no mistaking it. Something seemed to give way in his heart. It really felt to him as though something were breaking, and he felt strangely weak. I don't want to make you unhappy. You needn't come away with me if you don't want to. I'll give you the money all the same. She shook her head. No, I said I'd come, and I'll come. What's the good if you're sick with love for him? Yes, that's the word. I'm sick with love. I know it won't last just as well as he does. But just now? She paused and shut her eyes as though she were going to faint. A strange idea came to Philip and he spoke it as he came, without stopping to think it out. "'Why don't you go away with him?' "'How can I? You know we haven't got the money.' "'I'll give you the money.' "'You?' She sat up and looked at him. Her eyes began to shine, and the color came back into her cheeks. "'Perhaps the best thing would be to get it over, and then you'd come back to me.' Now that he made the suggestion he was sick with anguish, and yet the torture of it gave him a strange, subtle sensation. She stared at him with open eyes. "'Oh, how could we, on your money? Harry wouldn't think of it.' "'Oh, yes, he would, if you persuaded him.' Her objections made him insist, and yet he wanted her with all his heart to refuse vehemently. "'I'll give you a fiver, and you can go away from Saturday to Monday. You could easily do that. On Monday he's coming home till he takes up his appointment at the North London. "'Oh, Philip, do you mean that?' she cried, clasping her hands. "'If you could only let us go. I would love you so much afterwards. I'll do anything for you. I'm sure I'll get over it if you'll only do that. Would you really give us the money?' "'Yes,' he said. She was entirely changed now. She began to laugh. He could see that she was insanely happy. She got up and knelt down by Philip's side, taking his hands. "'You are a brick, Philip. You're the best fellow I've ever known. Won't you be angry with me afterwards?' He shook his head, smiling, but with what agony in his heart. "'May I go and tell Harry now? And can I say to him that you don't mind? He won't consent unless you promise it doesn't matter. Oh, you don't know how I love him. And afterwards I'll do anything you like. I'll come over to Paris with you, or anywhere, on Monday. She got up and put on her hat. Where are you going? I'm going to ask him if he'll take me. Already? Do you want me to stay? I'll stay if you like. She sat down, but he gave a little laugh. No, it doesn't matter. You'd better go at once. There's only one thing. I can't bear to see Griffiths just now. It would hurt me too awfully. Say I have no ill feeling towards him or anything like that, but ask him to keep out of my way. All right. She sprang up and put on her gloves. I'll let you know what he says. You'd better dine with me tonight. Very well. She put up her face for him to kiss her, and when he pressed his lips to hers, she threw her arms round his neck. You are a darling, Philip. 
she sent him a note a couple of hours later to say that she had a headache and could not dine with him. Philip had almost expected it. He knew that she was dining with Griffiths. He was horribly jealous, but the sudden passion which had seized the pair of them seemed like something that had come from the outside, as though a god had visited them with it, and he felt himself helpless. It seemed so natural that they should love one another. He saw all the advantages that Griffiths had over himself, and confessed that in Mildred's place he would have done as Mildred did. What hurt him most was Griffiths' treachery. They had been such good friends, and Griffiths knew how passionately devoted he was to Mildred. He might have spared him. He did not see Mildred again till Friday. He was sick for a sight of her by then. But when she came and he realized that he had gone out of her thoughts entirely, for they were engrossed in Griffiths, he suddenly hated her. He saw now why she and Griffiths loved one another. Griffiths was stupid, oh, so stupid. He had known that all along, but had shut his eyes to it. Stupid and empty. That charm of his concealed an utter selfishness. He was willing to sacrifice anyone to his appetites. And how inane was the life he led, lounging about bars and drinking in music halls, wandering from one light amour to another. He never read a book, he was blind to everything that was not frivolous and vulgar, he had never a thought that was fine, the word most common on his lips was smart. That was his highest praise for man or woman. Smart! It was no wonder he pleased Mildred. They suited one another. Philip talked to Mildred of things that mattered to neither of them. He knew she wanted to speak of Griffiths, but he gave her no opportunity. He did not refer to the fact that two evenings before she had put off dining with him on a trivial excuse. He was casual with her, trying to make her think he was suddenly grown indifferent, and he exercised peculiar skill in saying little things which he knew would wound her, but which were so indefinite, so delicately cruel, that she could not take exception to them. At last she got up. I think I must be going off now, she said. I dare say you've got a lot to do, he answered. She held out her hand, he took it, said good-bye, and opened the door for her. He knew what she wanted to speak about, and he knew also that his cold, ironical air intimidated her. Often his shyness made him seem so frigid that, unintentionally, he frightened people, and having discovered this, he was able when occasion arose to assume the same manner. "'You haven't forgotten what you promised?' she said at last as he held open the door. "'What is that?' "'About the money.' "'How much do you want?' He spoke with the icy deliberation which made his words peculiarly offensive. Mildred flushed. He knew she hated him at that moment, and he wondered at the self-control by which she prevented herself from flying out at him. He wanted to make her suffer. There's the dress and the book tomorrow. That's all. Harry won't come, so we shan't want money for that. Philip's heart gave a great thud against his ribs, and he let the door handle go. The door swung to. Why not? He says we couldn't, not on your money. A devil seized Philip, a devil of self-torture which was always lurking within him and though with all his soul he wished that Griffiths and Mildred should not go away together, he could not help himself. He set himself to persuade Griffiths through her. I don't see why not, if I'm willing, he said. That's what I told him. I should have thought if he really wanted to go, he wouldn't hesitate. Oh, it's not that. He wants to, all right. He'd go at once if he had the money. If he's squeamish about that, I'll give you the money. I said you'd lend it if he liked, and we'd pay it back as soon as we could. It's rather a change for you going on your knees to get a man to take you away for a weekend. It is rather, isn't it? she said, with a shameless little laugh. It sent a cold shudder down Philip's spine. What are you going to do then? he asked. Nothing. He's going home tomorrow. He must. That would be Philip's salvation. With Griffiths out of the way, he could get Mildred back. She knew no one in London, 
she would be thrown on to his society, and when they were alone together he would soon make her forget this infatuation. If he said nothing more, he was safe. But he had a fiendish desire to break down their scruples. He wanted to know how abominably they could behave towards him. If he tempted them a little more they would yield, and he took a fierce joy at the thought of their dishonor. Though every word he spoke tortured him, he found in the torture a horrible delight. It looks as if it were now or never. "'That's what I told him,' she said. There was a passionate note in her voice which struck Philip. He was biting his nails in his nervousness. "'Where were you thinking of going?' "'Oh, to Oxford. He was at the varsity there, you know. He said he'd show me the colleges.' Philip remembered that once he had suggested going to Oxford for the day, and she had expressed firmly the boredom she felt at the thought of sights. "'And it looks as if you'd have fine weather. It ought to be very jolly there just now.' "'I've done all I could to persuade him. Why don't you have another try? Shall I say you want us to go?' "'I don't think you must go as far as that,' said Philip. She paused for a minute or two, looking at him. Philip forced himself to look at her in a friendly way. He hated her. He despised her. He loved her with all his heart. "'I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go and see if he can arrange it, and then, if he says yes, I'll come and fetch the money tomorrow. When shall you be in?' "'I'll come back here after luncheon and wait.' "'All right.' "'I'll give you the money for your dress and your room now.' He went to his desk and took out what money he had. The dress was six guineas. There was besides her rent and her food and the baby's keep for a week. He gave her eight pounds ten. "'Thanks very much,' she said. She left him. End of chapter 76 Chapter 77 After lunching in the basement of the medical school, Philip went back to his rooms. It was Saturday afternoon, and the landlady was cleaning the stairs. "'Is Mr. Griffiths in?' he asked. "'No, sir. He went away this morning, soon after you went out. Isn't he coming back?' "'I don't think so, sir. He's taken his luggage.' Philip wondered what this could mean. He took a book and began to read. It was Burton's Journey to Mecca, which he had just got out of the Westminster Public Library, and he read the first page but could make no sense of it, for his mind was elsewhere. He was listening all the time for a ring at the bell. He dared not hope that Griffiths had gone away already without Mildred to his home in Cumberland. Mildred would be coming presently for the money. He set his teeth and read on. He tried desperately to concentrate his attention. The sentences etched themselves in his brain by the force of his effort, but they were distorted by the agony he was enduring. He wished with all his heart that he had not made the horrible proposition to give them money. But now that he had made it, he lacked the strength to go back on it, not on Mildred's account, but on his own. There was a morbid obstinacy in him which forced him to do the thing he had determined. He discovered that the three pages he had read had made no impression on him at all, and he went back and started from the beginning. He found himself reading one sentence over and over again, and now it weaved itself in with his thoughts horribly like some formula in a nightmare. One thing he could do was to go out and keep away till midnight. They could not go then, and he saw them calling at the house every hour to ask if he was in. He enjoyed the thought of their disappointment. He repeated that sentence to himself mechanically, but he could not do that. Let them come and take the money, and he would know then to what depths of infamy it was possible for men to descend. He could not read any more now. He simply could not see the words. He leaned back in his chair, closing his eyes, and numb with misery, waited for Mildred. The landlady came in. "'Will you see Mrs. Miller, sir?' "'Show her in.' Philip pulled himself together to receive her without any sign of what he was feeling. He had an impulse to throw himself on his knees and seize her hands and beg her not to go, but he knew there was no way of moving her. She would tell Griffiths what he had said and how he acted. 
he was ashamed. "'Well, how about the little jaunt?' he said gaily. "'We're going. Harry's outside. I told him you didn't want to see him, so he's kept out of your way. But he wants to know if he can come in just for a minute to say good-bye to you.' "'No, I won't see him,' said Philip. He could see she did not care if he saw Griffiths or not. Now that she was there he wanted her to go quickly. "'Look here, here's the fiver. I'd like you to go now.' She took it and thanked him. She turned to leave the room. "'When are you coming back?' he asked. "'Oh, on Monday. Harry must go home then.' He knew what he was going to say was humiliating, but he was broken down with jealousy and desire. "'Then I shall see you, shan't I?' He could not help the note of appeal in his voice. "'Of course. I'll let you know the moment I'm back.' He shook hands with her. Through the curtains he watched her jump into a four-wheeler that stood at the door. It rolled away. Then he threw himself on his bed and hid his face in his hands. He felt tears coming to his eyes, and he was angry with himself. He clenched his hands and screwed up his body to prevent them. But he could not and great painful sobs were forced from him. He got up at last, exhausted and ashamed, and washed his face. He mixed himself a strong whiskey and soda. It made him feel a little better. Then he caught sight of the tickets to Paris, which were on the chimney-piece, and seizing them with an impulse of rage he flung them in the fire. He knew he could have got the money back on them, but it relieved him to destroy them. Then he went out in search of someone to be with. The club was empty. He felt he would go mad unless he found someone to talk to. But Lawson was abroad. He went on to Hayward's rooms. The maid who opened the door told him that he had gone down to Brighton for the weekend. Then Philip went to a gallery and found it was just closing. He did not know what to do. He was distracted, and he thought of Griffiths and Mildred going to Oxford sitting opposite one another in the train, happy. He went back to his rooms, but they filled him with horror he had been so wretched in them. He tried once more to read Burton's book, but as he read he told himself again and again what a fool he had been. It was he who had made the suggestion that they should go away, he had offered the money, he had forced it upon them. He might have known what would happen when he introduced Griffiths to Mildred, his own vehement passion was enough to arouse the other's desire. By this time they had reached Oxford. They would put up in one of the lodging-houses in John Street. Philip had never been to Oxford, but Griffiths had talked to him about it so much that he knew exactly where they would go, and they would dine at the Clarendon. Griffiths had been in the habit of dining there when he went on the spree. Philip got himself something to eat in a restaurant near Charing Cross. He had made up his mind to go to a play, and afterwards he fought his way into the pit of a theatre at which one of Oscar Wilde's pieces was being performed. He wondered if Mildred and Griffiths would go to a play that evening. They must kill the evening somehow. They were too stupid, both of them, to content themselves with conversation. He got a fierce delight in reminding himself of the vulgarity of their minds which suited them so exactly to one another. He watched the play with an abstracted mind, trying to give himself gaiety by drinking whiskey in each interval. He was unused to alcohol, and it affected him quickly, but his drunkenness was savage and morose. When the play was over he had another drink. He could not go to bed, he knew he would not sleep, and he dreaded the pictures which his vivid imagination would place before him. He tried not to think of them, he knew he had drunk too much. Now he was seized with the desire to do horrible, sordid things. He wanted to roll himself in gutters. His whole being yearned for beastliness. He wanted to grovel. He walked up Piccadilly, dragging his club foot, somberly drunk with rage and misery, clawing at his heart. He was stopped by a painted harlot who put her hand on his arm. He pushed her violently away with brutal words. He walked on a few steps and then stopped. She would do as well as another. He was sorry he had spoken so roughly to her. He went up to her. "'I say,' he began. "'Go to hell,' she said. Philip laughed. 
I merely wanted to ask if you'd do me the honor of supping with me tonight. She looked at him with amazement and hesitated for a while. She saw he was drunk. I don't mind. He was amused that she should use a phrase he had heard so often on Mildred's lips. He took her to one of the restaurants he had been in the habit of going to with Mildred. He noticed as they walked along that she looked down at his limb. "'I've got a club foot,' he said. "'Have you any objection?' "'You're a cure,' she laughed. When he got home his bones were aching, and in his head there was a hammering that made him nearly scream. He took another whiskey and soda to steady himself, and going to bed sank into a dreamless sleep till midday. End of chapter 77 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks dot com. Chapters seventy eight through eighty of Of Human Bondage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 78 At last Monday came, and Philip thought his long torture was over. Looking out, the trains he found that the latest by which Griffiths could reach home that night left Oxford soon after one, and he supposed that Mildred would take one which started a few minutes later to bring her to London. His desire was to go and meet it, but he thought Mildred would like to be left alone for a day. Perhaps she would drop him a line in the evening to say she was back, and if not he would call at her lodgings next morning. His spirit was cowed. He felt a bitter hatred for Griffiths, but for Mildred notwithstanding all that had passed, only a heart-rending desire. He was glad now that Hayward was not in London on Saturday afternoon when, distraught, he went in search of human comfort. He could not have prevented himself from telling him everything and Hayward would have been astonished at his weakness. He would despise him, and perhaps be shocked or disgusted that he could envisage the possibility of making Mildred his mistress after she had given herself to another man. What did he care if it was shocking or disgusting? He was ready for any compromise, prepared for more degrading humiliation still, if he could only gratify his desire. Towards the evening his steps took him against his will to the house in which she lived, and he looked up at her window. It was dark. He did not venture to ask if she was back. He was confident in her promise. But there was no letter from her in the morning, and when about midday he called, the maid told him she had not arrived. He could not understand it. He knew that Griffiths would have been obliged to go home the day before, for he was to be the best man at a wedding and Mildred had no money. He turned over in his mind every possible thing that might have happened. He went again in the afternoon and left a note, asking her to dine with him that evening as calmly as though the events of the last fortnight had not happened. He mentioned the place and time at which they were to meet, and hoping against hope, kept the appointment. Though he waited for an hour, she did not come. On Wednesday morning he was ashamed to ask at the house and sent a messenger boy with a letter and instructions to bring back a reply. But in an hour the boy came back with Philip's letter unopened and the answer that the lady had not returned from the country. Philip was beside himself. The last deception was more than he could bear. He repeated to himself over and over again that he loathed Mildred and ascribing to Griffiths this new disappointment. He hated him so much that he knew what was the delight of murder. He walked about considering what a joy it would be to come upon him on a dark night and stick a knife into his throat, just about the carotid artery, and leave him to die in the street like a dog. Philip was out of his senses with grief and rage. He did not like whiskey, but he drank to stupefy himself. He went to bed drunk on the Tuesday and on the Wednesday night. On Thursday morning he got up very late and dragged himself, blear-eyed and sallow, into his sitting-room to see if there were any letters. A curious feeling shot through his heart when he recognized the handwriting of Griffiths. Dear old man, 
I hardly know how to write to you, and yet I feel I must write. I hope you're not awfully angry with me. I know I oughtn't to have gone away with Milly, but I simply couldn't help myself. She simply carried me off my feet, and I would have done anything to get her. When she told me you had offered us the money to go, I simply couldn't resist. And now it's all over I'm awfully ashamed of myself, and I wish I hadn't been such a fool. I wish you'd write and say you're not angry with me, and I want you to let me come and see you. I was awfully hurt at your telling Milly you didn't want to see me. Do write me a line, there's a good chap, and tell me you forgive me. It'll ease my conscience. I thought you wouldn't mind or you wouldn't have offered the money, but I know I oughtn't to have taken it. I came home on Monday and Milly wanted to stay a couple of days at Oxford by herself. She's going back to London on Wednesday, so by the time you receive this letter you will have seen her and I hope everything will go off all right. Do write and say you forgive me. Please write at once. Yours ever, Harry. Philip tore the letter up furiously. He did not mean to answer it. He despised Griffiths for his apologies. He had no patience with his prickings of conscience. One could do a dastardly thing if one chose, but it was contemptible to regret it afterwards. He thought the letter cowardly and hypocritical. He was disgusted at its sentimentality. "'It would be very easy if you could do a beastly thing,' he muttered to himself, and then say you were sorry, and that put it all right again. He hoped with all his heart he would have the chance one day to do Griffiths a bad turn. But at all events he knew that Mildred was in town. He dressed hurriedly, not waiting to shave, drank a cup of tea, and took a cab to her rooms. The cab seemed to crawl. He was painfully anxious to see her, and unconsciously he uttered a prayer to the God he did not believe in to make her receive him kindly. He only wanted to forget. With beating heart he rang the bell. He forgot all his suffering in the passionate desire to enfold her once more in his arms. "'Is Mrs. Miller in?' he asked joyously. "'She's gone,' the maid answered. He looked at her blankly. She came about an hour ago and took away her things. For a moment he did not know what to say. "'Did you give her my letter? Did she say where she was going?' Then he understood that Mildred had deceived him again. She was not coming back to him. He made an effort to save his face. "'Oh, well, I dare say I shall hear from her. She may have sent a letter to another address.' He turned away and went back hopeless to his rooms. He might have known that she would do this. She had never cared for him. She had made a fool of him from the beginning. She had no pity. She had no kindness. She had no charity. The only thing was to accept the inevitable. The pain he was suffering was horrible. He would sooner be dead than endure it, and the thought came to him that it would be better to finish with the whole thing. He might throw himself in the river or put his neck on a railway line. But he had no sooner set the thought into words than he rebelled against it. His reason told him that he would get over his unhappiness in time. If he tried with all his might he could forget her, and it would be grotesque to kill himself on account of a vulgar slut. He had only one life and it was madness to fling it away. He felt that he would never overcome his passion, but he knew that after all it was only a matter of time. He would not stay in London. There everything reminded him of his unhappiness. He telegraphed to his uncle that he was coming to Blackstable, and hurrying to pack, took the first train he could. He wanted to get away from the sordid rooms in which he had endured so much suffering. He wanted to breathe clean air. He was disgusted with himself. He felt that he was a little mad. Since he was grown up Philip had been given the best spare room at the vicarage. It was a corner room, and in front of one window was an old tree which blocked the view, but from the other you saw, beyond the garden and the vicarage field, broad meadows. Philip remembered the wallpaper from his earliest years. On the walls were quaint watercolors of the early Victorian period by a friend of the vicar's youth. They had a faded charm. The dressing-table was surrounded by stiff muslin. 
there was an old tall boy to put your clothes in. Philip gave a sigh of pleasure. He had never realized that all those things meant anything to him at all. At the vicarage life went on as it had always done. No piece of furniture had been moved from one place to another. The vicar ate the same things, said the same things, went for the same walk every day. He had grown a little fatter, a little more silent, a little more narrow. He had become accustomed to living without his wife and missed her very little. He bickered still with Josiah Graves. Philip went to see the churchwarden. He was a little thinner, a little whiter, a little more austere. He was autocratic still and still disapproved of candles on the altar. The shops had still a pleasant quaintness, and Philip stood in front of that in which things useful to seamen were sold, sea boots and tarpaulins and tackle, and remembered that he had felt there in his childhood the thrill of the sea and the adventurous magic of the unknown. He could not help his heart beating at each double knock of the postman in case there might be a letter from Mildred sent on by his landlady in London, but he knew that there would be none. Now that he could think it out more calmly, he understood that in trying to force Mildred to love him he had been attempting the impossible. He did not know what it was that passed from a man to a woman, from a woman to a man, and made one of them a slave. It was convenient to call it the sexual instinct, but if it was no more than that he did not understand why it should occasion so vehement an attraction to one person rather than another. It was irresistible. The mind could not battle with it. Friendship, gratitude, interest had no power beside it. Because he had not attracted Mildred sexually, nothing that he did had any effect upon her the idea revolted him. It made human nature beastly, and he felt suddenly that the hearts of men were full of dark places. Because Mildred was indifferent to him he had thought her sexless. Her anemic appearance and thin lips, the body with its narrow hips and flat chest, the languor of her manner carried out his supposition, and yet she was capable of sudden passions which made her willing to risk everything to gratify them. He had never understood her adventure with Emil Miller. It had seemed so unlike her, and she had never been able to explain it. But now that he had seen her with Griffiths he knew that just the same thing had happened then. She had been carried off her feet by an ungovernable desire. He tried to think out what those two men had which so strangely attracted her. They both had a vulgar facetiousness which tickled her simple sense of humor and a certain coarseness of nature. But what took her perhaps was the blatant sexuality which was their most marked characteristic. She had a genteel refinement which shuddered at the facts of life. She looked upon the bodily functions as indecent. She had all sorts of euphemisms for common objects. She always chose an elaborate word as more becoming than a simple one. The brutality of these men was like a whip on her thin white shoulders, and she shuddered with voluptuous pain. One thing Philip had made up his mind about. He would not go back to the lodging in which he had suffered. He wrote to his landlady and gave her notice. He wanted to have his own things about him. He determined to take unfurnished rooms. It would be pleasant and cheaper, and this was an urgent consideration, for during the last year and a half he had spent nearly seven hundred pounds. He must make up for it now by the most rigid economy. Now and then he thought of the future with panic. He had been a fool to spend so much money on Mildred, but he knew that if it were to come again he would act in the same way. It amused him sometimes to consider that his friends, because he had a face which did not express his feelings very vividly and a rather slow way of moving, looked upon him as strong-minded, deliberate, and cool. They thought him reasonable and praised his common sense, but he knew that his placid expression was no more than a mask, assumed unconsciously, which acted like the protective coloring of butterflies, and himself was astonished at the weakness of his will. It seemed to him that he was swayed by every light emotion, as though he were a leaf in the wind, 
and when passion seized him he was powerless. He had no self-control. He merely seemed to possess it because he was indifferent to many of the things which moved other people. He considered with some irony the philosophy which he had developed for himself, for it had not been of much use to him in the conjuncture he had passed through, and he wondered whether thought really helped a man in any of the critical affairs of life. It seemed to him rather that he was swayed by some power alien to and yet within himself, which urged him like the great wind of hell which drove Paolo and Francesca ceaselessly on. He thought of what he was going to do and, when the time came to act, he was powerless in the grasp of instincts, emotions, he knew not what. He acted as though he were a machine driven by the two forces of his environment and his personality. His reason was someone looking on, observing the facts, but powerless to interfere. It was like those gods of Epicurus, who saw the doings of men from their empyrean heights, and had no might to alter one smallest particle of what occurred. End of chapter 78 Chapter 79 Philip went up to London a couple of days before the session began in order to find himself rooms. He hunted about the streets that led out of the Westminster Bridge Road, but their dinginess was distasteful to him, and at last he found one in Kennington which had a quiet and old-world air. It reminded one a little of the London which Thackeray knew on that side of the river, and in the Kennington Road, through which the great Baruch of the Newcombs must have passed as it drove the family to the west of London, the plain trees were bursting into leaf. The houses in the street which Philip fixed upon were two-storied, and in most of the windows was a notice to state that lodgings were to let. He knocked at one which announced that lodgings were unfurnished, and was shown by an austere, silent woman. Four very small rooms, in one of which there was a kitchen range and a sink. The rent was nine shillings a week. Philip did not want so many rooms, but the rent was low and he wished to settle down at once. He asked the landlady if she could keep the place clean for him and cook his breakfast, but she replied that she had enough work to do without that and he was pleased rather than otherwise because she intimated that she wished to have nothing more to do with him than to receive his rent. She told him that if he inquired at the grocer's round the corner, which was also a post-office, she might hear of a woman who would do for him. Philip had a little furniture which he had gathered as he went along, an armchair that he bought in Paris, and a table, a few drawings, and the small Persian rug which Cronshaw had given him. His uncle had offered a fold-up bed for which, now that he no longer let his house in August, he had no further use, and by spending another ten pounds Philip bought himself whatever else was essential. He spent ten shillings on putting a corn-colored paper in the room he was making his parlor, and he hung on the walls a sketch which Lawson had given him of the Quai de Grand Augustin and the photograph of the Odalis by Ingres and Manet's Olympia, which in Paris had been the objects of his contemplation while he shaved. To remind himself that he too had once been engaged in the practice of art, he put up a charcoal drawing of the young Spaniard Miguel Ajura. It was the best thing he had ever done, a nude standing with clenched fists, his feet gripping the floor with peculiar force, and on his face that air of determination which had been so impressive and though Philip, after the long interval, saw very well the defects of his work, its associations made him look upon it with tolerance. He wondered what had happened to Miguel. There is nothing so terrible as the pursuit of art by those who have no talent. Perhaps, worn out by exposure, starvation, disease, he had found an end in some hospital, or in an access of despair had sought death in the turbid seine but perhaps with his southern instability he had given up the struggle of his own accord and now a clerk in some office in madrid turned his fervent rhetoric to politics and bullfighting philip asked lawson and hayward to come and see his new rooms and they came one with a bottle of whiskey the other with a pate de foie gras and he was delighted when they praised his taste he would have invited the scotch stockbroker too 
but he had only three chairs, and thus could entertain only a definite number of guests. Lawson was aware that through him Philip had become very friendly with Nora Nesbitt, and now remarked that he had run across her a few days before. She was asking how you were. Philip flushed at the mention of her name. He could not get himself out of the awkward habit of reddening when he was embarrassed, and Lawson looked at him quizzically. Lawson, who now spent most of the year in London, had so far surrendered to his environment as to wear his hair short and to dress himself in a neat serge suit and a bowler hat. "'I gather that all is over between you,' he said. "'I've not seen her for months. She was looking rather nice. She had a very smart hat on with a lot of white ostrich feathers on it. She must be doing pretty well.' Philip changed the conversation, but he kept thinking of her, and after an interval, when the three of them were talking of something else, he asked suddenly, "'Did you gather that Nora was angry with me?' "'Not a bit. She talked very nicely of you. I've got half a mind to go and see her. She won't eat you.' Philip had thought of Nora often. When Mildred left him his first thought was of her, and he told himself bitterly that she would never have treated him so. His impulse was to go to her. He could depend on her pity but he was ashamed. She had been good to him always, and he had treated her abominably. "'If I'd only had the sense to stick to her,' he said to himself afterwards when Lawson and Hayward had gone, and he was smoking a last pipe before going to bed. He remembered the pleasant hours they had spent together in the cosy sitting-room in Vincent Square, their visits to galleries and to the play, and the charming evenings of intimate conversation. He recollected her solicitude for his welfare and her interest in all that concerned him. She had loved him with a love that was kind and lasting. There was more than sensuality in that. It was almost maternal. He had always known that it was a precious thing for which with all his soul he should thank the gods. He made up his mind to throw himself on her mercy. She must have suffered horribly but he felt she had the greatness of heart to forgive him. She was incapable of malice. Should he write to her? No. He would break in on her suddenly and cast himself at her feet. He knew that when the time came he would feel too shy to perform such a dramatic gesture, but that was how he liked to think of it, and tell her that if she would take him back she might rely on him forever. He was cured of the hateful disease from which he had suffered, he knew her worth, and now she might trust him. His imagination leaped forward to the future. He pictured himself rowing with her on the river on Sundays. He would take her to Greenwich. He had never forgotten that delightful excursion with Hayward, and the beauty of the Port of London remained a permanent treasure in his recollection. And on the warm summer afternoons they would sit in the park together and talk. He laughed to himself as he remembered her gay chatter, which poured out like a brook bubbling over little stones, amusing, flippant, and full of character. The agony he had suffered would pass from his mind like a bad dream. But when next day, about tea-time, an hour at which he was pretty certain to find Nora at home, he knocked at her door, his courage suddenly failed him. Was it possible for her to forgive him? it would be abominable of him to force himself on her presence. The door was opened by a maid, new since he had been in the habit of calling every day, and he inquired if Mrs. Nesbitt was in. "'Would you ask her if she could see Mr. Carey?' he said. "'I'll wait here.' The maid ran upstairs, and in a moment clattered down again. "'Will you step up, please, sir? Second floor, front?' "'I know,' said Philip, with a slight smile. He went with a fluttering heart. He knocked at the door. "'Come in,' said the well-known, cheerful voice. It seemed to say come in to a new life of peace and happiness. When he entered Nora stepped forward to greet him. She shook hands with him as if they had parted the day before. A man stood up. "'Mr. Carey? Mr. Kingsford?' Philip, bitterly disappointed at not finding her alone, sat down and took stock of the stranger. He had never heard her mention his name but he seemed to Philip to occupy a chair as though he were very much at home. He was a man of forty, clean-shaven, with long fair hair very neatly plastered down, 
and the reddish skin and pale, tired eyes which fair men get when their youth is past. He had a large nose, a large mouth. The bones of his face were prominent, and he was heavily made. He was a man of more than average height and broad-shouldered. "'I was wondering what had become of you,' said Nora, in her sprightly manner. "'I met Mr. Lawson the other day, did he tell you? And I informed him that it was really high time you came to see me again.' Philip could see no shadow of embarrassment in her countenance, and he admired the use with which she carried off an encounter of which himself felt the intense awkwardness. She gave him tea. She was about to put sugar in it when he stopped her. "'How stupid of me!' she cried. "'I forgot!' He did not believe that. She must remember quite well that he never took sugar in his tea. He accepted the incident as a sign that her nonchalance was affected. The conversation which Philip had interrupted went on, and presently he began to feel a little in the way. Kingsford took no particular notice of him. He talked fluently and well, not without humor, but with a slightly dogmatic manner. He was a journalist, it appeared, and had something amusing to say on every topic that was touched upon. But it exasperated Philip to find himself edged out of the conversation. He was determined to stay the visitor out he wondered if he admired Nora. In the old days they had often talked of the men who wanted to flirt with her and laughed at them together. Philip tried to bring back the conversation to matters which only he and Nora knew about, but each time the journalist broke in and succeeded in drawing it away to a subject upon which Philip was forced to be silent. He grew faintly angry with Nora, for she must see he was being made ridiculous but perhaps she was inflicting this upon him as a punishment, and with this thought he regained his good humor. At last, however, the clock struck six, and Kingsford got up. "'I must go,' he said. Nora shook hands with him and accompanied him to the landing. She shut the door behind her and stood outside for a couple of minutes. Philip wondered what they were talking about. "'Who is Mr. Kingsford?' he asked cheerfully when she returned. Oh, he's the editor of one of the Harmsworth's magazines. He's been taking a good deal of my work lately. I thought he was never going. I'm glad you stayed. I wanted to have a talk with you. She curled up into the large armchair, feet and all, in a way her small size made possible, and lit a cigarette. She smiled when he saw her assume the attitude which had always amused him. You look just like a cat. She gave him a flash of her dark, fine eyes. I really ought to break myself of the habit. It's absurd to behave like a child when you're my age, but I'm comfortable with my legs under me. It's awfully jolly to be sitting in this room again, said Philip happily. You don't know how I've missed it. Why on earth didn't you come before? she asked gaily. I was afraid to, he said, reddening. She gave him a look of kindness. Her lips outlined a charming smile. You needn't have been. He hesitated for a moment his heart beat quickly. Do you remember the last time we met? I treated you awfully badly. I'm dreadfully ashamed of myself. She looked at him steadily. She did not answer. He was losing his head. He seemed to have come on an errand of which he was only now realizing the outrageousness. She did not help him, and he could only blurt out bluntly, Can you ever forgive me? Then impetuously, he told her that Mildred had left him, and that his unhappiness had been so great that he almost killed himself. He told her of all that had happened between them, of the birth of the child, and of the meeting with Griffiths, of his folly and his trust and his immense deception. He told her how often he had thought of her kindness and of her love, and how bitterly he had regretted throwing it away. He had only been happy when he was with her, and he knew now how great was her worth his voice was hoarse with emotion. Sometimes he was so ashamed of what he was saying that he spoke with his eyes fixed on the ground. His face was distorted with pain, and yet he felt it a strange relief to speak. At last he finished. He flung himself back in his chair, exhausted, and waited. He had concealed nothing, and even in his self-abasement he had striven to make himself more despicable than he had really been. He was surprised that she did not speak, and at last he raised his eyes. 
she was not looking at him. Her face was quite white, and she seemed to be lost in thought. "'Haven't you got anything to say to me?' She started and reddened. "'I'm afraid you've had a rotten time,' she said. "'I'm dreadfully sorry.' She seemed about to go on, but she stopped, and again he waited. At length she seemed to force herself to speak. "'I'm engaged to be married to Mr. Kingsford. Why didn't you tell me at once?' he cried. "'You needn't have allowed me to humiliate myself before you.' "'I'm sorry I couldn't stop you. I met him soon after you.' She seemed to search for an expression that she should not wound him. "'Told me your friend had come back. I was very wretched for a bit. He was extremely kind to me. He knew someone had made me suffer. Of course he doesn't know it was you, and I don't know what I should have done without him. And suddenly I felt I couldn't go on working, working, working. I was so tired, I felt so ill. I told him about my husband. He offered to give me the money to get my divorce if I would marry him as soon as I could. He had a very good job, and it wouldn't be necessary for me to do anything unless I wanted to. He was so fond of me and so anxious to take care of me. I was awfully touched, and now I'm very, very fond of him. "'Have you got your divorce, then?' asked Philip. "'I've got the degree Nisi. It'll be made absolute in July, and then we are going to be married at once.' For some time Philip did not say anything. "'I wish I hadn't made such a fool of myself,' he muttered at length. He was thinking of his long humiliating confession. She looked at him curiously. "'You were never really in love with me,' she said. "'It's not very pleasant being in love.' but he was always able to recover himself quickly, and getting up now and holding out his hand he said, "'I hope you'll be very happy. After all it's the best thing that could have happened to you.' She looked a little wistfully at him as she took his hand and held it. "'You'll come and see me again, won't you?' she asked. "'No,' he said, shaking his head. "'It would make me too envious to see you happy.' He walked slowly away from her house. After all, she was right when she said he had never loved her. He was disappointed, irritated even, but his vanity was more affected than his heart. He knew that himself. And presently he grew conscious that the gods had played a very good practical joke on him, and he laughed at himself mirthlessly. It is not very comfortable to have the gift of being amused at one's own absurdity. End of chapter 79 Chapter 80 For the next three months Philip worked on subjects which were new to him. The unwieldy crowd which had entered the medical school nearly two years before had thinned out. Some had left the hospital, finding the examinations more difficult to pass than they expected. Some had been taken away by parents who had not foreseen the expense of life in London, and some had drifted away to other callings. One youth who Philip knew had devised an ingenious plan to make money. He had bought things at sales and pawned them, but presently found it more profitable to pawn goods bought on credit, and it had caused a little excitement at the hospital when someone pointed out his name in police court proceedings. There had been a remand, then assurances on the part of a harassed father, and the young man had gone out to bear the white man's burden overseas. The imagination of another, a lad who had never before been in a town at all, fell to the glamour of music halls and bar parlours. He spent his time among racing men, tipsters and trainers, and now was become a bookmaker's clerk. Philip had seen him once in a bar near Piccadilly Circus, in a tight-waisted coat and a brown hat with a broad flat brim. A third with a gift for singing and mimicry, who had achieved success at the smoking concerts of the medical school by his imitation of notorious comedians, had abandoned the hospital for the chorus of a musical comedy. Still another, and he interested Philip because his uncouth manner and interjectional speech did not suggest that he was capable of any deep emotion, had felt himself stifled among the houses of London. He grew haggard in shut-in spaces, and the soul he knew not he possessed struggled like a sparrow held in the hand with little frightened gasps and a quick palpitation of the heart. He yearned for the broad skies and the open desolate places among which his childhood had been spent. And he walked off one day, without a word to anybody, 
between one lecture and another, and the next thing his friends heard was that he had thrown up medicine and was working on a farm. Philip attended now lectures on medicine and on surgery. On certain mornings in the week he practiced bandaging on outpatients glad to earn a little money, and he was taught auscultation and how to use the stethoscope. He learned dispensing. He was taking the examination in Materia Medica in July, and it amused him to play with various drugs, concocting mixtures, rolling pills, and making ointments. He seized avidly upon anything from which he could extract a suggestion of human interest. He saw Griffiths once in the distance, but, not to have the pain of cutting him dead, avoided him. Philip had felt a certain self-consciousness with Griffiths' friends, some of whom were now friends of his, when he realized they knew of his quarrel with Griffiths and surmised they were aware of the reason. One of them, a very tall fellow with a small head and a languid air, a fellow called Ramsden, who was one of Griffiths' most faithful admirers, copied his ties, his boots, his manner of talking and his gestures, told Philip that Griffiths was very much hurt because Philip had not answered his letter. He wanted to be reconciled with him. "'Has he asked you to give me the message?' asked Philip. "'Oh, no, I'm saying this entirely on my own,' said Ramsden. "'He's awfully sorry for what he did, and he says you always behaved like a perfect brick to him. I know he'll be glad to make it up. He doesn't come to the hospital because he's afraid of meeting you, and he thinks you'd cut him. I should. It makes him feel rather wretched, you know. I can bear the trifling inconvenience that he feels with a good deal of fortitude, said Philip. He'll do anything he can to make it up. How childish and hysterical! Why should he care? I'm a very insignificant person, and he can do very well without my company. I'm not interested in him any more. Ramsden thought Philip hard and cold. He paused for a moment or two, looking about him in a perplexed way. Harry wishes to God he'd never had anything to do with the woman. Does he? asked Philip. He spoke with an indifference which he was satisfied with. No one could have guessed how violently his heart was beating. He waited impatiently for Ramsden to go on. I suppose you've quite got over it now, haven't you? I, said Philip, quite. Little by little he discovered the history of Mildred's relations with Griffiths. He listened with a smile on his lips, feigning an equanimity which quite deceived the dull-witted boy who talked to him. The weekend she spent with Griffiths at Oxford inflamed rather than extinguished her sudden passion, and when Griffiths went home with a feeling that was unexpected in her she determined to stay in Oxford by herself for a couple of days, because she had been so happy in it. She felt that nothing could induce her to go back to Philip. He revolted her. Griffiths was taken aback at the fire he had aroused, for he had found his two days with her in the country somewhat tedious, and he had no desire to turn an amusing episode into a tiresome affair. She made him promise to write to her, and, being an honest, decent fellow, with natural politeness and a desire to make himself pleasant to everybody, when he got home, he wrote her a long and charming letter. She answered it with reams of passion, clumsy, for she had no gift of expression, ill-written and vulgar. The letter bored him, and when it was followed next day by another, and the day after by a third, he began to think her love no longer flattering but alarming. He did not answer, and she bombarded him with telegrams, asking him if he were ill and had received her letters. She said his silence made her dreadfully anxious. He was forced to write, but he sought to make his reply as casual as was possible without being offensive. He begged her not to wire, since it was difficult to explain telegrams to his mother, an old-fashioned person for whom a telegram was still an event to excite tremor. She answered by return of post that she must see him and announced her intention to pawn things. She had the dressing-case which Philip had given her as a wedding present, and could raise eight pounds on that. In order to come up and stay at the market town four miles from which was the village in which his father practiced. This frightened Griffiths, and he this time made use of the telegraph wires to tell her that she must do nothing of the kind. He promised to let her know the moment he came up to London, and when he did, 
found that she had already been asking for him at the hospital at which he had an appointment. He did not like this, and on now seeing her, told Mildred that she was not to come there on any pretext, and now, after an absence of three weeks, he found that she bored him quite decidedly. He wondered why he had ever troubled about her, and made up his mind to break with her as soon as he could. He was a person who dreaded quarrels, nor did he want to give pain, but at the same time he had other things to do, and he was quite determined not to let Mildred bother him. When he met her he was pleasant, cheerful, amusing, affectionate. He invented convincing excuses for the interval since last he had seen her, but he did everything he could to avoid her. When she forced him to make appointments he sent telegrams to her at the last moment to put himself off, and his landlady, the first three months of his appointment he was spending in rooms, had orders to say he was out when Mildred called. She would waylay him in the street, and knowing she had been waiting about for him to come out of the hospital for a couple of hours, he would give her a few charming friendly words and bold off with the excuse that he had a business engagement. He grew very skillful in slipping out of the hospital unseen. Once, when he went back to his lodgings at midnight, he saw a woman standing at the area railings and, suspecting who it was, went to beg a shakedown in Ramsden's rooms. Next day the landlady told him that Mildred had sat crying on the doorsteps for hours, and she had been obliged to tell her at last that if she did not go away she would send for a policeman. "'I tell you, my boy,' said Ramsden, "'you're jolly well out of it. Harry says that if he'd suspected for half a second she was going to make such a blooming nuisance of herself he'd have seen himself damned before he had anything to do with her.' Philip thought of her sitting on that doorstep through the long hours of the night. He saw her face as she looked up dully at the landlady who sent her away. "'I wonder what she's doing now. Oh, she's got a job somewhere, thank God. That keeps her busy all day.' The last thing he heard, just before the end of the summer session, was that Griffiths urbanity had given away at length under the exasperation of the constant persecution. He had told Mildred that he was sick of being pestered and she had better take herself off and not bother him again. It was the only thing he could do, said Ramsden. It was getting a bit too thick. Is it all over then? asked Philip. Oh, he hasn't seen her for ten days. You know, Harry's wonderful at dropping people. This is about the toughest nut he's ever had to crack, but he's cracked it all right. Then Philip heard nothing more of her at all. She vanished into the vast anonymous mass of the population of London. End of chapter 80 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters 81 through 84 of Of Human Bondage this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 81. At the beginning of the winter session, Philip became an outpatient's clerk. There were three assistant physicians who took outpatients two days a week each, and Philip put his name down for Dr. Tyrell. He was popular with the students, and there was some competition to be his clerk. Dr. Tyrell was a tall, thin man of thirty-five, with a very small head, red hair cut short, and prominent blue eyes. His face was bright scarlet. He talked well in a pleasant voice, was fond of a little joke, and treated the world lightly. He was a successful man, with a large consulting practice and a knighthood in prospect. From commerce with students and poor people he had the patronizing air, and from dealing always with the sick he had the healthy man's jovial condescension which some consultants achieve as the professional manner. He made the patient feel like a boy confronted by a jolly schoolmaster. His illness was an absurd piece of naughtiness which amused rather than irritated. The student was supposed to attend in the outpatient's room every day, see cases, and pick up what information he could, but on the days on which he clerked his duties were a little more definite. At that time the outpatients' department at St. Luke's 
consisted of three rooms leading into one another and a large dark waiting-room with massive pillars of masonry and long benches. Here the patients waited after having been given their letters at midday, and the long rows of them, bottles and gallipots in hand, some tattered and dirty, others decent enough, sitting in the dimness, men and women of all ages, children, gave one an impression which was weird and horrible. They suggested the grim drawings of Daumier. All the rooms were painted alike, in salmon color, with a high dado of maroon, and there was in them an odor of disinfectants, mingling as the afternoon wore on with the crude stench of humanity. The first room was the largest, and in the middle of it were a table and an office chair for the physician. On each side of this were two smaller tables, a little lower. At one of these sat the house physician, and at the other the clerk who took the book for the day. This was a large volume in which were written down the name, age, sex, profession of the patient, and the diagnosis of his disease. At half-past one the house physician came in, rang the bell, and told the porter to send in the old patients. There were always a good many of these, and it was necessary to get through as many of them as possible before Dr. Tyrell came at two. The H.P. with whom Philip came in contact was a dapper little man, excessively conscious of his importance. He treated the clerks with condescension and patently resented the familiarity of older students who had been his contemporaries and did not use him with the respect he felt his present position demanded. He set about the cases. A clerk helped him. The patients streamed in. The men came first, chronic bronchitis, a nasty aching cough, was what they chiefly suffered from. One went to the H.P. and the other to the clerk, handing in their letters. If they were going on well, the words Rep. 14 were written on them, and they went to the dispensary with their bottles or gallipots in order to have medicine given them for fourteen days more. Some old stagers held back so that they might be seen by the physician himself, but they seldom succeeded in this and only three or four whose condition seemed to demand his attention were kept. Dr. Tyrell came in with quick movements and a breezy manner. He reminded one slightly of a clown leaping into the arena of a circus with the cry, Here we are again. His air seemed to indicate, What's all this nonsense about being ill? I'll soon put that right. He took his seat, asked if there were any old patients for him to see, rapidly passed them in review, looking at them with shrewd eyes as he discussed their symptoms, cracked a joke, at which all the clerks laughed heartily, with the H.P., who laughed heartily too, but with an air as if he thought it was rather impotent for the clerks to laugh, remarked that it was a fine day or a hot one, and rang the bell for the porter to show in the new patients. They came in one by one and walked up to the table at which sat Dr. Tyrell. They were old men and young men and middle-aged men, mostly of the laboring class, dock laborers, draymen, factory hands, barmen. But some, neatly dressed, were of a station which was obviously superior, shop assistants, clerks, and the like. Dr. Tyrell looked at these with suspicion. Sometimes they put on shabby clothes in order to pretend they were poor, but he had a keen eye to prevent what he regarded as fraud and sometimes refused to see people who, he thought, could well pay for medical attendance. Women were the worst offenders, and they managed the thing more clumsily. They would wear a cloak and a skirt which were almost in rags, and neglect to take the rings off their fingers. If you can afford to wear jewelry you can afford a doctor. A hospital is a charitable institution, said Dr. Tyrell. He handed back the letter and called for the next case. But I've got my letter! I don't care a hang about your letter. You get out. You've got no business to come and steal the time which is wanted by the really poor. The patient retired sulkily with an angry scowl. She'll probably write a letter to the papers on the gross mismanagement of the London hospitals, said Dr. Tyrell with a smile, as he took the next paper and gave the patient one of his shrewd glances. Most of them were under the impression that the hospital was an institution of the state, for which they paid out of the rates, and took the attendance they received as a right they could claim. They imagined the physician who gave them his time was heavily paid. 
Dr. Tyrell gave each of his clerks a case to examine. The clerk took the patient into one of the inner rooms. They were smaller and each had a couch in it covered with black horsehair. He asked his patient a variety of questions, examined his lungs, his heart, and his liver, made notes of the fact on the hospital paper, formed in his own mind some idea of the diagnosis, and then waited for Dr. Tyrell to come in. This he did, followed by a small crowd of students, when he had finished the men, and the clerk read out what he had learned. The physician asked him one or two questions and examined the patient himself. If there was anything interesting to hear, students applied their stethoscope. You would see a man with two or three to the chest, and two perhaps to his back, while others waited impatiently to listen. The patient stood among them a little embarrassed, but not altogether displeased to find himself the center of attention. He listened confusedly while Dr. Tyrell discoursed glibly on the case. Two or three students listened again to recognize the murmur or the crepitation which the physician described, and then the man was told to put on his clothes. When the various cases had been examined, Dr. Tyrell went back into the large room and sat down again at his desk. He asked any student who happened to be standing near him what he would prescribe for a patient he had just seen. The student mentioned one or two drugs. "'Would you?' said Dr. Tyrell. "'Well, that's original at all events.' I don't think we'll be rash. This always made the students laugh, and with a twinkle of amusement at his own bright humor, the physician prescribed some other drug than that which the student had suggested. When there were two cases of exactly the same sort, and the student proposed the treatment which the physician had ordered for the first, Dr. Tyrell exercised considerable ingenuity in thinking of something else. Sometimes, knowing that in the dispensary they were worked off their legs and preferred to give the medicines which they had already, the good hospital mixtures which had been found by the experience of years to answer their purpose so well, he amused himself by writing an elaborate prescription. We'll give the dispenser something to do. If we go on prescribing mist, how he'll lose his cunning. The students laughed and the doctor gave them a circular glance of enjoyment in his joke. Then he touched the bell, and, when the porter poked his head in, said, "'Old women, please.' He leaned back in his chair, chatting with the H.P., while the porter herded along the old patients. They came in, strings of anemic girls, with large fringes and pallid lips, who could not digest their bad, insufficient food. Old ladies, fat and thin, aged prematurely by frequent confinements with winter coughs women with this, that, and the other the matter with them. Dr. Tyrell and his house physician got through them quickly. Time was getting on and the air in the small room was growing more sickly. The physician looked at his watch. "'Are there many new women today?' he asked. "'A good few, I think,' said the H.P. "'We'd better have them in. You can go on with the old ones.' They entered. With the men the most common ailments were due to the excessive use of alcohol, but with the women they were due to defective nourishment. By about six o'clock they were finished. Philip, exhausted by standing all the time, by the bad air and by the attention he had given, strolled over with his fellow clerks to the medical school to have tea. He found the work of absorbing interest. There was humanity there in the rough, the materials the artist worked on and Philip felt a curious thrill when it occurred to him that he was in the position of the artist, and the patients were like clay in his hands. He remembered with an amused shrug of the shoulders his life in Paris, absorbed in color, tone, and values, heaven knows what, with the aim of producing beautiful things. The directness of contact with men and women gave a thrill of power which he had never known. He found an endless excitement in looking at their faces and hearing them speak. They came in, each with his peculiarity, some shuffling uncouthly, some with a little trip, others with heavy, slow tread, some shyly. Often you could guess their trades by the look of them. You learnt in what way to put your questions so that they should be understood. You discovered on what subjects nearly all lied, and by what inquiries you could extort the truth notwithstanding. You saw the different way people took the same things. 
the diagnosis of dangerous illness would be accepted by one with a laugh and a joke, by another with dumb despair. Philip found that he was less shy with these people than he had ever been with others. He felt not exactly sympathy, for sympathy suggests condescension, but he felt at home with them. He found that he was able to put them at their ease, and when he had been given a case to find out what he could about it, it seemed to him that the patient delivered himself into his hands with the peculiar confidence. Perhaps, he thought to himself with a smile, perhaps I'm cut out to be a doctor. It would be rather a lark if I'd hit upon the one thing I'm fit for. It seemed to Philip that he alone of the clerks saw the dramatic interest of those afternoons. To the others men and women were only cases, good if they were complicated, tiresome if obvious. They heard murmurs and were astonished at abnormal livers. An unexpected sound in the lungs gave them something to talk about. But to Philip there was much more. He found an interest in just looking at them, in the shape of their heads and their hands, in the look of their eyes and the length of their noses. You saw in that room human nature taken by surprise, and often the mask of custom was torn off rudely, showing you the soul all raw. Sometimes you saw an untaught stoicism which was profoundly moving. Once Philip saw a man, rough and illiterate, told his case was hopeless, and, self-controlled himself, he wondered at the splendid instinct which forced the fellow to keep a stiff upper lip before strangers. But was it possible for him to be brave when he was by himself, face to face with his soul, or would he then surrender to despair? Sometimes there was a tragedy. Once a young woman brought her sister to be examined, a girl of eighteen, with delicate features and large blue eyes, fair hair that sparkled with gold when a ray of autumn sunshine touched it for a moment, and a skin of amazing beauty. The student's eyes went to her with little smiles. They did not often see a pretty girl in these dingy rooms. The elderly woman gave the family history, father and mother had died of phthisis, a brother and a sister, these two were the only ones left. The girl had been coughing lately and losing weight. She took off her blouse and the skin of her neck was like milk. Dr. Tyrell examined her quietly with his usual rapid method. He told two or three of his clerks to apply their stethoscopes to a place he indicated with his finger, and then she was allowed to dress. The sister was standing a little apart, and she spoke to him in a low voice so that the girl should not hear. Her voice trembled with fear. "'She hasn't got it, doctor, has she?' "'I'm afraid there's no doubt about it. She was the last one. When she goes I shan't have anybody.' She began to cry while the doctor looked at her gravely. He thought she too had the type. She would not make old bones either. The girl turned round and saw her sister's tears. She understood what they meant. The color fled from her lovely face and tears fell down her cheeks. The two stood for a minute or two crying silently, and then the older, forgetting the indifferent crowd that watched them, went up to her took her in her arms and rocked her gently to and fro, as if she were a baby. When they were gone a student asked, "'How long do you think she'll last, sir?' Dr. Tyrell shrugged his shoulders. "'Her brother and sister died within three months of the first symptoms. She'll do the same. If they were rich one might do something. You can't tell these people to go to St. Moritz. Nothing can be done for them.' Once a man who was strong and in all the power of his manhood came because a persistent aching troubled him, and his club doctor did not seem to do him any good. And the verdict for him, too, was death, not the inevitable death that horrified and yet was tolerable because science was helpless before it, but the death which was inevitable because the man was a little wheel in the great machine of a complex civilization and had as little power of changing the circumstances as an automaton. Complete rest was his only chance. The physician did not ask impossibilities. "'You ought to get some very much lighter job. There ain't no light jobs in my business. Well, if you go on like this you'll kill yourself. You're very ill. Do you mean to say I'm going to die?' 
I shouldn't like to say that, but you're certainly unfit for hard work. If I don't work, who's to keep the wife and kids? Dr. Tyrell shrugged his shoulders. The dilemma had been presented to him a hundred times. Time was pressing, and there were many patients to be seen. Well, I'll give you some medicine, and you can come back in a week and tell me how you're getting on. The man took his letter with the useless prescription written upon it and walked out. The doctor might say what he liked. He did not feel so bad that he could not go on working. He had a good job, and he could not afford to throw it away. I give him a year, said Dr. Tyrell. Sometimes there was comedy. Now and then a flash of cockney humor, now and then some old lady, a character such as Charles Dickens might have drawn, would amuse them by her garrulous oddities. Once a woman came out who was a member of the ballet at a famous music hall. She looked fifty, but gave her age as twenty-eight. She was outrageously painted and ogled the students impudently with large black eyes. Her smiles were grossly alluring. She had abundant self-confidence and treated Dr. Tyrell, vastly amused, with the easy familiarity with which she might have used an intoxicated admirer. She had chronic bronchitis and told him it hindered her in the exercise of her profession. I don't know why I should have such a thing. Upon my word I don't. I've never had a day's illness in my life. You've only got to look at me to know that. She rolled her eyes round the young men with a long sweep of her painted eyelashes and flashed her yellow teeth at them. She spoke with a cockney accent, but with an affectation of refinement which made every word a feast of fun. "'That's what they call a winter cough,' answered Dr. Tyrell gravely. "'A great many middle-aged women have it. Well, I never. That is a nice thing to say to a lady. No one ever called me middle-aged before.' She opened her eyes very wide, and cocked her head on one side, looking at him with indescribable archness. "'That is the disadvantage of our profession,' said he. "'It forces us sometimes to be ungallant.' She took the prescription and gave him one last luscious smile. "'You will come and see me dance, dearie, won't you?' "'I will, indeed.' He rang the bell for the next case. "'I am glad you gentlemen were here to protect me.' But on the whole the impression was neither of tragedy nor of comedy. There was no describing it. It was manifold and various. There were tears and laughter, happiness and woe. It was tedious and interesting and indifferent. It was as you saw it. It was tumultuous and passionate. It was grave. It was sad and comic. It was trivial. It was simple and complex. Joy was there and despair. The love of mothers for their children and of men for women. Lust trailed itself through the rooms with leaden feet, punishing the guilty and the innocent, helpless wives and wretched children. Drink seized men and women and cost its inevitable price. Death sighed in these rooms, and the beginning of life filling some poor girl with terror and shame was diagnosed there. There was neither good nor bad there. There were just facts. It was life. End of chapter 81 Chapter 82 Towards the end of the year, when Philip was bringing to a close his three months as a clerk in the outpatients department, he received a letter from Lawson, who was in Paris. Dear Philip, Cronshaw is in London and would be glad to see you. He is living at 43 Hyde Street, Soho. I don't know where it is, but I dare say you will be able to find out. Be a brick and look after him a bit. He is very down on his luck. He will tell you what he is doing. Things are going on here very much as usual. Nothing seems to have changed since you were here. Clutton is back, but he has become quite impossible. He has quarreled with everybody. As far as I can make out, he hasn't got a cent. He lives in a little studio right away beyond the Jardin des Plantes, but he won't let anybody see his work. He doesn't show anywhere, so one doesn't know what he is doing. He may be a genius, but on the other hand he may be off his head. By the way, I ran against Flanagan the other day. He was showing Mrs. Flanagan round the quarter. 
He has chucked art and is now in Popper's business. He seems to be rolling. Mrs. Flanagan is very pretty, and I'm trying to work a portrait. How much would you ask if you were me? I don't want to frighten them, and then, on the other hand, I don't want to be such an ass as to ask a hundred and fifty francs if they're quite willing to give three hundred francs. Yours ever, Frederick Lawson. Philip wrote to Cronshaw and received in reply the following letter. It was written on a half-sheet of common note-paper, and the flimsy envelope was dirtier than was justified by its passage through the post. Dear Carrie, of course I remember you very well. I have an idea that I had some part in rescuing you from the slough of despond in which myself am hopelessly immersed. I shall be glad to see you. I am a stranger in a strange city, and I am buffeted by the Philistines. It will be pleasant to talk of Paris. I do not ask you to come and see me, since my lodging is not of a magnificence fit for the reception of an eminent member of Monsieur Pougon's profession, but you will find me eating modestly any evening between seven and eight at a restaurant eclat au bon plaisir in Dean Street. Yours sincerely, J. Cronshaw. Philip went the day he received this letter. The restaurant, consisting of one small room, was of the poorest class, and Cronshaw seemed to be its only customer. He was sitting in the corner, well away from drafts, wearing the same shabby great coat which Philip had never seen him without, with his old bowler on his head. "'I eat here because I can be alone,' he said. "'They are not doing well. The only people who come are a few trollops and one or two waiters out of a job. They are giving up business, and the food is execrable. But the ruin of their fortunes is my advantage.' Cronshaw had before him a glass of absinthe. It was nearly three years since they had met, and Philip was shocked by the change in his appearance. He had been rather corpulent, but now he had a dried-up yellow look. The skin of his neck was loose and wrinkled. His clothes hung about him as though they had been bought for someone else, and his collar, three or four sizes too large, added to the slatternliness of his appearance. His hands trembled continually. Philip remembered the handwriting which scrawled over the page with shapeless haphazard letters. Cronshaw was evidently very ill. "'I eat little these days,' he said. "'I'm very sick in the morning. I'm just having some soup for my dinner, and then I shall have a bit of cheese.' Philip's glance unconsciously went to the absinthe, and Cronshaw, seeing it, gave him the quizzical look with which he reproved the admonitions of common sense. You have diagnosed my case, and you think it's very wrong of me to drink absinthe. You've evidently got cirrhosis of the liver, said Philip. Evidently. He looked at Philip in the way which had formerly had the power of making him feel incredibly narrow. It seemed to point out that what he was thinking was distressingly obvious. And when you have agreed with the obvious, what more is there to say? Philip changed the topic. When are you going back to Paris? I'm not going back to Paris. I'm going to die. The very naturalness with which he said this startled Philip. He thought of a half a dozen things to say, but they seemed futile. He knew that Cronshaw was a dying man. Are you going to settle in London, then? he asked lamely. What is London to me? I am a fish out of water. I walk through the crowded streets, men jostle me, and I seem to walk in a dead city. I felt that I couldn't die in Paris. I wanted to die among my own people. I don't know what hidden instinct drew me back at the last. Philip knew of the woman Cronshaw had lived with and the two draggle-tailed children, but Cronshaw had never mentioned them to him, and he did not like to speak of them. He wondered what had happened to them. I don't know why you talk of dying, he said. I had pneumonia a couple of winters ago and they told me then it was a miracle that I came through. It appears I'm extremely liable to it, and another bout will kill me. Oh, what nonsense! You're not so bad as all that. You've only got to take precautions. Why don't you give up drinking? Because I don't choose. It doesn't matter what a man does if he's ready to take the consequences. Well, I'm ready to take the consequences. You talk glibly of giving up drinking, but it's the only thing I've got left now. What do you think life would be to me without it? 
can you understand the happiness I get out of my absinthe? I yearn for it, and when I drink it I savor every drop, and afterwards I feel my soul swimming in ineffable happiness. It disgusts you. You are a Puritan, and in your heart you despise sensual pleasures. Sensual pleasures are the most violent and the most exquisite. I am a man blessed with vivid senses, and I have indulged them with all my soul. I have to pay the penalty now, and I am ready to pay. Philip looked at him for a while steadily. Aren't you afraid? For a moment Cronshaw did not answer. He seemed to consider his reply. Sometimes when I'm alone, he looked at Philip. You think that's a condemnation? You're wrong. I'm not afraid of my fear. It's folly, the Christian argument that you should live always in view of your death. The only way to live is to forget that you're going to die. Death is unimportant. The fear of it should never influence a single action of the wise man. I know that I shall die struggling for breath, and I know that I shall be horribly afraid. I know that I shall not be able to keep myself from regretting bitterly the life that has brought me to such a pass. But I disown that regret. I now, weak, old, diseased, poor, dying, hold still my soul in my hands, and I regret nothing. "'Do you remember that Persian carpet you gave me?' asked Philip. Cronshaw smiled his old, slow smile of past days. "'I told you it would give you an answer to your question when you asked me what was the meaning of life. Well, have you discovered the answer?' "'No,' smiled Philip. "'Won't you tell it to me?' "'No, no, I can't do that. The answer is meaningless unless you discover it for yourself.'" End of chapter 82 Chapter 83 Cronshaw was publishing his poems. His friends had been urging him to do this for years, but his laziness made it impossible for him to take the necessary steps. He had always answered their exhortations by telling them that the love of poetry was dead in England. You brought out a book which had cost you years of thought and labor. It was given two or three contemptuous lines among a batch of similar volumes, twenty or thirty copies were sold, and the rest of the edition was pulped. He had long since worn out the desire for fame. That was an illusion like all else. But one of his friends had taken the matter into his own hands. This was a man of letters named Leonard Upjohn, whom Philip had met once or twice with Cronshaw in the cafés of the quarter. He had a considerable reputation in England as a critic and was the accredited exponent in this country of modern French literature. He had lived a good deal in France among the men who made the Mercure de France the liveliest review of the day, and by the simple process of expressing in English their point of view he had acquired in England a reputation for originality. Philip had read some of his articles. He had formed a style for himself by a close imitation of Sir Thomas Brown. He used elaborate sentences, carefully balanced and obsolete, resplendent words. It gave his writing an appearance of individuality. Leonard Upjohn had induced Cronshaw to give him all his poems and found that there were enough to make a volume of reasonable size. He promised to use his influence with publishers. Cronshaw was in want of money. Since his illness he had found it more difficult than ever to work steadily. He made barely enough to keep himself in liquor, and when Upjohn wrote to him that this publisher and the other, though admiring the poems, thought it not worth while to publish them, Cronshaw began to grow interested. He wrote impressing upon Upjohn his great need and urging him to make more strenuous efforts. Now that he was going to die he wanted to leave behind him a published book, and at the back of his mind was the feeling that he had produced great poetry. He expected to burst upon the world like a new star. There was something fine in keeping to himself these treasures of beauty all his life and giving them to the world disdainfully when he and the world parting company he had no further use for them. His decision to come to England was caused directly by an announcement from Leonard Upjohn that a publisher had consented to print the poems. By a miracle of persuasion Upjohn had persuaded him to give ten pounds 
in advance of royalties. "'In advance of royalties, mind you,' said Cronshaw to Philip. "'Milton only got ten pounds down. Upjohn had promised to write a signed article about them, and he would ask his friends who reviewed to do their best. Cronshaw pretended to treat the matter with detachment, but it was easy to see that he was delighted with the thought of the stir he would make. One day Philip went to dine by arrangement at the wretched eating-house at which Cronshaw insisted on taking his meals. But Cronshaw did not appear. Philip learned that he had not been there for three days. He got himself something to eat and went round to the address from which Cronshaw had first written to him. He had some difficulty in finding Hyde Street. It was a street of dingy houses huddled together. Many of the windows had been broken and were clumsily repaired with strips of French newspaper. The doors had not been painted for years. There were shabby little shops on the ground floor, laundries, cobblers, stationers. Ragged children played in the road, and an old barrel organ was grinding out a vulgar tune. Philip knocked at the door of Cronshaw's house. There was a shop of cheap sweetstuffs at the bottom, and it was opened by an elderly Frenchwoman in a dirty apron. Philip asked her if Cronshaw was in. "'Ah, yes, there is an Englishman who lives at the top, at the back. I don't know if he's in. If you want him you had better go up and see.' The staircase was lit by one jet of gas. There was a revolting odour in the house. When Philip was passing up a woman came out of a room on the first floor, looked at him suspiciously, but made no remark. There were three doors on the top landing. Philip knocked at one and knocked again. There was no reply. He tried the handle, but the door was locked. He knocked at another door, got no answer, and tried the door again. It opened. The room was dark. Who's that? He recognized Cronshaw's voice. Carrie, can I come in? He received no answer. He walked in. The window was closed and the stink was overpowering. There was a certain amount of light from the arc lamp in the street, and he saw that it was a small room with two beds in it end to end. There was a washing stand and one chair, but they left little space for anyone to move in. Cronshaw was in the bed nearest the window. He made no movement, but gave a low chuckle. "'Why don't you light the candle?' he said then. Philip struck a match and discovered that there was a candlestick on the floor beside the bed. He lit it and put it on the washing-stand. Cronshaw was lying on his back immobile. He looked very odd in his nightshirt, and his baldness was disconcerting. His face was earthy and death-like. "'I say, old man, you look awfully ill.' Is there any one to look after you here? George brings me in a bottle of milk in the morning before he goes to his work. Who's George? I call him George because his name is Adolphe. He shares this palatial apartment with me. Philip noticed then that the second bed had not been made since it was slept in. The pillow was black where the head had rested. You don't mean to say you're sharing this room with somebody else, he cried. Why not? lodging costs money in Soho. George is a waiter. He goes out at eight in the morning and does not come in till closing time, so he isn't in my way at all. We, neither of us, sleep well, and he helps to pass away the hours of the night by telling me stories of his life. He's a Swiss, and I've always had a taste for waiters. They see life from an entertaining angle. How long have you been in bed? Three days." Do you mean to say you've had nothing but a bottle of milk for the last three days? Why on earth didn't you send me a line? I can't bear to think of you lying here all day long without a soul to attend to you. Cronshaw gave a little laugh. Look at your face. Why, dear boy, I really believe you're distressed. You nice fellow. Philip blushed. He had not suspected that his face showed the dismay he felt at the sight of that horrible room and the wretched circumstances of the poor poet. Cronshaw, watching Philip, went on with a gentle smile. "'I've been quite happy. Look, here are my proofs. Remember that I am indifferent to discomforts which would harass other folk. What do the circumstances of life matter if your dreams make you lord paramount of time and space?' The proofs were lying on his bed, and as he lay in the darkness he had been able to place his hands on them. He showed them to Philip, and his eyes glowed. 
he turned over the pages, rejoicing in the clear type. He read out a stanza. They don't look bad, do they? Philip had an idea. It would involve him in a little expense, and he could not afford even the smallest increase of expenditure. But on the other hand, this was a case where it revolted him to think of economy. I say, I can't bear the thought of your remaining here. I've got an extra room, it's empty at present, but I can easily get someone to lend me a bed. Won't you come and live with me for a while? It'll save you the rent of this. Oh, my dear boy, you'd insist on my keeping my window open. You shall have every window in the place sealed if you like. I shall be all right tomorrow. I could have got up today, only I felt lazy. Then you can very easily make the move, and then if you don't feel well at any time you can just go to bed and I shall be there to look after you. If it'll please you, I'll come, said Cronshaw, with his torpid, not unpleasant smile. That'll be ripping. They settled that Philip should fetch Cronshaw next day, and Philip snatched an hour from his busy morning to arrange the change. He found Cronshaw dressed, sitting in his hat and great coat on the bed, with a small shabby portmanteau containing his clothes and books already packed. It was on the floor by his feet, and he looked as if he were sitting in the waiting-room of a station. Philip laughed at the sight of him. They went over to Kennington in a four-wheeler, of which the windows were carefully closed, and Philip installed his guest in his own room. He had gone out early in the morning and bought for himself a second-hand bedstead, a cheap chest of drawers, and a looking-glass. Cronshaw settled down at once to correct his proofs. He was much better. Philip found him, except for the irritability which was a symptom of his disease, an easy guest. He had a lecture at nine in the morning, so did not see Cronshaw till the night. Once or twice Philip persuaded him to share the scrappy meal he prepared for himself in the evening, but Cronshaw was too restless to stay in and preferred generally to get himself something to eat in one or other of the cheapest restaurants in Soho. Philip asked him to see Dr. Tyrell, but he stoutly refused. He knew a doctor would tell him to stop drinking, and this he was resolved not to do. He always felt horribly ill in the morning, but his absinthe at midday put him on his feet again, and by the time he came home at midnight he was able to talk with the brilliancy which had astonished Philip when first he made his acquaintance. His proofs were corrected and the volume was to come out among the publications of the early spring, when the public might be supposed to have recovered from the avalanche of Christmas books. End of chapter 83 Chapter 84 At the new year Philip became dresser in the surgical outpatients department. The work was of the same character as that which he had just been engaged on, but with the greater directness which surgery has than medicine and a larger proportion of the patients suffered from those two diseases which a supine public allows, in its prudishness, to be spread broadcast. The assistant surgeon for whom Philip dressed was called Jacobs. He was a short fat man with an exuberant joviality, a bald head, and a loud voice. He had a cockney accent and was generally described by the students as an awful bounder, but his cleverness, both as a surgeon and as a teacher, caused some of them to overlook this. He had also a considerable fastidiousness, which he exercised impartially on the patients and on the students. He took a great pleasure in making his dressers look foolish. Since they were ignorant, nervous, and could not answer as if he were their equal, this was not very difficult. He enjoyed his afternoons with the home truths he permitted himself much more than the students who had to put up with them with a smile. One day a case came up of a boy with a club foot. His parents wanted to know whether anything could be done. Mr. Jacobs turned to Philip. "'You'd better take this case, Carrie. It's a subject you ought to know something about.' Philip flushed all the more because the surgeon spoke obviously with a humorous intention, and his brow-beaten dressers laughed obsequiously. It was in point of fact a subject which Philip, since coming to the hospital, had studied with anxious attention. He had read everything in the library which treated of talipes in its various forms. He made the boy take off his boot and stocking. 
He was fourteen, with a snub nose, blue eyes, and a freckled face. His father explained that they wanted something done if possible. It was such a hindrance to the kid in earning his living. Philip looked at him curiously. He was a jolly boy, not at all shy, but talkative and with a cheekiness which his father reproved. He was much interested in his foot. "'It's only for the looks of the thing, you know,' he said to Philip. "'I don't find it no trouble.' "'Be quiet, Ernie,' said his father. "'There's too much gas about you.' Philip examined the foot and passed his hand slowly over the shapelessness of it. He could not understand why the boy felt none of the humiliation which always oppressed him. He wondered why he could not take his deformity with that philosophic indifference. Presently Mr. Jacobs came up to him. The boy was sitting on the edge of a couch, the surgeon and Philip stood on each side of him, and in a semicircle crowding round were students. With accustomed brilliancy Jacobs gave a graphic little discourse upon the club foot. He spoke of its varieties and of the forms which followed upon different anatomical conditions. "'I suppose you've got Talipes equinus,' he said, turning suddenly to Philip. "'Yes.' Philip felt the eyes of his fellow students rest on him, and he cursed himself because he could not help blushing. He felt the sweat start up in the palms of his hands. The surgeon spoke with the fluency due to long practice and with the admirable perspicacity which distinguished him. He was tremendously interested in his profession, but Philip did not listen. He was only wishing that the fellow would get done quickly. Suddenly he realized that Jacobs was addressing him. "'You don't mind taking off your sock for a moment, Carrie?' Philip felt a shudder pass through him. He had an impulse to tell the surgeon to go to hell, but he had not the courage to make a scene. He feared his brutal ridicule. He forced himself to appear indifferent. "'Not a bit,' he said. He sat down and unlaced his boot. His fingers were trembling and he thought he should never untie the knot. He remembered how they had forced him at school to show his foot and the misery which had eaten into his soul. "'He keeps his feet nice and clean, doesn't he?' said Jacobs in his raspy cockney voice. The attendant students giggled. Philip noticed that the boy whom they were examining looked down at his foot with eager curiosity. Jacobs took the foot in his hands and said, "'Yes, that's what I thought. I see you've had an operation. When you were a child, I suppose.' He went on with his fluent explanations. The students leaned over and looked at the foot. Two or three examined it minutely when Jacobs let it go. "'When you're quite done,' said Philip with a smile, ironically. He could have killed them all. He thought how jolly it would be to jab a chisel. He didn't know why that particular instrument came into his mind, into their necks. What beasts men were! He wished he could believe in hell so as to comfort himself with the thought of the horrible tortures which would be theirs. Mr. Jacobs turned his attention to treatment. He talked partly to the boy's father and partly to the students. Philip put on his sock and laced his boot. At last the surgeon finished, but he seemed to have an afterthought and turned to Philip. "'You know, I think it might be worth your while to have an operation. Of course I couldn't give you a normal foot, but I think I can do something. You might think about it, and when you want a holiday you can just come into the hospital for a bit.' Philip had often asked himself whether anything could be done, but his distaste for any reference to the subject had prevented him from consulting any of the surgeons at the hospital. His reading told him that whatever might have been done when he was a small boy, and then treatment of talipes was not as skillful as in the present day, there was small chance now of any great benefit. Still, it would be worth while if an operation made it possible for him to wear a more ordinary boot and to limp less. He remembered how passionately he had prayed for the miracle which his uncle had assured him was possible to omnipotence. He smiled ruefully. I was rather a simple soul in those days, he thought. Towards the end of February it was clear that Cronshaw was growing much worse. He was no longer able to get up. He lay in bed, insisting that the window should be closed always, and refused to see a doctor. He would take little nourishment, but demanded whiskey and cigarettes. Philip knew that he should have neither, but Cronshaw's argument was unanswerable. I dare say they are killing me. I don't care. 
you've warned me, you've done all that was necessary, I ignore your warning. Give me something to drink and be damned to you. Leonard Upjohn blew in two or three times a week, and there was something of the dead leaf in his appearance which made the word exactly descriptive of the manner of his appearance. He was a weedy-looking fellow of five-and-thirty, with long pale hair and a white face. He had the look of a man who lived too little in the open air. He wore a hat like a dissenting minister's. Philip disliked him for his patronizing manner and was bored by his fluent conversation. Leonard Upjohn liked to hear himself talk. He was not sensitive to the interest of his listeners, which is the first requisite of the good talker, and he never realized that he was telling people what they knew already. With measured words he told Philip what to think of Rodin, Albert Semaine, and Caesar Franck. Philip's charwoman only came in for an hour in the morning, and since Philip was obliged to be at the hospital all day, Cronshaw was left much alone. Upjohn told Philip that he thought someone should remain with him, but did not offer to make it possible. It's dreadful to think of that great poet alone. Why, he might die without a soul at hand. I think he very probably will, said Philip. How can you be so callous? Why don't you come and do your work here every day, and then you'd be near if he wanted anything? asked Philip dryly. I? My dear fellow, I can only work in the surroundings I'm used to, and besides I go out so much. Upjohn was also a little put out because Philip had brought Cronshaw to his own rooms. I wish you'd had left him in Soho, he said with a wave of his long thin hands. There was a touch of romance in that sordid attic. I could even bear it if it were Wapping or Shoreditch, but the respectability of Kennington! What a place for a poet to die! Cronshaw was often so ill-tempered that Philip could only keep his temper by remembering all the time that this irritability was a symptom of the disease. Upjohn came sometimes before Philip was in, and then Cronshaw would complain of him bitterly. Upjohn listened with complacency. The fact is that Carey has no sense of beauty, he smiled. He has a middle-class mind. He was very sarcastic to Philip, and Philip exercised a good deal of self-control in his dealings with him. But one evening he could not contain himself. He had had a hard day at the hospital and was tired out. Leonard Upjohn came to him while he was making himself a cup of tea in the kitchen and said that Cronshaw was complaining of Philip's insistence that he should have a doctor. "'Don't you realize that you're enjoying a very rare, a very exquisite privilege? You ought to do everything in your power, surely, to show your sense of the greatness of your trust. It's a rare and exquisite privilege which I can ill afford,' said Philip. Whenever there was any question of money, Leonard Upjohn assumed a slightly disdainful expression. His sensitive temperament was offended by the reference. "'There's something fine in Cronshaw's attitude, and you disturb it by your importunity. You should make allowances for the delicate imaginings which you cannot feel.' Philip's face darkened. "'Let us go into Cronshaw,' he said frigidly. The poet was lying on his back reading a book with a pipe in his mouth. The air was musty, and the room, notwithstanding Philip's tidying up, had the bedraggled look which seemed to accompany Cronshaw wherever he went. He took off his spectacles as they came in. Philip was in a towering rage. Upjohn tells me you've been complaining to him because I've urged you to have a doctor, he said. I want you to have a doctor, because you may die any day, and if you hadn't been seen by anyone I shouldn't be able to get a certificate. There'd have to be an inquest, and I should be blamed for not calling a doctor in. I hadn't thought of that. I thought you wanted me to see a doctor for my sake and not for your own. I'll see a doctor whenever you like." Philip did not answer, but gave an almost imperceptible shrug of the shoulders. Cronshaw, watching him, gave a little chuckle. "'Don't look so angry, my dear. I know very well that you want to do everything you can for me. Let's see your doctor. Perhaps he can do something for me, and at any rate it'll comfort you. He turned his eyes to Upjohn. You're a damned fool, Leonard. Why do you want to worry the boy? 
he has quite enough to do to put up with me. You'll do nothing more for me than write a pretty article about me after my death. I know you. Next day Philip went to Dr. Tyrell. He felt that he was the sort of man to be interested by the story, and as soon as Tyrell was free of his day's work he accompanied Philip to Kennington. He could only agree with what Philip had told him. The case was hopeless. I'll take him into the hospital if you like, he said. He can have a small ward nothing would induce him to come. You know he may die any minute, or else he may get another attack of pneumonia. Philip nodded. Dr. Tyrell made one or two suggestions and promised to come again whenever Philip wanted him to. He left his address. When Philip went back to Cronshaw he found him quietly reading. He did not trouble to inquire what the doctor had said. "'Are you satisfied now, dear boy?' he asked. I suppose nothing will induce you to do any of the things Tyrell advised? Nothing, smiled Cronshaw. End of chapter 84 Recording by Tom Weiss Tom's Audiobooks dot com Chapters 85 through 87 of Of Human Bondage this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Weiss. Of Human Bondage by W. Somerset Maughan. Chapter 85. About a fortnight after this, Philip, coming home one evening after his day's work at the hospital, knocked at the door of Cronshaw's room. He got no answer and walked in. Cronshaw was lying huddled up on one side and Philip went up to the bed. He did not know whether Cronshaw was asleep or merely lay there in one of his uncontrollable fits of irritability. He was surprised to see that his mouth was open. He touched his shoulder. Philip gave a cry of dismay. He slipped his hand under Cronshaw's shirt and felt his heart. He did not know what to do. Helplessly, because he had heard of this being done, he held a looking-glass in front of his mouth. It startled him to be alone with Cronshaw. He had his hat and coat still on, and he ran down the stairs into the street. He hailed a cab and drove to Harley Street. Dr. Tyrell was in. "'I say, would you mind coming at once? I think Cronshaw's dead. If he is, it's not much good my coming, is it? I should be awfully grateful if you would. I've got a cab at the door. It'll only take a half an hour.' Tyrell put on his hat. In the cab he asked him one or two questions. "'He seemed no worse than usual when I left this morning,' said Philip. "'It gave me an awful shock when I went in just now, and the thought of his dying all alone. Do you think he knew he was going to die?' Philip remembered what Cronshaw had said. He wondered whether at the last moment he had been seized with the terror of death. Philip imagined himself in such a plight, knowing it was inevitable and with no one not a soul, to give an encouraging word when the fear seized him. "'You're rather upset,' said Dr. Tyrell. He looked at him with his bright blue eyes. They were not unsympathetic. When he saw Cronshaw, he said, he must have been dead for some hours. I should think he died in his sleep. They do sometimes. The body looked shrunk and ignoble. It was not like anything human. Dr. Tyrell looked at it dispassionately. With a mechanical gesture he took out his watch. "'Well, I must be getting along. I'll send the certificate round. I suppose you'll communicate with the relatives?' "'I don't think there are any,' said Philip. "'How about the funeral?' "'Oh, I'll see to that.' Dr. Tyrell gave Philip a glance. He wondered whether he ought to offer a couple of sovereigns towards it. He knew nothing of Philip's circumstances. Perhaps he could well afford the expense.' Philip might think it impertinent if he made any suggestion. "'Well, let me know if there's anything I can do,' he said. Philip and he went out together, parting on the doorstep, and Philip went to a telegraph office in order to send a message to Leonard Upjohn. Then he went to an undertaker whose shop he passed every day on his way to the hospital. His attention had been drawn to it often by the three words in silver lettering on a black cloth which, with two model coffins, adorned the window. Economy, celerity, 
propriety. They had always diverted him. The undertaker was a little fat Jew with curly black hair, long and greasy, in black with a large diamond ring on a podgy finger. He received Philip with the peculiar manner formed by the mingling of his natural blatancy with the subdued air proper to his calling. He quickly saw that Philip was very helpless and promised to send round a woman at once to perform the needful offices. His suggestions for the funeral were very magnificent, and Philip felt ashamed of himself when the undertaker seemed to think his objections mean. It was horrible to haggle on such a matter, and finally Philip consented to an expensiveness which he could ill afford. "'I quite understand, sir,' said the undertaker. "'You don't want any show in that. I'm not a believer in ostentation myself, mind you, but you want it done gentlemanly-like. You leave it to me. I'll do it as cheap as it can be done, having regard to what's right and proper. I can't say more than that, can I?' Philip went home to eat his supper and while he ate the woman came along to lay out the corpse. Presently a telegram arrived from Leonard Upjohn. Shocked and grieved beyond measure. Regret cannot come to-night. Dining out. With you early to-morrow. Deepest sympathy, Upjohn. In a little while the woman knocked at the door of the sitting-room. "'I've done now, sir. Will you come and look at him and see it's all right?' Philip followed her. Cronshaw was laying on his back with his eyes closed and his hands folded piously across his chest. "'You ought by rights to have a few flowers, sir. I'll get some to-morrow.' She gave the body a glance of satisfaction. She had performed her job, and now she rolled down her sleeves, took off her apron, and put on her bonnet. Philip asked her how much she owed her. "'Well, sir, some give me two and sixpence, and some give me five shillings.' Philip was ashamed to give her less than the larger sum. She thanked him with just so much effusiveness as was seemly in presence of the grief he might be supposed to feel, and left him. Philip went back into his sitting-room, cleared away the remains of his supper, and sat down to read Walsham's surgery. He found it difficult. He was singularly nervous. When there was a sound on the stairs he jumped, and his heart beat violently. That thing in the adjoining room, which had been a man and now was nothing, frightened him. The silence seemed alive as if some mysterious movement were taking place within it. The presence of death weighed upon these rooms, unearthly and terrifying. Philip felt a sudden horror for what had once been his friend. He tried to force himself to read, but presently pushed away his book in despair. What troubled him was the absolute futility of the life which had just ended. It did not matter if Cronshaw was alive or dead. It would have been just as well if he had never lived. Philip thought of Cronshaw young, and it needed an effort of imagination to picture him slender, with a springing step, and with hair on his head, buoyant and hopeful. Philip's rule of life to follow one's instincts with due regard to the policeman round the corner had not acted very well there. It was because Cronshaw had done this that he had made such a lamentable failure of existence. It seemed that the instincts could not be trusted. Philip was puzzled, and he asked himself what rule of life was there if that one was useless, and why people acted in one way rather than in another. They acted according to their emotions, but their emotions might be good or bad. It seemed just a chance whether they led to triumph or disaster. Life seemed an inextricable confusion. Men hurried hither and thither, urged by forces they knew not, and the purpose of it all escaped them. They seemed to hurry just for hurrying's sake. Next morning Leonard Upjohn appeared with a small wreath of laurel. He was pleased with his idea of crowning the dead poet with this, and attempted, notwithstanding Philip's disapproving silence, to fix it on the bald head. But the wreath fitted grotesquely. It looked like the brim of a hat worn by a low comedian in a music-hall. "'I'll put it over his heart instead,' said Upjohn. "'You put it on his stomach,' remarked Philip. Upjohn gave a thin smile. "'Only a poet knows where lies a poet's heart,' he answered. They went back into the sitting-room, and Philip told him what arrangements he had made for the funeral. 
I hoped you spared no expense. I should like the hearse to be followed by a long string of empty coaches, and I should like the horses to wear tall, nodding plumes, and there should be a vast number of mutes with long streamers on their hats. I like the thought of all those empty coaches. As the cost of the funeral will apparently fall on me, and I'm not overly flush just now, I've tried to make it as moderate as possible. But, my dear fellow, in that case why didn't you get him a pauper's funeral? There would have been something poetic in that. You have an unerring instinct for mediocrity. Philip flushed a little, but did not answer. And next day he and Upjohn followed the hearse in the one carriage which Philip had ordered. Lawson, unable to come, had sent a wreath, and Philip, so that the coffin should not seem too neglected, had bought a couple. On the way back the coachman whipped up his horses. Philip was dog-tired and presently went to sleep. He was awakened by Upjohn's voice. "'It's rather lucky the poems haven't come out yet. I think we'd better hold them back a bit and I'll write a preface. I began thinking of it during the drive to the cemetery. I believe I can do something rather good. Anyhow, I'll start with an article in the Saturday.' Philip did not reply, and there was a silence between them. At last Upjohn said, I dare say I'd be wiser not to whittle away my copy. I think I'll do an article for one of the reviews, and then I can just print it afterwards as a preface. Philip kept his eye on the monthlies, and a few weeks later it appeared. The article made something of a stir, and extracts from it were printed in many of the papers. It was a very good article, vaguely biographical, for no one knew much of Cronshaw's early life, but delicate, tender, and picturesque. Leonard Upjohn, in his intricate style, drew graceful little pictures of Cronshaw in the Latin Quarter, talking, writing poetry. Cronshaw became a picturesque figure, an English Verlaine, and Leonard Upjohn's colored phrases took on a tremulous dignity, a more pathetic grandiloquence as he described the sordid end, the shabby little room in Soho, and, with a reticence which was wholly charming, and suggested a much greater generosity than modesty allowed him to state, the efforts he made to transport the poet to some cottage embowered with honeysuckle amid a flowering orchard. And the lack of sympathy, well-meaning but so tactless, which had taken the poet instead to the vulgar respectability of Kennington. Leonard Upjohn described Kennington with that restrained humor which a strict adherence to the vocabulary of Sir Thomas Brown necessitated. With delicate sarcasm he narrated the last weeks, the patience with which Cronshaw bore the well-meaning clumsiness of the young student who had appointed himself his nurse, and the pitifulness of that divine vagabond in those hopelessly middle-class surroundings. Beauty from Ashes, he quoted from Isaiah. It was a triumph of irony for that outcast poet to die amid the trappings of vulgar respectability. It reminded Leonard Upjohn of Christ among the Pharisees, and the analogy gave him opportunity for an exquisite passage. And then he told how a friend, his good taste, did not suffer him more than to hint subtly who the friend was with such gracious fancies, had laid a laurel wreath on the dead poet's heart, and the beautiful dead hands had seemed to rest with a voluptuous passion upon Apollo's leaves, fragrant with the fragrance of art and more green than jade brought by smart mariners from the manifold inexplicable china. And, an admirable contrast, the article ended with a description of the middle-class, ordinary, prosaic funeral of him who should have been buried like a prince or like a pauper. It was the crowning buffet, the final victory of Felicia over art, beauty, and immaterial things. Leonard Upjohn had never written anything better. It was a miracle of charm, grace, and pity. He printed all Cronshaw's best poems in the course of the article, so that when the volume appeared much of its point was gone, but he advanced his own position a good deal. He was thenceforth a critic to be reckoned with. He had seemed before a little aloof, but there was a warm humanity about this article which was infinitely attractive. End of chapter 85 Chapter 86 In the spring Philip 
having finished his dressing in the outpatients department, became an inpatients clerk. This appointment lasted six months. The clerk spent every morning in the wards, first in the men's, then in the women's, with the house physician. He wrote up cases, made tests, and passed the time of day with the nurses. On two afternoons a week the physician in charge went round with a little knot of students, examined the cases, and dispensed information. The work had not the excitement, the constant change, the intimate contact with reality of the work in the outpatients department, but Philip picked up a good deal of knowledge. He got on very well with the patients, and he was a little flattered at the pleasure they showed in his attendance on them. He was not conscious of any deep sympathy in their sufferings, but he liked them, and because he put on no airs he was more popular with them than others of the clerks. He was pleasant, encouraging, and friendly. Like everyone connected with hospitals, he found that male patients were more easy to get on with than female. The women were often querulous and ill-tempered. They complained bitterly of the hard-worked nurses who did not show them the attention they thought their right, and they were troublesome, ungrateful, and rude. Presently Philip was fortunate enough to make a friend. One morning the house physician gave him a new case, a man, and, seating himself at the bedside, Philip proceeded to write down particulars on the letter. He noticed on looking at this that the patient was described as a journalist. His name was Thorpe Athelney, an unusual one for a hospital patient, and his age was forty-eight. He was suffering from a sharp attack of jaundice, and had been taken into the ward on account of obscure symptoms which it seemed necessary to watch. He answered the various questions which it was Philip's duty to ask him in a pleasant, educated voice. Since he was lying in bed it was difficult to tell if he was short or tall, but his small head and small hands suggested that he was a man of less than average height. Philip had the habit of looking at people's hands, and Athelney's astonished him. They were very small, with long tapering fingers and beautiful rosy fingernails. They were very smooth, and except for the jaundice would have been of a surprising whiteness. The patient kept them outside the bedclothes, one of them slightly spread out, the second and third fingers together, and while he spoke to Philip seemed to contemplate them with satisfaction. With a twinkle in his eyes Philip glanced at the man's face. Notwithstanding the yellowness, it was distinguished. He had blue eyes, a nose of imposing boldness, hooked, aggressive but not clumsy, and a small beard, pointed and gray. He was rather bald, but his hair had evidently been quite fine, curling prettily, and he still wore it long. "'I see you're a journalist,' said Philip. "'What papers do you write for?' "'I write for all the papers. You cannot open a paper without seeing some of my writing.' There was one by the side of the bed, and reaching for it he pointed out an advertisement. In large letters was the name of a firm well known to Philip, Lynn and Sedley, Regent Street, London, and below, in type smaller but still of some magnitude, was the dogmatic statement, Procrastination is the thief of time. Then a question, startling because of its reasonableness, Why not order today? There was a repetition in large letters like the hammering of conscience on a murderer's heart. Why not? Then, boldly, thousands of pairs of gloves from the leading markets of the world at astounding prices, thousands of pairs of stockings from the most reliable manufacturers of the universe at sensational reductions. Finally the question recurred, but flung now like a challenging gauntlet in the list. Why not order to-day? I'm the press representative of Lynn and Sedley. He gave a little wave of his beautiful hand. To what base uses? Philip went on asking the regulation questions, some a mere matter of routine, others artfully devised to lead the patient to discover things which he might be expected to desire to conceal. Have you ever lived abroad? asked Philip. I was in Spain for eleven years. What were you doing there? I was secretary of the English Water Company at Toledo. Philip remembered that Clutton had spent some months in Toledo, and the journalist's answer made him look at him with more interest, but he felt it would be improper to show this. It was necessary to preserve the distance between the hospital patient and the staff. 
when he had finished his examination he went on to other beds. Thorpe Athelny's illness was not grave, and, though remaining very yellow, he soon felt much better. He stayed in bed only because the physician thought he should be kept under observation till certain reactions became normal. One day, on entering the ward, Philip noticed that Athelny, pencil in hand, was reading a book. He put it down when Philip came to his bed. "'May I see what you're reading?' asked Philip, who could never pass a book without looking at it. Philip took it up and saw that it was a volume of Spanish verse, the poems of San Juan de la Cruz, and, as he opened it, a sheet of paper fell out. Philip picked it up and noticed that verse was written upon it. "'You're not going to tell me you've been occupying your leisure in writing poetry. That's a most improper proceeding in a hospital patient. I was trying to do some translations. Do you know Spanish?' "'No.' "'Well, you know all about San Juan de la Cruz, don't you?' "'I don't indeed. He was one of the Spanish mystics. He's one of the best poets they've ever had. I thought it would be worth while translating him into English. May I look at your translation?' "'It's very rough,' said Athelny, but he gave it to Philip with an alacrity which suggested that he was eager for him to read it. It was written in pencil in a fine but very peculiar handwriting which was hard to read. It was just like black letter. Doesn't it take you an awful time to write like that? It's wonderful. I don't know why handwriting shouldn't be beautiful. Philip read the first verse. In an obscure night, with anxious love inflamed, O oh happy lot! Forth unobserved I went, my house being now at rest. Philip looked curiously at Thorpe Athelney. He did not know whether he felt a little shy with him or was attracted by him. He was conscious that his manner had been slightly patronizing, and he flushed as it struck him that Athelny might have thought him ridiculous. "'What an unusual name you've got,' he remarked for something to say. "'It's a very old Yorkshire name. Once it took the head of my family a day's hard riding to make the circuit of his estates, but the mighty are fallen.' fast women and slow horses. He was short-sighted, and when he spoke looked at you with a peculiar intensity. He took up his volume of poetry. You should read Spanish, he said. It is a noble tongue. It has not the mellifluousness of Italian. Italian is the language of tenors and organ-grinders, but it has grandeur. It does not ripple like a brook in a garden, but it surges tumultuous like a mighty river in flood. His grandiloquence amused Philip, but he was sensitive to rhetoric, and he listened with pleasure while Athelny, with picturesque expressions and the fire of a real enthusiasm, described to him the rich delight of reading Don Quixote in the original and the music romantic, limpid, passionate of the enchanting Calderon. "'I must get on with my work,' said Philip presently. "'Oh, forgive me, I forgot. I will tell my wife to bring me a photograph of Toledo, and I will show it to you.' come and talk with me when you have the chance. You don't know what a pleasure it gives me. During the next few days, in moments snatched whenever there was opportunity, Philip's acquaintance with the journalist increased. Thorpe Athelny was a good talker. He did not say brilliant things, but he talked inspiringly with an eager vividness which fired the imagination. Philip, living so much in a world of make-believe, found his fancy teeming with new pictures. Athelny had very good manners. He knew much more than Philip, both of the world and of books. He was a much older man, and the readiness of his conversation gave him a certain superiority. But he was in the hospital a recipient of charity subject to strict rules, and he held himself between the two positions with ease and humor. Once Philip asked him why he had come to the hospital. Oh, my principle is to profit by all the benefits that society provides. I take advantage of the age I live in. When I'm ill, I get myself patched up in a hospital, and I have no false shame, and I send my children to be educated at the board school. Do you really? said Philip. And a capital education they get too, much better than I got at Winchester. How else do you think I could educate them at all? I've got nine. You must come and see them all when I get home again, will you?' "'I'd like to very much,' said Philip. 
End of chapter 86 Chapter 87 Ten days later Thorpe Athelny was well enough to leave the hospital. He gave Philip his address, and Philip promised to dine with him at one o'clock on the following Sunday. Athelny had told him that he lived in a house built by Inigo Jones. He had raved, as he raved over everything, over the balustrade of old oak, and when he came down to open the door for Philip he made him at once admire the elegant carving of the lintel. It was a shabby house, badly needing a coat of paint, but with the dignity of its period in a little street between Chancery Lane and Holborn, which had once been fashionable, but was now little better than a slum. There was a plan to pull it down in order to put up handsome offices. Meanwhile the rents were small, and Athelny was able to get the two upper floors at a price which suited his income. Philip had not seen him up before and was surprised at his small size. He was not more than five feet and five inches high. He was dressed fantastically in blue linen trousers of the sort worn by working men in France and a very old brown velvet coat. He wore a bright red sash round his waist, a low collar, and for tie a flowing bow of the kind used by the comic Frenchman in the pages of Punch. He greeted Philip with enthusiasm. He began talking at once of the house and passed his hand lovingly over the balusters. Look at it, feel it, it's like silk. What a miracle of grace, and in five years the housebreaker will sell it for firewood. He insisted on taking Philip into a room on the first floor where a man in shirt sleeves, a blousy woman, and three children were having their Sunday dinner. I've just brought this gentleman in to show him your ceiling. Did you ever see anything so wonderful? How are you, Mrs. Hodgson? This is Mr. Carey, who looked after me when I was in the hospital. Come in, sir, said the man. Any friend of Mr. Athelny's is welcome. Mr. Athelny shows the ceiling to all his friends, and it don't matter what we're doing, if we're in bed or if I'm having a wash, in he comes. Philip could see that they looked upon Athelny as a little queer, but they liked him none the less, and they listened open-mouthed while he discoursed with his impetuous fluency on the beauty of the seventeenth-century ceiling. What a crime to pull this down, eh, Hotskin? You're an influential citizen. Why don't you write to the papers and protest? The man in shirt-sleeves gave a laugh and said to Philip, Mr. Athelny will have his little joke. They do say these houses are that insanitary. It's not safe to live in them. Sanitation be damned. Give me art, cried Athelny. I've got nine children and they thrive on bad drains. No, no, I'm not going to take any risk. None of your newfangled notions for me. When I move from here, I'm going to make sure the drains are bad before I take anything. There was a knock at the door, and a little fair-haired girl opened it. Daddy, Mummy says do stop talking and come and eat your dinner. This is my third daughter, said Athelny, pointing to her with a dramatic forefinger. She is called Maria del Pilar, but she answers more willingly to the name of Jane. Jane, your nose wants blowing. I haven't got a hanky, Daddy. Tut, tut, child, he answered, as he produced a vast, brilliant bandana. What do you suppose the Almighty gave you fingers for? They went upstairs, and Philip was taken into a room with walls paneled in dark oak. In the middle was a narrow table of teak on trestle legs, with two supporting bars of iron, of the kind called in Spain Mesa de Heraki. They were to dine there, for two places were laid, and there were two large armchairs with broad flat arms of oak and leathern backs and leathern seats. They were severe, elegant, and uncomfortable. The only other piece of furniture was a bargaino, elaborately ornamented with gilt ironwork on a stand of ecclesiastical design, roughly but very finely carved. There stood on this two or three luster plates, much broken but rich in color, and on the walls were old masters of the Spanish school in beautiful, though dilapidated, frames. Though gruesome in subject, ruined by age and bad treatment, and second-rate in their conception, they had a glow of passion. There was nothing in the room of any value, but the effect was lovely. It was magnificent and yet austere. Philip felt it offered the very spirit of old Spain. Athelny was in the middle of showing him the inside of the bargaino with its beautiful ornamentation and secret drawers when a tall girl with two plates of bright brown hair hanging down her back 
came in. Mother says dinner's ready and waiting, and I'm to bring it in as soon as you sit down. Come and shake hands with Mr. Carey, Sally. He turned to Philip. Isn't she enormous? She's my eldest. How old are you, Sally? Fifteen, father. Come next June. I christened her Maria del Sol, because she was my first child, and I dedicated her to the glorious son of Castile. But her mother calls her Sally, and her brother Pudding Face. The girl smiled shyly. She had even white teeth and blushed. She was well set up, tall for her age, with pleasant gray eyes and a broad forehead. She had red cheeks. Go and tell your mother to come in and shake hands with Mr. Carey before he sits down. Mother says she'll come in after dinner. She hasn't washed herself yet. Then we'll go in and see her ourselves. He mustn't eat the Yorkshire pudding till he's shaken the hand that made it. Philip followed his host into the kitchen. It was small and much overcrowded. There had been a lot of noise, but it stopped as soon as the stranger entered. There was a large table in the middle, and round it, eager for dinner, were seated Athelny's children. A woman was standing at the oven, taking out baked potatoes one by one. "'Here's Mr. Carey, Betty,' said Athelny. "'Fancy bringing him in here. What will he think?' She wore a dirty apron, and the sleeves of her cotton dress were turned up above her elbows. She had curling pins in her hair. Mrs. Athelny was a large woman, a good three inches taller than her husband, fair with blue eyes, and a kindly expression. She had been a handsome creature, but advancing years and the bearing of many children had made her fat and blousy. Her blue eyes had become pale, her skin was coarse and red, the color had gone out of her hair. She straightened herself, wiped her hand on her apron, and held it out. "'You're welcome, sir,' she said in a slow voice, with an accent that seemed oddly familiar to Philip. "'Athelny said you was very kind to him in the orspital.' "'Now you must be introduced to the livestock,' said Athelny. "'That is Thorpe.' He pointed to a chubby boy with curly hair. "'He is my eldest son, heir to the title, estates, and responsibilities of the family. There is Athelstan, Howard, Edward, he pointed with his forefinger to three smaller boys, all rosy, healthy, and smiling, though when they felt Philip's smiling eyes upon them they looked down shyly at their plates. Now, the girls in order. Maria del Sol, puddin' face, said one of the small boys. Your sense of humor is rudimentary, my son. Maria de los Mercedes, Maria del Pilar, Maria de la Concepción, Maria del Rosario. I call them Sally, Molly, Connie, Rosie, and Jane, said Mrs. Athelny. Now, Athelny, you go into your own room and I'll send you your dinner. I'll let the children come in afterwards for a bit when I've washed them. My dear, if I'd had the naming of you I should have called you Maria of the Soap Suds. You're always torturing these wretched brats with soap. You go first, Mr. Carey, or I shall never get him to sit down and eat his dinner. Athelny and Philip installed themselves in the great monkish chairs, and Sally brought them in two plates of beef, Yorkshire pudding, baked potatoes, and cabbage. Athelny took sixpence out of his pocket and sent her for a jug of beer. "'I hope you didn't have the table laid here on my account,' said Philip. "'I should have been quite happy to eat with the children. Oh, no, I always have my meals by myself. I like these antique customs.' I don't think that women ought to sit at table with men. It ruins conversation, and I'm sure it's very bad for them. It puts ideas in their heads, and women are never at ease with themselves when they have ideas. Both host and guest ate with a hearty appetite. Did you ever taste such Yorkshire pudding? No one can make it like my wife. That's the advantage of not marrying a lady. You noticed she wasn't a lady, didn't you? It was an awkward question and Philip did not know how to answer it. "'I never thought about it,' he said lamely. Athelny laughed. He had a peculiarly joyous laugh. "'No, she's not a lady, nor anything like it. Her father was a farmer, and she's never bothered about H's in her life. We've had twelve children, and nine of them are alive. I tell her it's about time she stopped, but she's an obstinate woman. She's got into the habit of it now, and I don't believe she'll be satisfied till she's had twenty. At that moment Sally came in with the beer, and having poured out a glass for Philip, went to the other side of the table to pour some out for her father. He put his hand round her waist. 
Did you ever see such a handsome strapping girl? Only fifteen, and she might be twenty. Look at her cheeks. She's never had a day's illness in her life. It'll be a lucky man who marries her, won't it, Sally? Sally listened to all this with a slight, slow smile, not much embarrassed, for she was accustomed to her father's outburst, but with an easy modesty which was very attractive. "'Don't let your dinner get cold, father,' she said, drawing herself away from his arm. "'You'll call when you're ready for your pudding, won't you?' They were left alone, and Athelny lifted the pewter tankard to his lips. He drank long and deep. "'My word, is there anything better than English beer?' he said. "'Let us thank God for simple pleasures, roast beef and rice pudding, a good appetite, and beer. I was married to a lady once. My God, don't marry a lady, my boy.' Philip laughed. He was exhilarated by the scene, the funny little man in his odd clothes, the panel room and the Spanish furniture, the English fair. The whole thing had an exquisite incongruity. You laugh, my boy. You can't imagine marrying beneath you. You want a wife who's an intellectual equal. Your head is crammed full of ideas of comradeship. Stuff and nonsense, my boy. A man doesn't want to talk politics to his wife. And what do you think I care for Betty's views upon the differential calculus? A man wants a wife who can cook his dinner and look after his children. I've tried both, and I know. Let's have the pudding in. He clapped his hands, and presently Sally came. When she took away the plates, Philip wanted to get up and help her, but Athelny stopped him. Let her alone, my boy. She doesn't want you to fuss about, do you, Sally? And she won't think it rude of you to sit still while she waits upon you. She don't care a damn for chivalry, do you, Sally? No, father, answered Sally demurely. Do you know what I'm talking about, Sally? No, father. But you know mother doesn't like you to swear. Athelny laughed boisterously. Sally brought them plates of rice pudding, rich and creamy and luscious. Athelny attacked his with gusto. One of the rules of this house is that Sunday dinner should never alter. It is a ritual. Roast beef and rice pudding for fifty Sundays in the year. On Easter Sunday, lamb and green peas, and at Michaelmas, roast goose and applesauce. Thus we preserve the traditions of our people. When Sally marries she will forget many of the wise things I have taught her, but she will never forget that if you want to be good and happy you must eat on Sundays roast beef and rice pudding. You'll call when you're ready for cheese, said Sally impassively. Do you know the legend of the Halcyon, said Athelny. Philip was growing used to his rapid leaping from one subject to another. When the kingfisher, flying over the sea, is exhausted, his mate places herself beneath him and bears him along upon her stronger wings. That is what a man wants in a wife, the halcyon. I lived with my first wife for three years. She was a lady, she had fifteen hundred a year, and we used to give nice little dinner parties in our little red brick house in Kensington. She was a charming woman, they all said so, the barristers and their wives who dined with us, and the literary stockbrokers and the budding politicians. Oh, she was a charming woman. She made me go to church in a silk hat and a frock coat. She took me to classical concerts, and she was very fond of lectures on Sunday afternoon. And she sat down to breakfast every morning at eight-thirty, and if I was late breakfast was cold. And she read the right books, admired the right pictures, and adored the right music. My God, how that woman bored me! She is charming still, and she lives in the little red brick house in Kensington, with Morris papers and Whistler's etchings on the walls, and gives the same nice little dinner parties with veal creams and ices from Gunter's, as she did twenty years ago. Philip did not ask by what means the ill-matched couple had separated, but Athelny told him, Betty's not my wife, you know. My wife wouldn't divorce me. The children are bastards, every jack one of them, and are they any the worse for that? Betty was one of the maids in the little red brick house in Kensington. Four or five years ago I was on my uppers, and I had seven children, and I went to my wife and asked her to help me. She said she'd make me an allowance if I'd give up Betty and go abroad. Can you see me giving Betty up? We starved for a while instead. My wife said I loved the gutter. I've degenerated. I've come down in the world. I earn three pounds a week as press agent to a linen draper 
and every day I thank God that I'm not in the little red brick house in Kensington. Sally brought in cheddar cheese, and Athelny went on with his fluent conversation. It's the greatest mistake in the world to think that one needs money to bring up a family. You need money to make them gentlemen and ladies, but I don't want my children to be ladies and gentlemen. Sally's going to earn her living in another year. She's to be apprenticed to a dressmaker, aren't you, Sally? And the boys are going to serve their country. I want them all to go into the Navy. It's a jolly life and a healthy life, good food, good pay, and a pension to end their days on. Philip lit his pipe. Athelny smoked cigarettes of Havana tobacco, which he rolled himself. Sally cleared away. Philip was reserved, and it embarrassed him to be the recipient of so many confidences. Athelny, with his powerful voice in the diminutive body, with his bombast, with his foreign look, with his emphasis, was an astonishing creature. He reminded Philip a good deal of Cronshaw. He appeared to have the same independence of thought, the same bohemianism, but he had an infinitely more voracious temperament. His mind was coarser, and he had not that interest in the abstract which made Cronshaw's conversation so captivating. Athelny was very proud of the county family to which he belonged. He showed Philip photographs of an Elizabethan mansion, and told him, The Athelnys have lived there for seven centuries, my boy. Ah, if you saw the chimney-pieces and the ceilings! There was a cupboard in the wainscoting, and from this he took a family tree. He showed it to Philip with childlike satisfaction. It was indeed imposing. You see how the family names recur? Thorpe, Athelstan, Harold, Edward. I've used the family names for my son. And the girls, you see, I've given Spanish names to. An uneasy feeling came to Philip that possibly the whole story was an elaborate imposture, not told with any base motive, but merely from a wish to impress, startle, and amaze. Athelny had told him that he was at Winchester, but Philip, sensitive to differences of manner, did not feel that his host had the characteristics of a man educated at a great public school. While he pointed out the great alliances which his ancestors had formed, Philip amused himself by wondering whether Athelny was not the son of some tradesman in Winchester, auctioneer or coal merchant, and whether a similarity of surname was not his only connection with the ancient family whose tree he was displaying. End of chapter 87 Recording by Tom Weiss, Tom's Audiobooks.com